B. So we need to uh, prepare the environment. Uh, if the ACs are on, we can switch off ACs and fans and close windows to prevent air drafts and turn on the heater of the precessive air. Then check your oxygen supply and air supply. Then wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water adhering to all uh, five steps of ha proper hand washing. Then wear double pair of gloves and uh, start checking your equipments. Uh, all the equipments necessary for airway, breathing and circulation should be kept ready. Then as soon as the baby is born, you should start the stopwatch. Then only we know how long we have been resuscitation in the case of uh, and to give the proper abgas for in term in a case of withdrawal of care, we know how far we have been resuscitating and now if there's no improvement, this is the time to stop and also starting the clock is stopwatch is also important. So once the baby is born, you need to remove first pair of gloves because it is already contaminated and accept the baby with your clean gloves. Then any baby, first thing to be done, dry and cover the baby, except in very preterm babies. There you don't dry, just uh, deliver the baby onto a plastic bag. Then wet clothes should be discarded and attending to the baby's airway. Open airway should be kept open in the neutral airway position. Then assess the baby for color, tone, breathing, and heart rate. Uh, if baby ne is needing resuscitation, you should attach the pulse oximeter and call for help. Here in this slide, you see there are different types of resuscitators. When you are working in a unit, you should be familiar with the type of resistor you are working with because every resistor has the main component same, but you should know where the, the, the stopwatch is, where how uh, can you switch on the uh, heat, light, those things you should be familiar with. Uh, so, uh, right, we'll go through the equipments list. Uh, you should be uh, kept ready when the uh, before the baby is born. Clock usually this clock stop watches in the resistor itself. You should have an idea where it is. Then gas supply and suction, oxygen and air supply should be there, and uh, apparatus for the suction should be ready. Warm dry towels should be on the resistor. And in case of a preterm baby or a very low birth weight baby, you should have a plastic bag. And uh, a firm, suitable surface, ideally a resuscitator. Then embo bag with blow off valve or a neopuff. In case of a preterm baby, neopuff is better because neopuff can deliver PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure other than the pip and face mask and face mask and tracheal tubes there should be uh, three sizes of face mask and tracheal tubes depending on the baby you are anticipating to get and good airways uh, that also should be uh, there are three sizes of good airways should be ready and laryngoscope in case of intubation with proper light and the blade appropriate size, wide bow suction catheters and for the auscultation stethoscope should be there. And you have to check whether these drugs available. Adrenaline is the most important drug and normal saline dextrose in case of uh, need. If baby needs, these also should be kept ready and scissors and tape to anchor the tube. And in case of UVC insertion, to uh, anchor those, you need these equipments as well. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so this is the 
algorithm any baby first thing is dry and cover then assess the situation with head in neutral position then airway opening maneuver breathing breathing in terms of it first start with inflation breaths because baby's lungs are full of fluid at birth so if baby is not breathing you need to give five inflation breaths to get rid of this fluid from the lungs then once chest is expanded once the lungs are aerated if heart is still low go for chest compressions after giving uh, effective chest compressions if baby is not having good heart rate you can consider giving drugs so the uh, order of action first thing is dry and cover irrespective of the condition of the baby then assess the situation then open up the airway in neutral position or any other airway using any other airway maneuvers then if baby is not breathing you need to give five inflation breaths so once you expand the lungs once lungs are aerated if heart is still low you can go for chest compressions after giving chest compressions also if baby's heart rate is low consider giving drugs adrenaline dextrose normal saline bolusers so on. next uh usually this baby the neonatal resuscitation is different from resuscitation of a pediatric age a bigger child because what are the differences uh, these babies are quite small and they are wet therefore there is a high chance of a chance of getting them cold that's why we need to pay much attention to uh, maintain the temperature in this situation so baby should be dry and then cover with warm towels uh, while drying the baby you can stimulate you don't have to slap the baby uh, torture the baby in terms of stimulation earlier you must be knowing we have been practicing those things in the very past but now we don't do anything pinching slapping or uh, slamming the baby just we while drying the baby we stimulate and then cover the baby with dry towels so our initial actions are start the once as soon as the baby is born you start the clock then remove your dirty gloves and uh, with accept the baby with clean gloves and dry and dry and cover the baby and then assess the situation uh, when you assess the situation if you feel baby needs resuscitation always think whether you need an extra pair of hands don't hesitate to call for help in uh, in uh, any situation if you think you need help call for help immediately next so the what are the things you assess in your initial assessment that's uh, the mnemonic ctbh you can remember it in that way color baby's color should be assessed if baby is quite uh, pink and uh, the periphery is also pink that means baby's color is good if baby is pale cyanose that means baby is not good baby needs some sort of help then tone baby in a healthy term baby baby is quite a baby's limbs are quite flexed and moving so that is the normal tone you expect but if baby is floppy and muscle tone is very less that means baby is not good and breathing if baby is breathing regularly uh, at a rate of around 30 40 that means normal if baby is having labored breathing or uh, any other pauses between breathing irregular breathing baby needs breathing support heart rate you don't have to count the heart rate but just with the use of uh, with the help of a stethoscope listen to the heart and see whether it is above 100 or below 100 if it is below 100 you need to help the baby if it is above 100 that means baby's heart rate is good so these are the initial assessment color tone breathing heart rate 
so we'll go through different scenarios. Then you will understand the resuscitation process. This baby uh, will get this first case. This baby is born blue and then turn to pink and go good tone and baby was breathing regularly with the fast heart rate. What would you do here? You can just dry the baby and cover with warm towels and hand over to the mother. Do you need any other resuscitation here? No, as baby is breathing regularly, you don't have to support. This is that normal healthy looking baby's appearance. You can appreciate baby is pink, tone is good. So breathing, we can't of course see here. If baby is breathing regularly, you are handing over to mother after drying and covering. So ne next uh, case. Uh, this baby is born blue and tone is also moderate. Baby is not breathing adequately and with the slow heart rate. What would you do here? You have to again dry and cover the baby. As I told you earlier, each and every baby should be dry and covered because they are, uh, if babies are big, uh, heat loss there will be a heat loss to evaporate to heat loss to dry the baby so we need to dry the baby cover and keep under a uh, keep on a uh, warm surface under a warm light then we can protect the baby from hypothermia then open the keep in the head in neutral position and then see whether baby is breathing or not. If baby is breathing, that's fine. If baby is not breathing or inadequate breaths, you need to go for inflation breaths, where you can decide whether you need to call for help or not. So this is the third case. Baby is born blue or pale. Baby is quite floppy. Baby is not breathing at all. And heart rate is very slow. Then what would you do? Again dry and cover, open the airway and give fine inflation breaths because if baby is not breathing, you have to maintain the head in neutral position to open up the airway and you need to give uh, artificial breaths. So we give five inflation breaths and reassess the situation. What would you assess? Again, the color, tone, breathing and heart rate. Now, you decide whether you need to call for help or not. Uh, so having gone through these case scenarios, you understand you have understood now every baby needs drying and covering, open up the airway and uh, if baby is not breathing, you need to aerate the lungs. Then after aeration of the lungs only, if heart is not uh, getting better, you need to go for cardiac compression. So we'll go through each and every step. Airway. In the newborn, airway obstruction is not due to foreign material or anything blocking the airway. It is just the loss of pharyngeal tone. So uh, then baby's airway uh, get compromised. You are not supposed to suck the baby in order to clear the airway, but positioning is important as the pharynge because of the loss of pharyngeal tone, baby's airway get compromised, obstructed. Then if you manage to keep the airway in neutral position, uh, then it will open up the, the uh, airway uh, with this maneuver. So positioning is the key, not suctioning. Anyway, you are not supposed to suck the crying baby. In case of meconium aspiration, sometimes you see baby is sucking, but people uh, continue to suck the baby. It is not recommended because uh, the, the crying itself is an indication uh, to say baby's airway is patent. So you ha don't have to worry about it. Next. Next one. 
uh, suction has <coughs> its own disadvantages as well because when you are sucking <coughs> you can stimulate the baby's vagal vagal nerve yeah and it has negative effects like uh, it can delay the spontaneous breathing and it increases negative intrathoracic pressure so suction in is not recommended in the initial newborn resuscitation next so how do you open up the airway in a normal in a newborn who needs resuscitation the first airway maneuver is the keep in the head in neutral position when you are keep in the head in neutral position you need to tilt head tilt and chin lift keep head should be tilted and uh, chin is lifted in a way baby is facing baby's eyes are parallel to the ceiling ears are parallel to the surface where baby is lying so if you position in that way baby's airway open up with this neutral position so if after the keep in the head in neutral position also if you can't uh, see a good chest expansion when you give breath you need to go for the second airway opening maneuver that is jaw thrust this jaw thrust can be done either a single uh single jaw thrust maneuver if you are the only rescuer or if you have a helper you can go for double handed jaw thrust and once you open up the airway in these maneuvers you can go for inflation breath <coughs> as <coughs> sorry as i mentioned earlier if baby is not breathing we need to give a uh, higher pressure breaths over a period of 2 to 3 seconds in order to get rid of this lung fluids these are called inflation breaths so this diagram this uh, uh, photograph shows how to keep the head in neutral position here you see head is quite flexed then airway get narrowed even when you overextend the neck again the airway get narrowed so the best position is so shown in the figure as the neutral position where you can appreciate when you when you keep the head in neutral position airway is patent so this is how you give jaw thrust hold the head in neutral position and sorry here again this is the uh, way you keep the head in neutral position you can appreciate here uh, the previous one uh, to the ceiling is so parallel to the uh, surface uh, the next slide you see how to give uh well how to give a uh, ambu of uh, face mask ventilation uh, with the well fitting mask here you uh, will go through uh, the holding of the mask later see with cni technique you keep the mask hold the mask on baby's face to cover both nose and mouth and give five inflation breaths keep in head in neutral position next slide so let's see how do you give jaw thrust uh, so here by using your both hands you can lift the jaw forward it is not an over extension of the uh, neck again you have to uh, hold your hold baby's angle of the jaw and pull it forward here the second picture you see with your fingers you are uh, pushing the angle of and this how you get your trust next slide
Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Rajita? Yes. Sorry about the interruption. Rajita, can you share the screen, please? Okay, so we were talking about uh, how to give jaw thrust and uh, then we'll see how do you give uh, inflation breaths. Usually when we are giving inflation breaths, we start with air because we all know there are uh, potential side effects of oxygen uh, because these babies, they do not oxygen right from the beginning. If baby needs cardiac compression or if baby saturation is not picking up with uh, bag and mask ventilation with air, you can connect the oxygen. Otherwise, you can start uh, giving inflation breaths with air, room air. So inflation breaths are five inflation breaths each sustained for two to three seconds at 30 centimeter H2O pressure. As I mentioned earlier, it has to be a higher pressure over a longer period of time. Then only you will be able to uh, push this lung fluid away from lungs. So we can repeat this inflation, this inflation breaths twice. Uh, then once you give inflation breaths, you need to assess color, tone, breathing, heart rate again. In addition to those, we need to see whether the chest expansion is there or not. By looking at chest expansion only, we can, get, we can say whether our airway is patent or not. After giving five inflation breaths, if you, if heart rate is still slow and baby is not breathing, we have to see whether our airway is patent or not. So if chest expansion was not there, we need to go back to our airway maneuvers and open the airway before of inflation breaths. But if chest expansion is there, that means our lungs are inflated, but still baby needs other support to increase heart rate and all. So give inflation breaths and then reassess. What would you hope to find? Once you give inflation breaths, what is the first indicator that says you have your lungs are aerated? That's increase in heart rate, isn't it? If you see a increase in heart rate, you know your chest expansion and uh, lung aeration is good. Uh, how do you assess the heart rate? By using a stethoscope or pulse oximetry. There is no place for precordial pal pal palpation or palpation of the umbilical cord for umbilical arterial pulse. Using a stethoscope or pulse oximeter, you need to assess the heart rate to see whether it is increasing. So if the heart rate responds, you can assume the lungs have been inflated. But if heart rate is not increased, what would you think? There may be two possibilities. Either you have not inflated the lungs or though you have inflated the lungs, heart needs additional support to increase its heart rate. How do you decide which one is applicable to your baby? That's by looking at the chest expansion, you can see whether you have inflated the lungs or not. If chest expansion is there, 
that means you have inflated your lungs, but heart needs support. But if chest expansion is not there, that means you need to go back to your airway and open up the airway. Next slide. Yeah, this is what I told you. If the lungs are being inflated, then the chest will move with each ventilation. Mask inflation is nearly always effective. About 95% of babies for whom help is cold will recover within a minute or two once air enters the lungs. So this is the skill we need to master because if you can open up the airway and give bag and mask ventilation, that itself is enough for the resuscitation of the baby. About 95% of babies, they improve once air gets into the lungs. If the chest is not moving, the lungs are not being inflated, then you need to go back to your airway and breathing and correct the technique. Positioning is important, not the suction. This is to uh, this uh, diagram shows two percent airway support. One person is giving jaw thrust. You can appreciate with his uh, middle finger, he is pull, pushing the jaw forward and by using index and thumb, he is holding the mask with C and E technique and the other person is giving inflation breaths uh, via a Neopuff device. This is a T-piece device, right? So these are the other airway adjuncts. These are called oropharyngeal airways. In case of a difficult opening of the airway by using a neutral airway or jaw thrust, if you can't open up the airway, you can go for these airway adjuncts, oral airways. Uh, so how do you insert these? Always it has to be under direct vision by using a laryngoscope. You visualize the pharynx and then uh, if there is anything blocking there the or uh, sitting over the larynx you suck via a large bow sucker uh, under direct vision and then insert this oropharyngeal airway you are not turning it inside the mouth just uh, insert it right side up directly so this is a picture of a post-mortem baby where baby has died of airway obstruction with thick uh, meconium. It could be thick mucus, particulate material, blood. So that's why you need to uh, suck under direct vision if something is blocking the pharynx before uh, inserting this airway adjuncts. Screaming babies have an open airway. You are not supposed to do suctioning on screaming babies. Uh, in floppy babies, you can have a look. Uh, the heart rate. If the heart rate has increased and is now about 100, once you give inflation breaths, baby's heart rate is increased. That means you have aerated the lungs. Now heart rate is above 100, but baby is not breathing. Then what do you want to do? We need to continue with artificial ventilation. These breaths are called ventilatory breaths. Once lungs are expanded, you don't have to give the same pressure. Just give ventilatory breaths to see chest expansion at a rate of 30 breaths per minute until the baby is breathing well. What if the chest is moving but the heart is still slow? There only you need to attend to the heart. Until you achieve a good chest expansion, you are not supposed to give cardiac compressions. In this situation, consider giving cardiac compressions when effective ventilation is certain. There are two methods of giving cardiac compressions. One is a double encircling method. The other one is 
two finger method encircling method is always better because you have a good you can give good effective uh, cardiac compressions but for that you need two uh, person so if you have help only you can go for uh, this hand encircling method otherwise if you are the only rescuer you can go with this two finger method you can see it in this uh, next slide This one is showing how to give uh, hand encircling chest compressions. The other one is showing two finger method. The rate of compression is 90 per minute. So if you are giving ventilatory breaths also, the rate is three is to one, three cardiac compressions and one ventilatory breath. So all together per twenty events. Uh, the site is over the midline. You have to give cardiac compressions in the midline in the lower one third of the sternum. When you are compressing the heart, uh, at least uh, press it, like compress it one third of the AP diameter of the chest. Then only heart gets squeezed between your rib cage. Our purpose is to pump blood away from the heart to coronaries if we can uh, if we can pump blood to the coronaries that is enough to initiate good cardiac output next slide if you want oxygenated lungs to the at five take long time so once you give cardiac compressions you have to reassess the baby again has the heart rate improved if not go back to your airway and check whether it is patent and the airway maneuvers and adjuncts needs to be reaches and check chest movements whether you are giving adequate breathing support and then see whether your chest compressions are effective If all these are okay, then if heart is still slow, you can consider giving drugs. The drug of choice is adrenaline. The dose is 10 mics per kilo. It is given in 1 in 10,000 strength. Your adrenaline vial come in 1 in 1,000. So you need to dilute it up to 10 times and give 0.1 ml per kilo from that diluted solution. Really need volume if capillary fill time is more than 10, 3 you can consider giving normal saline 10 ml per kilo and sometimes baby might need dextrose and rarely bicarbonate also uh, if baby needs drugs we have to have a central line uvc is the umbilical venous access so uh, it, uh, you can insert it uh, like you don't have to adhere to the strict uh, procedures like if you are putting a UVC in the board you wear uh, sterile gowns and uh, measure take the measurements and all but here you can just put it uh, as a emergency procedure uh, when UVC is going about uh, five to six centimeters from the stump and when you see blood is coming along the uvc you can uh, secure it and start giving drugs so what next baby uh, what next so now you have achieved a good chest expansion baby is breathing heart rate is good but you have to uh, reassess the baby overall again before sending to the mother or the uh, NICU. Assessment include 
sensory stops. This mnemonic, you can go through this mnemonic stops. S is sensorium, whether baby is active, alert, whether baby is having feeds, drowsy, temperature. You should check baby's temperature. If baby is hypothermic, you need to rewarm again. Oxygenation in uh, oxygenation uh, in respiratory distress syndrome. If saturation is low, you can consider starting supplemental oxygen. And if baby needs cardiac compression, anyway, you are supposed to uh, give oxygen. Uh, before sending to the ward, if baby is in respiratory distress, you start oxygen. More than three seconds, you have to improve. So the last but not least important thing is speaking to parents. Always, once you finish your uh, once you finish your resuscitation, you need to talk to parents and uh, uh, explain what have you been doing so far and they are to move the baby and so on. Otherwise, you are. Uh, you are not just taking the baby away from the mother and admit to NICU. Uh, briefly, at least briefly show the baby to mother before you are moving if you are taking the baby to NICU. And record keeping is also very important. And in a chronological manner, you need to record everything you did during the procedure, during the resuscitation process. And if you contacted your seniors, in, uh, document those as well. Uh, next, uh, if after doing a resuscitation, a good if good quality heart rate is still not there uh, in ten minutes, you need to discuss with your team and uh, stop resuscitation because the prognosis is very poor in the in that situation. So that's all about resuscitation of a newborn baby. Uh, do I have time to go through therapeutic hypothermia, Rajita? <coughs> Madam, 10, uh, 10 45, if I may, maybe select the parenting 10 minutes, 5 10 minutes, do you have any questions on this uh, on the uh, resuscitation part we did? I saw some questions were appearing. I can't. Find them now. Can you all ask those questions? Uh, you, you have types, so many questions here. Like, Hello. Hello. No, madam. No, I, I need to uh, see these questions. How can I? Wait, madam. Wait, madam. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm able to see those. Let me go. Uh, what are the significant instances for assessing the situation? What are the significant instances for accessing the situation? Uh, Madam, you said if heart rate is below 100, he needs help. So is the cutoff heart rate for resuscitation is 100 
Am I correct? Yes. If heart rate is below 100 and if baby is not breathing, you need to start resuscitation. Madam, when do we suction in the newborn? What are the side defects and contraindications for suctioning? Suctioning is not routinely indicated. Suctioning is needed once you start your resuscitation, you give inflation breaths, but you... So, sorry about this. Can you hear? Yes, madam. Yeah, right. Sorry. Uh, what are the, uh, you have asked, madam, when do we suction in a newborn? What are the side defects? Side defects, I already mentioned, uh, vagal stimulation can be there. When you suck, it will create further negative pressure in the thorax. So it is. It has bad defects for the initiation of breath and lung collapse. So you might introduce infection. So that is anyway contraindicated routine suctioning. But if baby, when you are giving after opening up the airway, when you are giving inflation breaths, if chest expansion is not there, you need to have. Think there are secretions in mouth. Yes, definitely. In case of a meconium, if you see a lot of secretions in the mouth or meconium, you can suck out the mouth. That is not a contraindication. Right. Are you doing jaw thrust to neonates? It can be done more than one year. No, jaw thrust is indicated even in neonates. It's part of the airway maneuvers in neonates. Uh, to keep head in neutral position, do we do both head tilt and chin lift? Yes, you lift the chin and tilt the head in order to keep head in neutral position where you achieve your eyes parallel to the ceiling and ears parallel to the surface. Chest compression, why is not 15 is to 2? That is for pediatric population. In neonates, it is 3 is to 1 because their heart rate is faster than... Uh, all the children. We need to give 90, 90 cardiac compressions per minute. Madam, first we consider lung expansion. If it is not good, open the airway and uh, start inflation. Next, we go for the heart rate. And until respiration is good, we cannot go into the heart. Or, correct. The, yeah, that's correct. Until you expand your lungs, you are not supposed to touch the heart. Right? So, you first give inflation breaths and uh, expand your lungs. Madam, how much times we can repeat adrenaline? We can repeat even three, four times. But first, you need to make sure your airway, uh, breathing and cardiac compressions are perfect. The same, same solution. How the solution prepare? It is 1 is to 2. You take 0.1 and make it 1 in an insulin syringe and uh, give 0.1 ml per kilo. Um, and are there any pressure differences to be maintained when we give inflation breaths and ventilation? Yes. I, already I mentioned the vent inflation breaths, 30 centimeter H2O pressure, but for ventilator breaths pressure is much lower it may be 20 25 when you that depends on the baby when some if the lungs are stiff you might need the higher pressure but if lungs are compliant you may need a lower pressure so there is no specific cutoff value but when you see chest expansion you can stop at that level 
if we consider lung expansion, if it is not good, open the airway and start to write that same thing. Are you doing jaw thrust to neonates? Yes. Uh, when do we suction? And so same set of things. And the neonate having secretions after assessing hypothermia, do we suck out secretions or do we go for suctioning at this time? No, you don't suck. You After assessing if baby is not good if baby is having hypothermia you dry and cover then go for inflation breaths if heart rate mm -hmm. if a uh, baby is not breathing uh, why we initially warm the baby and later take hypo later take hypothermic why do two entities i didn't go through therapeutic hypothermia yet so don't get confused you always do warming of the baby Unless there are specific indications, a specific indication is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. I'll briefly go through it. Don't get confused. You always warm the baby. Do not cool later. Madam, how do we adjust pressure when we give in breaths? If you have a neopath, you can adjust pressure. Only thing without this uh, physical sessions, I don't know how to show that. In that neopath, you have a pip and peep. Uh, pressure gauge. With that, you can control in your ambu bag. There is no way of controlling. You don't know how much you are giving. When you fully space the ambu bag, you deliver 30 centimeter H2 of, of pressure. When you partially uh, space it, the lower pressure. Right? So those are the questions. Let me go back to my lecture. Next slide, please. Yeah, a therapeutic kind of hypothermia one, the previous one. Yeah, therapeutic hypothermia, uh, it's, indicated only in term babies who has signs of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, right? So if babies having low abga, acidosis at birth due to the perinatal hypoxic event, you can start passive cooling, do not warm the baby and then refer to a center where they have therapeutic cooling within six hours of birth. Then it can delay the uh, brain damage and increase the ne neurological outcome of the baby. So uh, you don't have to go into details in this session about therapeutic hypothermia. And the next one, I think here, uh, delivery outside the labor ward, it is again not that important because most of the time we deal with in, in well, most of our mothers deliver in the labor ward in case of emergency the same procedure applies you need to take care uh, not to uh, maybe become hypothermic and uh, use a hard surface when you are resuscitating so that's all about this neonatal resuscitation lecture in summary what you need to do is always prepare beforehand if you are called for a delivery, go there physically and uh, assess the situation, introduce yourself to the staff there and uh, prepare the environment, then get ready with your equipment and wait for the baby. Once the baby is born, uh, uh, stopwatch should be started and first pair of gloves should be removed and take the baby and start. Uh, resuscitating algorithm is dry and cover then assess the situation in neutral position assessing color tone breathing heart rate if you need resuscitation uh, call for help in newborn babies airway opening is with the correct positioning not with uh, suctioning up secretions right then till you expand the lungs, you are not going to give cardiac compressions. So expansion of the lungs is done by giving five inflation breaths. Then once the baby's lungs are aerated, heart rate uh, 
goes up, that's the best indicator to assume your chest expansion, your lung aeration is good. Once uh, that is achieved, you can go for chest compressions. If after giving effective chest compressions also, if baby's heart rate is low, consider giving drugs. Adrenaline is the drug of choice that has to be given 0.1 ml per kilogram from 1 in 10,000 solution. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, madam. Okay, thanks. Okay, shall I start? Can you all hear me? Hello, Rajita. Oh. Ah, at the. Ah, you can think around. Ah, ah, right. Hello. Then, my guess, right? Spain or the Nepal? No, they're good. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, madam. Ah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Kumuduni. I'm going to talk to you all regarding kangaroo mother care. So we'll see in this lecture what is kangaroo mother care, how it is being done, and what are the evidences, and uh, what are the impacts it has on our healthcare system. So what is kangaroo mother care? Kangaroo mother care is a care of newborn infant secured skin to skin to the mother. So this has been recognized as a very powerful and easy to use method to give care of low birth weight babies and preterm infants. And it can also be used in term infants as well. So why is it called kangaroo mother care? So if you take the kangaroo baby, this baby is born immature and the rest of his life is spent inside the kangaroo mother's pouch where it receives safety, warmth and nutrition. Uh, so because of the pouch, the baby is protected from predators and all. Right? And the baby lies very close to the mother's skin. So baby uh, receives necessary warmth from the mother, mother's uh, body temperature. And this kangaroo mother's nipples are located inside the pouch. So baby has ready access to feed. So similarly, when we are giving kangaroo care to the human infant, so we keep the baby skin to skin with the mother and we wrap the baby with a uh, wrapper or binder. So instead of the kangaroo's pouch. So here, so baby is lying very close to the mother's skin. So therefore, constantly baby is getting warmth from the mother. <coughs> and baby is safe. Safe in the sense, now when we... Uh, nurse this preterm all over the baby in an incubator, baby is constantly exposed to the hospital environment, which has a lot of hospital acquired infections. Okay. And uh, when the baby is on the mother's skin, baby is mostly exposed to the uh, mother's commensals. So, uh, but mother's antibodies to this mother's commensals, baby will receive through the breast milk. So baby is protected from external pathogenic organisms. And also the baby is lying close to the mother. Therefore, the mother-baby bonding is very much developed. And mother's oxytocin reflex will work properly and she will have a lot of 
milk coming in. So therefore, that helps in baby's nutrition. So by giving kangaroo care for the newborn, preterm and low birth baby, we are providing safety, warmth and nutrition. So if you go to the history of kangaroo care, this was first introduced in 1979 by two pediatricians who worked in Colombia. Uh, it's a developing country and it has large numbers of low birth weight and preterm infants delivered because of very poor antenatal care and high incidence of toxemia in pregnancy, anemia and infections. And they lack staff and they lack adequate equipment. Therefore, their infection rates and mortality rates are very high because of overcrowding. And also, you know, the separation of babies and mother resulted my mothers are abandoning their newborn infants. So they introduced this maternal infant skin to skin contest. And the exclusive breastfeeding was encouraged and resulted improved outcome of low birth weight infants. It's a humanized general care of infants in hospital rather than separating mother and baby. So we give the care with the mother. So it's a more humanized way of giving care for a preterm or low birth weight baby. And this decreased hospitalization time and less overcrowding, less abundant infants and improving staff morale. So this spread all over the world. So first reported by UNICEF in 1984. Then several people visited Colombia and they done many research and then later WHO recognized this care is a uh, as a life-saving method of care for a preterm and low birth weight babies. So there are a few components of kangaroo mother care. So those are kangaroo positioning. So first you keep the baby skin to skin on the mother's chest and secured with a wrap. Then the kangaroo nutrition means providing breastfeeding for the baby. Then the kangaroo discharge. So mother continues giving kangaroo care at home even after discharge from the hospital. Kangaroo support means during the hospital stay, health care staff support the mother and teach her how to give kangaroo care. And after discharge, the family members can support the mother to give kangaroo care at home. So let's see how a baby is being positioned for the kangaroo mother care. So we have to uh, have minimum clothing of the baby. So to cover the baby's head with a cap, you know, as you know, that the baby's uh, most heat uh, loss occurs through the head. So therefore, we have to cover the head and wear a nappy. That's all. No need for shirts. Then uh, place the baby in between mother's breast, like a frog, frog position, we call it, right? And turn the head to a side and keep the head slightly extended to keep the airway open. And also it allows uh, mother and baby's eye to eye contact. Okay? Then secure the baby with a wrap or a binder. So this is how you can place the baby and then secure the baby with a wrap, wrap or a binder and mother can wear her uh, shirt or dress on top of the binder. So these are a few examples of different type of binders people can use. So this is a locally prepared binder. So then we'll, uh, we see how the new kangaroo nutrition is done. So if a baby can breastfeed, mother can loosen the binder and directly keep the continue breastfeeding. So if the baby is on, uh, if the baby is on NG feeds, so mother can still give NG feeds while giving kangaroo care. Or babies 
on pup feeds so mother can express breast milk and when while she's giving cup feeds so babe my mother can take the baby out of the binder and give cup feed then the kangaroo discharge so once the baby is feeding well maintaining stable body temperature then uh, and gaining uh, enough weight mother and baby can go home and mother can continue to practice kangaroo mother care after the discharge at home he can do uh, some household work like making a cup of tea watching kangaroo care so kangaroo support means so health care staff has to, they have to uh, support the mother emotionally and prepare the mother emotionally and also they help the mother and show how to give kangaroo care by showing them positioning the baby how to wear the wrap and all Uh, like that we have to uh, assist the uh, mother while she is in hospital and also during the home visit the health healthcare workers can uh, support mother further to carry on kangaroo care at home then the not only the mother when they are at home the grandmother and the husband also can help mother and when she she wants to take a break the grandmother or the father can continue kangaroo care at home uh, but the father should not be a smoker so there there are so many research have been done and these studies have evaluated the effect of kangaroo mother care on mortality temperature breastfeeding weight gain and infection so as you can see the left uh, graph shows when a preterm baby is placed in an incubator there's a like swinging of temperature but on the right side you can see when the baby is given kangaroo mother care there's less fluctuation of temperature baby is more stable while receiving kangaroo care and if you found a baby who is hypothermic so we have to rewarm the baby so by giving kangaroo care you can achieve the body temperature sooner and more effectively than keeping the baby inside the incubator or warmer to warm the baby and it also has shown that uh, initiation and the duration of breastfeeding is better with kangaroo mother care weight gain of the babies is also very much more in babies who are receiving kangaroo mother care and they have lower rate of serious infections with kangaroo mother care and there's a cochrane library review which showed the reduced risk of nosocomial infection at 41 weeks severe illness at 41 weeks and lower respiratory disease at 6 months not inclusive breastfeeding at discharge and maternal dissatisfaction all these are reduced due to the um, kangaroo mother care and also babies gain more weight per day by discharge and another review showed significant reduction in neonatal mortality and also suggested uh, significant mortality benefits and Uh, reductions in serious morbidity for babies less than 2000 so the benefits of kangaroo mother care we can consider benefits to the baby mother and the hospital benefits to the baby baby is more stable improved cardiac and respiratory stability and fever episodes of desaturation and apnea so we know that uh, premature babies get desaturations and apneas due to their immature respiratory system so by giving kangaroo mother care they have shown the episodes of desaturation and apnea are less and it can successfully treat mild respiratory distress 
But recent studies have shown even the babies who are having severe respiratory distress while they are receiving CPAP or even ventilatory care, uh, mothers can continue to give uh, kangaroo mother care. It improves gastrointestinal functions, therefore better tolerance of feeds. Higher initiation and duration of breastfeeding. Babies have effective thermal control. So babies temperature is maintained within the narrow temperature range as I showed you in that previous graph. The thermal synchrony develops between mother and baby. So infants are much less stressed, therefore less steroids within the baby. So which will improve the neurological outcome of the baby. And baby will have better organized sleep patterns and more mature and organized electrical brain activity. Benefits to the mother. So as you all know, when a very tiny baby is born like 700, 800 grams, so mothers are very scared to handle the baby. She doesn't know how to handle the baby, how to feed the baby. So by giving uh, kangaroo care, bond is very much improving. And mother is in constant handling of her baby. And she will learn how to feed her very preterm infant. So mother will develop confidence. And she feels that she is an important uh, person giving care for her own baby. So therefore, it improves bonding and it improves breastfeeding. And then ultimately, mother, uh, we can discharge the baby and the mother home soon because mother is confident on handling her baby and feeding. And uh, their bond is more, therefore, less uh, chances of uh, refusing the babies and abandoning the babies. Because as you all know that we keep uh, preterm babies, maybe one, one month, two months in the, in the neonatal unit and separated uh, from the mother. So therefore, baby maternal bonding may be affected. And later, sometimes they reject their babies. This happened in preterm uh, infants. So this is also can be reduced by giving kangaroo mother care. So as healthcare workers, so uh, what are the benefits for the hospital? Uh, so, as you know, this doesn't uh, need any equipment. So, as you all know, the incubator cost of incubator is very high. It's about 8 lakhs upwards. But this uh, kangaroo care method doesn't need any special equipment. So, therefore, uh, that is a benefit. And also, it doesn't need uh, staff training. So, we can tra train, the, I mean, it's a very simple method. So, we can train the uh, nursery staff within the units and since the babies are gaining uh, good weight and they are less susceptible to infections so therefore we can discharge the babies early therefore shorter hospital stay uh, and better survival of the infant will improve the our unit health statistics morbidity mortality rates will be low therefore that will improve our uh, morale uh, of our health staff. And then what are the types of kangaroo mother care? So there are two types, intermittent kangaroo care and uh, continuous kangaroo care. Intermittent kangaroo care means that mother gives kangaroo care maybe about half an hour, more, more than half an hour per time, many times a day. That is intermittent, right? And uh, continuous kangaroo care means uh, mother gives kangaroo care throughout the day, even during sleeping. Even at night, she can continue uh, kangaroo care, but in the adjustable bed, or oh, she can use two pillows to keep her head upright, right, while she's sleeping with the baby. Uh, so she discontinue kangaroo care only for her personal need. Otherwise, they can continue uh, throughout the 24 hours uh, giving kangaroo care. So, these are few mothers who are giving kangaroo care for their babies.
Okay, so we have come to the end. Do you all have any questions? Yeah, yes. Uh, somebody has asked what is expected weight gain in KMC. So usually in preterm babies, we expect 10 to 15 grams per day weight gain. Any more questions? So you can use kangaroo care uh, while transporting babies. Uh, transporting babies from the labor ward to the ward. Uh, you know, uh, you would have seen that the midwives have uh, placed the baby on top of the mother's um, feet. But instead of that, you can give kangaroo care. So keep the mother between mother's breast, uh, keep the baby between mother's breast and cover the baby and then send to the labor ward, I mean, from the uh, labor ward to the uh, postnatal ward. And also when there are no uh, incubator facilities are available, uh, we can transport because sometimes there are deliveries happening on the way and there are uh, cases that we have to transfer mother and baby to uh, uh, units where there are more facilities. Then you can use this kangaroo care while transporting if you don't have facilities. And that, that is a very effective uh, method because we have seen that babies who are arriving in the tertiary care, they are mostly, they are um, hypothermic. So you can, and that can uh, damage uh, uh, very much more to the newborn, newborn baby. So to prevent uh, hypothermia, you can give uh, kangaroo care during transport. Okay, in the absence of uh, other questions, Rajita, can, can we move to the next lecture? I think Dr. Yes, Priyanga, madam. Priyanga, yeah, I think uh, Dr. Priyanga, no? Priyanga. Priyanga Demeter. Uh, Priyanga, Dr. Priyanga Demeter will be doing the next lecture. Thank you. Hello, good morning. I think I'm audible. Can hear, madam. Okay. Good morning. So for the next 30 minutes, 
taking your teeth break as well. I'm going to discuss about low birth weight babies and preterm neonates. So it's mainly not the initial resuscitation. Once the baby is stabilized, how we are going to look after this baby for the rest of the baby's life. And especially keep much attention to the initial life. That's what we are going to discuss. So at the end of this 30 minutes, hopefully you should be able to define who is a preterm baby and what do you mean by low birth weight and the causes for prematurity and low birth weight. And what are the important problems that you might encounter in these babies? So the, it's a very exhaustive kind of list, but I'm going to pay much attention on to hypothermia, hypoglycemia and feeding problems where the managing these problems might improve your morbidity and morbidity. So mainly I'm going to discuss about hypothermia, hypoglycemia and feeding problems. Okay, what do you mean by a low birth weight? So any baby born less than 2,500 grams or 2.5 kilograms, you take them as a low birth weight baby. Now, what do you mean by a preterm baby? So normally we know the pregnancy ends up somewhere around 40 weeks. Any baby born before 37 weeks, that is even 36 plus 6, you take it as a preterm baby. So in Sri Lanka, roughly about 16%, that is 15.7% of low birth weight babies are there. And that's a 7% about preterm deliveries. So why should you know about them? Both these low birth weight and preterm babies, they have high mortality. If you take low birth weight account for about 75% of neonatal, mortality and 15% for about of the infant deaths. And they are more prone to malnutrition, recurrent infections, and most of them have neurodevelopmental disabilities, even minor form, it might be there. The interesting thing is the appropriate care with adequate attention in the initial life, especially with the feeding, and it improves survival and long-term outcome. So it's something you can prevent. So that is the main reason for you to have the understand of these babies. Now, I already told a low birth weight baby is a baby less than 2,500. So who's the, what is the weight that we take as viable? If it's at, somewhere around the viable gestation, if a baby is more than 450 grams, we take as viable. Now you have, so it's completely different from a 2.5 baba when you come to a 500 gram. Then we have the further classification. If you have a baby delivered less than one kilo, we take them as extreme low birth weight and one kilo to 1,500, that is how, 499, we take them as very low birth weight. Now you should realize by now, lower the weight, higher the risk. And this low birth weight, irrespective of the babe, that the time the baby is delivered, you take them as low birth weight. So there are two main types or major types that cause this low birth weight babies. One thing is a preterm baby. A preterm baba probably nicely growing for the particular gestation, but being born early, they come less than 2.5. Sometimes it might not give the real value or the understanding of how severe the baby is affected according to the weight. Whereas there's another group of babies in utero, they have the retarded growth. They might born at term or preterm, but especially if they are term also, they come out with a low birth weight. So just rather than just saying about the low birth weight itself, when you combine it with the gestational age, it gives a much more understanding. So with that, we have classified a group of babies whom are UGR, most likely to come out as small for gestational age babies. Most of them are low birth weight. So you should know what is the Definition for small for gestational age, that is 10% below the normal. 
when it comes to preterm babies, we told that it is less than 37 weeks. Now, the viable period, we take it as 24, and you take from 23 if the weight is also appropriate. So you have a 36 week of preterm and a 26 week of preterm. But definitely we have the understanding that lower the maturity, higher the risk. With that, we have categorized preterm into several categories, mainly the extreme preterms where the gestation is less than 28 weeks. Then we have late preterm group where there are more than 34 weeks. So with that, we have very and moderate preterm in between. Now, what are the causes of prematurity? It may be spontaneously delivered baby or iatrogenically, depending on the baby's or mother's risk. When it comes to the spontaneous, most of them come with unknown cause, spontaneously come and deliver. If there's a previous preterm baby, there's a risk. Cervical incompetence, yes, they can come out a little early. In low maternal weight, teenage, multiple pregnancies, there's a high chance for them to become premature. Then, if mother had some antipartum hemorrhages, acute systemic illnesses, probably we go for a iatrogenic prematurity. We, are, we have decided to terminate the pregnancy a little early. Now, I told that there's another group where the low birth weight and they are not appropriately gone for the particular gestation, what we call the small for gestational age babies. Those babies have main two categories where whether only body is small, the sparing the head, that is mainly with the placental insufficiency, what you call the asymmetrical IUGR, so there's a different group. And there's another group, Symmetrical IUGR, where your body and head both small. So head, the brain growth also affected. Most of the syndromic babies, chromosomal abnormalities, babies with congenital infection, they can become symmetrical IUGR. Simply, if it's a placenta is insufficient, you have asymmetrical. And if you're given the chance, I'm sure we like to pick to be a asymmetrical IUGR baby, why? Hopefully with the time, with the appropriate nutrition and initial management, you can have an adequate growth for this group of babies. The outcome will be much better. How are you going to identify a baby with IUGR or small for gestational age babies? Those babies lie below the 10th centile during intrauterine life because of that, they come out as low birth weight. So they haven't grown properly. As if you haven't, you have starved for a while. These babies are a bit emaciated. And they take energy with the, using their subcutaneous tissue. Because of that, they have very loose fall of skin. With that, it's not nice to tell, but these kind of babies have a bit of old man appearance. So those are the small to gestational or IUGR babies. In compared to that, the preterm babies, they may be appropriately grown for the age, but as they have come out early, they are low birth weight, but may be appropriately grown. How are you going to identify them? So lower the maturity, the the, all these features that I'm going to discuss in the next few slides will be marked. Simply, you should be able to recognize the maturity clinically. Why? You might be the person who attend for the delivery. And you should be able to recognize these babies, how premature they are, depending on the clinical features, especially when they, they are in the periviable period. Most important things you have to concentrate on their eyes, the skin, breast bud, the genitals, and the skin creases. What will happen to the breast bud? Lower the maturity, still only the nodule can be seen. And when they become mature only, they have the nicely formed 
breast with the nipple and the areola. And the genitalia. In premature babies, when it comes to male genitalia, they are lack of rugae. Sometimes you might not be able to palpate the testicles within the scrotal sac. Whereas the term baby, they have the nicely formed rugae in the scrotal sac. In females, in the term baby, the labia minora is nicely covered with labia majora. Whereas in preterm babies, you can see the prominent clitoris, which is not covered with the labia majora. And what happened to the creases? In preterm, it's like a plain sole. Whereas when it's the mature, you start to get all the creases from top to bottom. And the ear recoil, the picture is not that great or the market. What you can see is, if you can see me, so you have to fold this ear and see this ear recoiling is nicely happen in the term babies. In the preterm, the folded ear may be really folded and keep there because the recoiling is not there as the cartilage is not formed properly. So these clinical features you can use to assess the possible maturity. Now, what are the problems in small for gestational age babies? That is, babies are low birth weight and not appropriately grown for the particular gestation. Any newborn is more prone to hypothermia. Small for gestational age babies have a higher risk because of the lack of stores. They are more prone to hypoglycemia and they are prone to infections. Because of the inadequate growth of the hypoxia, they can have polycythemia. And especially with the placental insufficiency, there's high chance for them to have the episodes of hypoxia, the event of hypoxia at the time of delivery with that meconium aspiration. It's much more common with term IUGR babies. Compared to that, the preterm babies, yes, depending on the time from birth, they are Problems are different. They have early problems, some intermediate problems, and late problems. Late in, especially when they get ready to go home after about term of the corrected gestational age, they can have late problems as well. I'm really going to concentrate on early problems where the survival and the prognosis and the long-term outcome you can improve. The list is really long, but in your level, I'm going to take this hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and feeding problems. These we can separately have to discuss at one point, but it's mainly because those are sim with simple measures, the hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and feeding problem, you can improve the outcome. So mainly I'm going to concentrate on these three areas and we'll come in with hypothermia. What do you mean by hypothermia? So the normal temperature is roughly is from 36.5 to 37.5. Anything below, we can take it as hypothermia. But how low the value, depending on that, sorry, we categorize into mild, moderate, and severe. If you can see, up to about 36, you take it as mild, then 36 to 32 moderate. If that if it is less than 32, it's severe hypothermia. Hypothermia per se, only hypothermia can kill the baby. And all your other problems, the apnea, the hypoglycemia, respiratory distress, it aggravates with hypothermia. So once you manage temperature, it's very easy to manage the baby. So from the beginning, from the time of delivery, the labor room, up until discharge, even after discharge all the time, we have to keep in mind to maintain the nomothermia. How to do it at the time of delivery, probably you will know. Now, once you stabilize the baby, the things that we can do, we are going to discuss. By the way, why are they more prone to hypothermia? If you can imagine the size of the baby, Compared to the size, they have a very large body surface area. And on top of that, they have lack of subcutaneous tissue. 
so the thermal insulation is reduced and they have less brown fat where the heat generation is less so all these factors make the baby vulnerable to hypothermia if you can remember your physics oh, okay something so the baby can lose the temperature all the means it may be radiation convection evaporation and conduction so that's why we nicely keep wipe the baby at the time of delivery otherwise the wetness the water yes evaporate making the baby hypothermic and you try to keep the baby take the baby to a close environment switch off the fans the cover the windows so otherwise this passing air currents take the temperature away the convection and the nearby warm the equipment by the radiation and the conduction the attached surface so you keep the baby in a on a warm tower you are not going to measure the weight soon after delivery so all these things if you can think of what are the ways we can do the things that we can do to reduce the baby's temperature you can keep them in a normal temperature actually what we do inside the unit if it is a very preterm baby we try to take them to the incubator so we are going to nurse the baby inside an incubator where you can give the adequate humidity and keep the warm at the baby warm so be bigger babies late preterm the term babies or the preterm babies whom we have already managed inside an incubator once they come to an appropriate age or a weight roughly about corrected 33 34 you decided to move them to the radiant warm and keep them under the radiant warm then yes bigger babies who can keep the temperature maintain the temperature yes then you transfer them to the cot and you make sure you nicely dry the wrap and cover the baby and especially you try to cover the head by that is the area you are going to lose your temperature much more because the surface area is really high and you can see this is one of the best method to keep the baby warm even the sick baby if we have the facilities that is one to one care the nursing care you can try this wonderful method of kangaroo mother care which you listened for a full, full, full lecture so you have the understanding so by keeping the baby in the skin to skin contact it's not only the temperature control there are much more benefits but this is one way you can use so you can use all these methods to maintain the temperature while in the unit how after going home yes same you can nicely dress the baby up with the warm towels wrap and you can keep and same time you can use the kangaroo mother care at home also so how do you know that baba is hypothermic one thing is you can measure the temperature and see the accelerated temperature you can measure and depending on that depending on the severity you gradually try to bring up the temperature and make the in the normal thermia if is a mother who is in the community you can train them to palpate and see if the palms and soles are cold but the tummy is still warm probably baby is having mild hypothermia where you your skin to skin contact will help but even the tummy is cold probably the baby is having moderate to severe so you can keep the baby in the kangaroo mother care and if the baba is in the ward or in a unit you can gradually rewarm the baby by keeping under a radiant warmer or in an incubator so you need a warm room or equipment to keep the baby warm and adequately cover if the baby is in the cot kangaroo mother care is one of the best ways to maintain the temperature then if baby is severely hypothermic that is less than 32 probably you might have to act very quickly you ca can give warm iv fluids i told that hypothermia can create respiratory distress yes you are going to start them on oxygen 
and they can go into DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So you have to look into it and manage. So if they're severely hypothermic, you need this baby, the inward management. Then the feeding problems. Why do, once the baby come out or the preterm or a low birth weight baby, now you have to see how am I going to feed this baby by if you can introduce enteral feeds early, there are so many benefits. One thing is the maintaining the gut flora and the long-term risk of feed intolerance or necrotizing enterocolitis. But whether my baby is fit enough, suitable enough to start feeds, you have to decide. What is the main thing? One thing is how stable your baby is. The second one is with the feeding ability of the baby. If it is a very preterm baby, you might not be able to put the baby to the breast. If it's a very sick baby, you might not be able to put the baby to the breast. So depending on that, the feeding ability and the stability of the baby, you have to decide how I'm going to feed this baby. So if you, your baby has fast breathing, that is tachypnea, with significant respiratory distress, with chest in drawing, intercostal recessions, subcostal recessions, and if baby become active, increase oxygen requirement, if baby is convulsing, the temperature instability, not alert or conscious enough, some problem with abdomen like abdominal distension. If you have any of these features, this baba is unstable, to commence on feeds. Then it's a must for you to start parental, the intravenous fluid to give the energy. So how are you going to feed the baby initially? One thing, it depends on the gestational age, why the feeding skill, the maturation of feeding skill, most of the time depend on the gestational age of the baby. More the immature, immature the feeding skills as well. So normally we can keep a preterm baby about 34 in the ward, the postnatal ward. That is the time, most of the time they have the mature sucking pattern where they can coordinate the breathing and swallowing. So otherwise healthy, more than 34 weeks, you can try breastfeeding. Very preterm, yes, no proper sucking, no gut motility. Most of the time you have to go for initial intravenous fluid. Then when they become really the extreme preterm becoming bigger or a preterm baby who delivered somewhere around moderate, yes, then you can think of, yes, I can feed this baby, but baby is not strong enough to suck. Then you can go for express breast milk either with the tube or it's mainly with the tube feeds. Then slightly mature sucking pattern in 32-34, where they begin coordination, then you can think of to go for a spoon or cup feed. Normally what we do is, we decide initially and we gradually advance the volume and the feeding pattern. What are the choices available? So if baby is bigger enough and strong enough, you can think of enteral feeds. Then we can use the mother's milk or you can think of donor breast milk. But if baby is very small or not well enough to get the enteral feeds, you have to think of parental fluid or parental nutrition. So parental nutrition, we can use, or you can think of dextrose with the additives of the electrolytes as IV fluids. But the very first day, we only use 10% dextrose. The first and foremost, the best food available for the neonate is the maternal milk. There's no doubt. Then you can use human donor milk or preterm formula. 
if it's a preterm baby, if the maternal milk is insufficient, but which is more beneficial is uncertain. But the Western countries, they go for the, with the parents' permission for the human donor milk compatible for that particular gestation. Then if they are sick enough, but very, the extreme premature, extreme low birth weight, they need nutrition to grow. Especially if they intubated, the muscles should grow. So they need protein energy rather than just giving the plain fluid. Then you have the benefit of parental nutrition. But we try to establish feeds as quickly as possible and to tail off parental or the intravenous fluid. Now, how I'm going to feed my baby? It depends on the assessment of the baby. If the baby is clinically stable, yes. With the appropriate weight, yes. With the baby's effectively breastfeed, Baba is able to feed effectively, yes. You try to initiate breastfeeding. But, Baby is not clinically stable, then you have to go for the sick baby management. And baby is clinically stable, but weight is very low. So then you have to go for start with intravenous fluid, but you start the small volumes of enteral and gradually advance it. Now you have a stable baby, but small. This kind of baby, you need, you can give expressed milk, but not directly from the breast. So you can select the method of feeding. Am I going to give the tube feed? That is, you pass the nasogastric or orogastric tube and give. Or if baby is having some coordination, you can go for the oral feeds, either with the cup and spoon. That's how you decide. So it's mainly the baby's maturity and how well or ill the baby is. Whatever you do at the time of discharge, now you are going to transit from IV fluids, then adequate weight is there and adequate maturity. Then you go for tube feeds. Initially, you go for nasogastric tube where you keep the tube and give the feeds. But with, when they become a bit bigger, you might not be able to keep. So you are going to pass the tube, give the feeds, and take the tube out, the garbage feeding. Then you transit to expressed milk, the orally, with either cup or spoon. And with the same time, you slowly try to establish the breastfeeding. So at the time of discharge, these babies should be fed from the mother, either from the breast or the expressed breast milk. And you could have observed a weight gain from this baby in mother's hand with the feeding. So this is one method. The cup feed is a method that you can train the mother so she can combine up until baby gets an adequate maturity to fully get the whole nutrition from the breast. So most of these preterm babies, somewhere around 33, we are going to train the mother for to do the cup feeds and to improve the nutrition. Now, what is hypoglycemia? This is the most common metabolic disorder in neonates. It's very important or essential to anticipate hypoglycemia and try to prevent it. And if it is there, to go for early treatment. Why? By doing that, you can reduce the mortality and morbidity and long-term neurodevelopment outcome. So how are you going to anticipate a baby who is susceptible for hypoglycemia? Most of the preterm babies and low birth weight babies, infant of diabetic mothers and mothers who have been on beta blockers, and any sick neonate, so they can become hypoglycemic. So you keep late preterm babies, some low birth weight babies, infant of diabetic mothers in the postnatal ward. So 
it's your duty as the attending doctor for this delivery or the caring doctor for these babies to keep them under hypoglycemia care plan where you anticipate possibility of hypoglycemia and you are going to monitor these babies monitor with blood sugar values now what is the definition of hypoglycemia now we have a definition that is an arbitrary value they have given the who that 45 mg per deciliter so any neonate who has the value less than 2.6 millimoles per liter or 45 mg per deciliter we take them as hypoglycemia and there's another thing called optional threshold that is now the clinician should consider the intervention depending on the concentration why anything below 45 is hypoglycemia but how are you going to manage this you have to decide depending on the baby's blood sugar value and the clinical features so there are three important there are three important values you have to keep in mind one thing is the 18 milligrams per deciliter the other one is 45 but with abnormal clinical signs and there's another value that is 36 so it is 45 36 18 that is 2.6 2 and 1 millimole so how are you going to manage with these values we'll discuss now you have a baby with hypoglycemia one group having clinical features what you call the symptomatic hypoglycemia and another group where you have a low value but not not giving any symptoms so asymptomatic hypoglycemia the two categories we are going to manage one is symptomatic the other one is asymptomatic okay now i told that we are going to screen these babies the preterm low birth weight, infant of diabetic mothers, those babies we are going to monitor in the ward. This monitoring should be done before the second feed. So it's a must for you to feed them as early as possible, preferably within the first hour. Then you are going to check the blood sugar before the next feed, that is within around four hours of birth. So next pre-feed you are going to check. Now, if these values are normal, there's a way you are going to monitor. Initially, you take a bit of frequent pricks, then you try to reduce the frequency of monitoring, and roughly you monitor these babies for about 48 hours. But anytime if they are symptomatic, you have to check the sugar again. And it's a must to take, check the temperature along with the blood sugar and where to prick. So normally we check with the heel prick. If you can see, this white area is the one. That is if you draw a line in between the big toe to the midline of the heel or in between fourth and fifth finger, this lateral and medial aspect is the one we are going to prick in the heel, not the central part. Why? You have the calcaneum very close by. One thing, it's very painful, or you might introduce infection to the bone. So that's why you are going to take this either side. Now, for you to see whether Baba is having symptomatic or asymptomatic hypoglycemia, now you have to know what are the clinical features of hypoglycemia. It's same as the features that you have now. You have symptoms related to the brain, and the sympathetic nervous system. We'll start where you are very lethargic, limpy. Then you have sweating. Now you're really hungry, irritable. Then what is jitteriness? Jittery is a kind of excessive tremulous. It's not convulsion. You can stop by holding, but Baba is really tremulous. Then they can become hypothermic, apneic, color changes. So all these features can occur. So if you encounter any baby like that, better check the blood sugar. And as we said, you have to anticipate. You are going to look for it. 
and you try to prevent it by commence early feeds. If not, if baby is not stable enough to start feeds, you have to start IV fluid early. And you continue to monitor and you detect hypoglycemia. So how are you going to manage depend on the value and the clinical features. So two main categories. One thing is asymptomatic hypoglycemia. The other one is symptomatic hypoglycemia or irrespective of the clinical features, no clinical features, but value is less than 18 milligrams per deciliter. So you have hypoglycemia less than 45, but more than 36. What do you do? You support the feeding and you recheck the blood sugar before next feed. So you check the pre-feed blood. Then there's another category where you have 18 to 36, but asymptomatic. So you support with feeding and you check another value. So repeatedly, if it becomes this range, this baby need IV infusion of dextrose. It's infusion. You're not going to give a bolus. It's an infusion. Now there's another baby who need the bolus then followed by an infusion. That is baby with less than 45 with clinical features. The value below 45 but baby is having some symptoms of hypoglycemia or a baby even asymptomatic less than 18. Those two babies, the two categories, First, you have to give a bolus. So what is the bolus of dextrose? It is 2.5 ml per kg over one minute. And you have to keep in mind to commence the dextrose infusion. If it is a term baby, the very first day, you start them on 60 milliliters per kg per day. Why? You're not going to stop just by giving the bolus. You give the bolus, yes, same time, your insulin surge, and you might go into rebound hypoglycemia. So that's why you're going to start on the infusion the same time. Here, you have to repeat in 30 minutes and see. And depend on the value, you can decide to go for another bolus. And if it is persistent, it's completely a different entity where you are going to investigate in further aspects. Otherwise, you are going to go up level in the concentration and the volume, you can step up the total volume, keeping the 10%, failing which you have to increase the dextrose volume. So don't worry all these things. We have our standard guidelines so you can follow. But most important thing at this point is to anticipate hypoglycemia, to put them under the hypoglycemia care plan and Initial management, if you detect a baby with hypoglycemia, either without symptoms or with symptoms. So that is the most important, the initial. Once you manage the initial bit to do, you can get hold your seniors or your guideline and to take it from there. But this initial recognition is very important. So in a summary, the prematurity and low birth weight, it causes increased morbidity and mortality. And if you can remember, there are so many problems you encounter in the early neonatal period, especially the hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and feeding issues. If you manage, actively involved and manage these problems, you can have a neurodevelopmentally nicely developed baby in future. So the initial management decide it's not the, the quantity of the baby that you're going to send out from your unit or the neonatal baby, but the quality of the baby, how healthy baby you are going to hand over to the mother. So it's your duty to anticipate and manage these babies. Fine. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask. This one is asked, the Ballard score in assessing the age of the neonate, yes, that is one of the best, but it's very lengthy one, this assessment. So in a BC delivery suit, where you have to do the initial resuscitation, the making the decision, you might not get the enough time to do it. Then the quick assessment, 
by the most senior person and you have to decide, especially when it comes to the periviable period. After that, early as possible, you can go for the proper scoring system. How much of fluid do we give to the preterm initially and how do we increase fluid daily? So normally, lower the maturity, higher the volume. Why? The surface area is compared to the size of the baby is higher. So it's mainly we maintain to manage the electrolytes and their losses. So in a late preterm baby or a preterm baby, we normally start 80 mils per kg per day. For a term baby, you start 60. For a preterm, you start 80. But if it is an extreme preterm baby, transit from some other unit, even you might have even to go up to 90 or 100. So it's mainly depend on the baby's urine output and the other signs of perfusion as well. So normally you start with 80, but depending on the parameters, you might decide to go up in the fluid. So the glucose infusion rate. So the bolus is 2.5 ml per kg, 10% dextrose. The infusion rate, depending on the, the age of the baby. If it is the very first day for a term baby, you start 60 milliliters per kg per day. For a preterm baby, you start 80 milliliters per kg per day. What is the discharge criteria for preterm baby? Okay, what are the discharge criteria for preterm baby? Simply, once they come in to the unit, normally the best thing to say, because it's a very uncertain period. Normally the mothers, they don't like to live in the uncertain, so they need some answer. Best thing is to tell, so okay, your baby is this much small, this much immature. If everything goes smoothly, hopefully you'll be able to go home by the expected date of delivery, that close to term. But your discharge criteria depend on how baby clinically well. Adequate maturity, 35, yes, 34, 35. Then weight, minimum 1.5 would do. Then you should have seen babies nicely gaining weight in mother's hand. So you can keep them in the kangaroo mother care where you have the medical supervision, but mother's doing everything. With that, you can see whether the baby is achieving a weight and how confident is the mother because they have born in a very stressful time period. Probably some mothers are very scared. So you are going to check with the mother the, the, how strong the mother to take the baby out. Yes. Then all the other things you have given the BCG, baby can maintain the temperature and all the screening has done and the referrals made, then you can discharge these babies. How to measure urine output in units? Normally, uh, if the baby is very sick, intubated, we catheterize them. Why? Now, when it comes to the fluid management of the newborns, what they say is, normally we go with this arbitrary increment. That is, they have assessed the requirement for the electrolyte, the, what do you call it? To get rid of the electrolyte. So that's how they calculate this 60, 80. But, more fluid harmful for the baby, especially for the preterm babies. Why? Your lungs might be wet and PD can be open. Now the advice is you increase fluid appropriately. Now we have incubators where you can measure inbuilt weight. Then you can go with the daily weight gain or a weight loss. Then you have to assess the perfusion, yes, by urine output. The other one is you have to have the facilities to do the serum electrolyte, especially the sodium. So baby doesn't lose weight the, rapidly. So normally you can have a one to 2% weight loss per day with the adequate urine output, two to three milliliters per kg per day. And the sodium is not rapidly rising. Baba doesn't show any hypernatremia, the dehydration features. You can keep the same volume and see. Oh, Rather than going in 20 increments, you can go for 10 
10 likes, so 80, 90, 100. So you can adjust it. How to measure? If it's a sick baby, you catheterize and you can easily measure. If not, normally what we do is we keep the cotton and we measure the weight of the cotton. So you know the dry weight and the wet weight, then roughly equals to the volume. So that's how we are going to take. I think my students are there, so they are really happy to see me. It seems fine. Any more questions? If not, I'm going to stop here now. And you can take 10 more minutes for your break and then join. If you can say hello or okay, I'm really happy. Oh, okay, that's a good question before you leave. As you, as we know the stage in the late, what is the importance of assessing the prematurity clinically? No. This assessment either we do with the LRMP, the regular menstrual period. If you check with the mothers, most of them have forgotten it. The next best is the ultrasound scan abdomen. Normally, if you take the first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester assessment, the first, if you've done the scan, the dating scan, the first trimester, it's plus or minus five. So then if not, it's 10 days to two weeks. So two weeks is a huge. When it comes to 20, it might be 25. Then you have to decide. That's why this clinical maturity Assessment is very important. Fine. I'm going to stop now. You can take the break. Madam. Yes. Uh, lecture, madam. Sorry. Sorry. You have another lecture now. Thank you, madam. Okay.
Hello, can hear? Can I start? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ready, sir. Oh, sir. Yeah. Can I start? Yes. What? Uh, because I am. Uh, oops. Can you can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Can right. I see. Okay. So I'll be, you're not, uh, there are no videos, no? Only the no, slide sir. is appearing. Okay. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, physiological basis of resuscitation at birth. And uh, I am uh, Dr. Rajiv Sadandaraja, neonatologist at uh, Kalabovila. So, so end up the learning outcomes, a basic understanding of physiology of birth, asphyxia, provides a logical approach to resuscitation. Now we are going to talk about the resuscitation of a baby who is not crying, right? And it explains why we do what we do and the importance in, in order. Resuscitation of a newborn should be done in an order. To, to understand resuscitation, you should know the basic physiology. So what is the main cause of collapse in an adult? And what is the main cause of collapse in a uh, neonate? Because we are talking about the collapsed babies. Uh, main cause of collapse in adult is basically a cardiac arrest. In children, uh, the heart is a bit stronger than adults. So the main re reason for collapse is respiratory arrest. So what important factors about babies at birth might affect resuscitation? Because the babies are small compared to other uh, pediatric patients, newborn babies are small uh, and they are wet because uh, they are born through lyco and they are wet. And uh, before birth, the lungs are full of fluid. So if you know this, uh, uh, what, what happens to these babies, soon after birth, then the physiology will be understood. So they are more prone for hypothermia that, and they have unexpanded lungs and uh, the saturation of a baby, it might take to about sometimes about 10 minutes to reach 90%. So these things you should know in resuscitation and uh, they have a special uh, function they have gasping breathing, so, so they, they can resuscitate themselves. And they have a high cardiac glycogen stores. So these points you remember because uh, these will help in resuscitation. When you're doing resuscitation, you should know how to avoid hypothermia and what to do if the lungs are not expanded. And if the saturation is uh, around 90s or 85, uh, whether to panic or not, and uh, when the babies are gasping and uh, you, you can tell which stage of uh, physiology or resuscitation baby is in. This is a very healthy baby. You can see uh, very good tone, uh, legs and arms are flexed and very good cry. So this is what we want. When the babies are not doing this, that baby needs resuscitation. Uh, <clears throat> This uh, diagram shows uh, before the first breath, the lungs are filled with fluid that is in the blue part. And uh, when they are breathing, 
it will be expanded with air and that is a clear part so what stimulates a baby to breathe or to cry because you know babies will breathe in the in utero but it is not very effective but when they breathe outside it should be effective right uh, cord obstruction as soon as the baby is born when you put the clamp the cord is obstructed so the supply is of uh, oxygen and everything is uh, limited so the baby has to breathe and the temperature change there is a change of temperature when the babies are born soon after birth and physical stimulation that's what we do uh, by tapping the baby and so on so these will stimulate the baby to cry and it will stimulate when the babies are crying they have a good breath so what happens with the first breath when the babies are breathing uh, fluid i told you lungs are filled with fluid that fluid will be pushed away and when the fluids are pushed away from the alveoli uh, they will be filled by air so uh, this is a radiographic uh, picture which is taken so many years ago you can see in the first one the whitish white out lung which is filled with fluid within few seconds not even few seconds fraction of a second the lungs are filled with air that's what you see on the right side of your screen with expanded lungs and aerated lungs so the response to hypoxia this means you have to know the physiology what happens to a baby if the baby is not breathing or if the baby is cord accidents we call it cord accidents if the cord is uh, like say cord prolapse type of thing when the placental abruption the baby will not get enough oxygen so baby will become hypoxic so the what happens to the baby the researchers have shown uh, what sort of uh, changes can happen in the baby for in the in response to hypoxia baby's breathing pattern changes that is the first thing and level of consciousness changes blood pressure changes heart rate changes babies in the blood the po2 and the pco2 changes so these are the few changes which happen in a baby which which uh, actually it was demonstrated in lambs but it's similar thing uh, we can uh, apply for babies so the breathing changes when the when there's hypoxia consciousness of the baby change blood pressure changes heart rate and oxygen and co2 change so this graph this is a this this will be series of graphs if you can just follow right uh in the y axis at the top of the range top at the top you see the breaths second one is depicts oxygen in the x axis it shows the time time zero is the time where oxygen was not given no oxygen was stopped or interrupted okay so just have a look at this graph so when in zero when the oxygen is not given or oxygen is interrupted uh, you can see on the top baby starts breathing what happens the baby starts breathing 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 and it slowly gets faster and deeper breaths you can see by the uh, by the size of the lines it stay and the uh, distance it becomes faster faster and deeper breaths and when you see the pao2 that drops that drops from 0 to 10 minutes it drops after some time the say the baby still is not getting oxygen baby stops breathing that is the one there is a gap between that pink and the breaths on the top line the pink uh, pink breaths and the uh, black breaths so that is the time that is we call primary apnea <clears throat> that is called primary apnea so they start the black ones are the gasping breathing and the baby starts to breathe have some gasping breathing and uh, that breath if still if the baby doesn't get oxygen then baby will go into the terminal apnea 
at the same time the oxygen also is very low so baby's respiratory center has normal breaths and it has a spinal center which causes gasping so this graph if you see the oxygen is still not given right and first line the topmost gives the breaths which uh, baby starts breathing i tell tell you again baby starts breathing and goes to the primary apnea and second one gives uh, gasping breathing and goes into the terminal apnea right at the same time co2 builds up and uh, acidosis builds up and initial heart rate also drops so these are the physi physiological changes which happens in a baby if that baby gets its oxygen disrupted so these are the main things one is the breathing pattern po2 co2 co2 goes up po2 comes down excess acid uh, develops and heart rate drops right and and blood pressure also drops during the same time so how does a blood baby maintains a reasonable blood pressure right by shutting down the circulation in non essential areas like skin and gi tract and so on so when you see a very pale baby that means that circulation is uh, diverted so that means baby has been hypoxic for some time so cyanos babies are better than pale babies the cyanos babies at least they have the circulation in the skin pale babies means circulation is shunted from the skin so next we'll see what happens if we give interruptions at different stages because when the baby breathes so, sorry when the baby is born if the baby is not crying or irregular breathing it can be in any stage it can be in the primary apnea or gasping breathing or in the terminal apnea so what happens in the primary apnea this is the stage of primary apnea yeah, right this is a stage of primary apnea if we intervene pay through the car if we intervene at this stage right uh, we the when we research state baby starts gasping right when we, baby starts gasping and po2 goes up acid drops and co2 drops and heart rate picks up so if you see this chart when we interrupt and when we start resuscitating at this stage outcome is good it quickly comes right then the baby start after gasping baby takes some regular breaths and the oxygen is up co2 comes down as it slowly comes down blood pressure and heart rate picks up so this is the first uh, uh, intervention that is in the primary apnea so that is a good thing if we intervene early when the baby is born and if they don't cry we actually we don't know whether is primary apnea or terminal apnea so we have to be prepared for a terminal apnea and if we resuscitate and if the baby picks up quickly then we know it's retrospectively we can think is a primary apnea so this baby is no need of uh, like big interventions if the airway is patent if the baby starts breathing gasping it picks up you can see if if we keep the airway open then the baby starts gasping then the oxygen goes up then everything will be okay next scenario when the baby some baby is born and they start gasping gasping is deep breaths at that stage even if you keep air airway open then again it will it will be the same thing this is if you keep the airway open baby can resuscitate himself okay then there will be few gasps and there will be some intermittent uh, good breaths and oxygen will go up so need uh, if the airway is patent no no need of active intervention so the final step baby is in the terminal apnea so we don't i told you we don't know whether baby will be in the primary apnea or terminal apnea when the baby is born and baby is not crying so this baby if you keep keep the airway open do they do they gasp no there is because that's why it's called terminal apnea and they do not gasp when they do not gasp they are not getting oxygen inside 
the lungs and their breathing will not start then this baby what will happen this baby will going to what will happen if no intervention is needed if you just keep an airway open what will happen this baby is going to die right right we'll see by only keeping the airway open i told you this baby is going to die so he needs some resuscitation that means we have to support that baby so in that case only we need lung aeration because lungs are filled with fluid so you have to get rid of that fluid because baby is not going to do you have to do for the baby and when you do that then when you see you can see that oxygen is picking up co2 comes down and heart rate also picks up if the baby cannot breathe on its own you have to help the baby to inflate the lungs when you inflate the lungs only the fluid will go out of the lungs and air will fill so th that's what you are going doing here if you see the pink line after the gasping if you inflate that the oxygen will go up and the baby starts gasping the pink lines on the top shows gasping and they will start to resuscitate themselves i mean you are helping them but oxygen once it goes inside or oxygen or air goes inside the lung they start gasping and the system is improving when you see the other lines is uh, there will be few gasps in between irregular breaths few gasps irregular breaths and heart rate and uh, and blood pressure everything becomes uh, improves right and this is a time you have to after initial inflation of the lungs you have to give some ventilation right because they still babies Uh, breathing is not regular gasping is not a regular breathing right so that means we baby needs ventilation breaths so this chart summarizes if you have a if you intervene in, when the baby is in the apneic stage if it takes longer then you know is baby was in the in the terminal apnea if you intervene and if the baby recovers very quickly that baby was in primary apnea so you give, give lung aeration and if if it's not improving that means baby need chest compression okay chest compression means the heart needs some support so combining aer lung aeration ventilation and chest compression then it will take some time for the baby to recover so this is not a good situation to see generally with good uh, air airway opening and uh, when uh, lung aeration and ventilation baby should improve so this have this happens after intervention so when you see this this is the primary apnea i told you again the gasping and regular breathing picks up very quickly in terminal apnea in terminal apnea it takes a long time right right uh, so this is basically the physiology of a baby who is not breathing so you have to understand the it, the consciousness may be less or absent because when the babies are born they are very floppy they won't respond the heart rate is very low and the blood pressure is low and when you do a blood gas uh, oxygen may be low co2 may be high and baby might have acidosis so those are things will happen if you don't resuscitate if you your aim of resuscitation is to change all those things okay so this is basically a small lecture understanding physiology if the uh, just remember if the baby doesn't get oxygen what happens to the baby is what i have done any questions so in i'll come back to the questions so in summary remember this uh, picture Where, wherever you intervene be prepared to intervene thinking that baby is in the terminal apnea right so the if you it's okay if you keep the baby airway open in the primary apnea the baby will resuscitate itself as okay but you think babies are always in the terminal apnea If the babies are not breathing then the life is easy so you have to 
aerate the lung, ventilate the lung, give chest compression if the baby is in the terminal apnea. In summary, primary apnea you know and secondary apnea that is the terminal apnea. So when the babies are born, we don't know which, is, which stage the baby is in. So we do thinking baby is in the secondary apnea. That means if we do not intervene, baby is going to die. Right? And remember the physiological changes in the primary and the secondary apnea. And what sort of appropriate intervention? Because this is, I am talking only about the physiology. There will be, uh, because the, you, know, you know that neonatal life support is a whole day course where you get lectures and interpretations and so on. Uh, so the, what sort of interventions you do will be dealt in another lecture. Okay, any questions? Yeah, one question is somebody but it all depends if the with inflation breaths, if the heart rate is not picking up, that means when you give good inflation breaths, your lung should uh, lung should uh, well, lung should uh, expand and the uh, heart should beat faster so if you if the lungs are expanding and the heart rate is still low means that heart needs some support then only you go for a chest compression so only then you go ahead and give chest compression the idea of chest compression is to get some oxygenated blood to the uh, cardiac muscle not it's only it's by compressing you are trying to give some oxygenated blood to the cardiac muscle where it pumps the heart starts pumping because you know i told you that their heart is they have good glycogen storage so they are uh, the the energy wise there should not be a problem the main problem is hypoxia hope that uh, explains Another question is how to assess the breathing. So it's like this. Now, when the babies are born, if they vigorously cry, means that is good. Then the next axiom is they are not, not crying or not breathing. Though that is very bad. In, in between, you can have gasping breathing, irregular breathing, and so on. So you have to assess the breathing soon after birth. Yes, uh, there was another question asked the when the inflation breaths fail to open up the lungs. That means one of the main reasons is the airway is not patent. 
airway should be patent airway in sense it from the mouth uh, nose up to the lungs it is the air the lungs so you have to reassess the baby i mean uh, the position of the baby whether the tongue has fallen back or whether the extension because this will be dealt in the resuscitation lecture so anyway i am just telling if the airway is not patent however much pressure you give in the inflation breath it is not going to the lungs so baby will not be resuscitated so the basic thing is to open up the airway and give the inflation breaths any more questions okay thank you very much and uh, okay now the one more question has come somebody has asked what is the role of ventilation breath the inflation breath is the initial few breaths we give that is initial five breaths to uh, expand the lungs and disperse the fluid which was inside the lungs understood ventilation breath is you have to have a like just uh, you have to you are you are expanding the lungs pass actively and the lungs will collapse uh, passively so that is like a normal breath you mimic a normal breathing so inflation breath slightly you give a higher long sorry longer duration about 2 3 seconds ventilation breath is only a bit, bit of a second right so that is the basic difference between inflation breath and uh, ventilatory breaths you mimic the normal breaths you remember that that will be fine okay i think uh, next lecture will be done by dr gitma fonseca she is a neonatologist at uh, andradapura rajita over to you thank you sir okay
can you all hear me yes madam can you see the presentation yes madam okay uh, good afternoon you all uh, i'm chitma fonseca I'm, I'm neonatologist from anuradhapura so the topic that i'm going to discuss with you is managing the preterm infant at birth i hope you have gone through the res normal resuscitation protocol and how to resuscitate a term baby uh, so in during this lecture what we are going to discuss is how to manage a preterm baby which is slightly different from a term baby okay so uh, so this topic it's very important to uh, identify few problems i hope we have already discussed this problem but we are going to further elaborate it because these are the key important factors in managing preterm so if you mismanage a preterm in short term basis you will see that this preterm baby will be hypothermic and hypoglycemic and same time if you have given oxygen unnecessarily you are exposing this baby for a hyperoxic situation so if you do those things then baby will end up in long term complications so what are the common long term in complications which has a uh, severe morbidity and mortality one thing is intraventricular hemorrhage that is the hemorrhage in the brain and uh, then bronchopulmonary dysplasia in simple term it is the chronic lung disease element occurred in preterm babies retinopathy of prematurity which is again the manifestation secondary to unnecessary exposure to oxygen okay so the preterm babies there are three main areas we are going to highlight in this which babies to worry about so the so preterm itself is a worry but out of this preterm there are certain categories you have to particularly concern about so that is we are going to highlight in next slide then what are the differences from term to preterm and how does this alter the our approach okay which babies you worried about so if you take about the preterm babies we say preterm any baby born less than 37 weeks we know the pregnancy can extend even up to 42 weeks so between 37 to 42 we call term baby then there are certain categories 34 to 36 we are not highly bothered about it because their behavior almost similar to term baby hmm then there's another category 31 to 33 weeks so they might behave as term babies or they might behave as the babies who are younger than that age so that is 30 weeks and below so 30 weeks and below they are definitely different so this 31 to 33 weeks might behave as 30 30 weeks or below so this is the category you have to be careful and you have to give your full attention to get their maximum better outcome so what are the differences we already discussed these points during the previous lectures they are more vulnerable to get cold even the term baby is vulnerable to get cold why now from the mother's uterus they are coming out to a very cold environment they are naked they are wet and when you compare about the thermoneutral mechanism compared to term the preterm has no thermal control mechanisms though they are more vulnerable and they have more fragile lungs why they don't have this surfactant if they born preterm less than 34 weeks so their lungs are not mature enough to uh, expand and to adapt for the normal ventilation they don't breathe effectively because they are 
the intercostal muscles and their breathing mechanism uh, has not developed. So their breathing mechanism may be very poor. So they have very few reserves because we all know the reserves usually they store during the latter, the third trimester. So they're born early, so they don't have these reserves to uh, to face this. And uh, when uh, the pulse oximetry often indicated why we are saying so is because uh, the color may not be ideal to assess the baby's condition. Okay, so when you talk about preterm, it's a very important to discuss about the antenatal period. So if you prepare the baby prior to delivery to get the optimal outcome, that is the, the best a way that you can have a very good preterm baby or the very good baby you can discharge from your PBU. So you might be thinking why as a house officer this is important for you because you might be working in a antenatal ward, maybe in a gynecology ward. So the preterm, the mother with this preterm pregnancy might be in, ended up in delivery in your ward accidentally or you might be the first person to uh, contact with this mother, then you can address this problem and then you can mm. sort out this problem, mm. then you can hand over a stable preterm baby to us for further management. So it is important about the gestational age. We discussed this point. So the miss, when the maturity is less, the outcome is uh, generally the poor. The complications are more with the lower the gestational age. Again, the multiple pregnancies has more complications than the uh, the single pregnancies. For example, they can have fetal uh, uh, fetal maternal trans. They can have the trans the twin to twin transfusion. So it is important. So there may be growth restrictions. So it is important to know whether it's a single pregnancy or multiple pregnancy. Then antenatal steroids. So the antenatal steroids has a lot of benefits, not only for the IVH, you can see the IVH, the intraventricular hemorrhage, reduced by 46%. So that is a huge number, isn't it? So the IVH might determine the whole new, the neurodevelopmental outcome of this baby. So if you can time this antenatal steroid, if mother is coming for a preterm delivery, then we can give the antenatal steroid at the appropriate time. So there are two preparations, dexamethasone and betamethasone, depending on the drug where you pack uh, available in the unit. So then the other drug is the magnesium sulfate. So why the magnesium sulfate? So the research has found it's a very good drug and which is practicing in our country as well. So it will, uh, so we give for the preterm births who are less than 32 weeks of gestation. What is the importance of it? It will improve the neurodevelopmental outcome of this baby. Then if mother comes with the pre premature rupture of membrane, then we, so that a route, that's a route for introducing infection. So you can start antibiotics to the mother. By that, mm -hmm. you can prevent the infection mm -hmm. or the core uamnitis or the the pregnancy won't be further complicating. So by controlling the infection, you might be delaying the, or you may be extending the pregnancy further by avoiding preterm delivery. So it is important to address these points as a house officer. Don't wait until the mother delivers. When you encounter anticipating this kind of preterm delivery, please think about steroids. Please think about other associated risk factors magnesium sulfate, whether this mother needs antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when, uh, so mm -hmm. where is, what is the ideal place for delivery? You have to think about regionaliz uh, regionalization of care. Why? Lesser odds of mortality. What does it mean? So if you deliver the baby in a well equipment center, where mm -hmm. you can manage an extreme preterm baby, with adequate facilities, then the outcome will be good. 
So the mortality will be less. So the ideal way, if your if the center is not having the incubator care, or, the, or it could be the inadequate facilities at the center, or it could be the lack of space at that particular point, then you have to think about in utero transfer. So why the in utero transfer? So if you deliver the baby at your unit, and if you are transferring this preterm unit after the birth, that means the first 48 hours life, it associated with increased risk of severe IVH. So then that itself says that baby, the ideal transfer should be in utero. Okay. Uh, so according to uh, antenatal counseling, so now this is a stressful situation. Mm -hmm. So ideally this should be done by the most senior person, so the either neonatologist or a pediatrician. If they are not mm -hmm. available, then it could be the senior house officer from the PBU staff, or it could be if no one is available, at least they are, as a house officer, you can give some idea what's going to happen to this mother because she may be having feelings of guilty, fear, anger, suffering, and sadness, because this is totally unexpected situation. So they they might, if it's an extreme freedom, like 22, 24 mm. weeks, uh, they might not, if you tell about the consequences, the long-term complications, possible complications, they might think about the rejection. So we can think about how to proceed after the delivery. So it is very important to counsel the parents, the both mother and father to face this situation. This is the ideal setup, what is happening in the other country. And that is what we are practicing in our country as well. So don't neglect this part. If you encounter, please inform the NICU staff to come and speak to this mother and inform about and discuss about their wishes and plans. Okay, so then at delivery, so what you are going to do? So depending on the gestation, you might think about whether you are going to do a comfort care or active resuscitation. What does it mean? Because if baby is extremely preterm and uh, the, the, the age, the baby's weight is not compatible with survival, then we might think about comfort care. So we are not giving the extensive resuscitation. So from certain gestation point onward, we do active resuscitation. That is very important. That's why the antenatal counseling is important. That's why the mother and father should aware what is going to be happened for their baby. So this is, I have summarized according to the, the guideline of the positional paper published in Sri Lanka College of Pediatrician for the resuscitation. So any babies who are less than 24 weeks and less than 500 mm. grams, we give only comfort care. But if they are more than 26 weeks, 26 weeks or above with more weight 600, then more than 600 will give full resuscitation. That means the, you, you manage airway, you give the chest compression. So, but babies between 22 to 26 weeks, weight is 500 to 600, then it is airway and ventilator support without cardiac massage and adrenaline. So this is the guideline what we have published in Sri Lanka at the moment. So then assistance versus resuscitation. What does it mean? The most preterm babies need help with transition to air breathing, not resuscitation. So you might think the preterm baby always need resuscitation. No, they only need the adaptation for this new life. So it may be only the assistance, not always the resuscitation. So it is very important to carefully assess the baby to see whether this baby needs only assistance or whether the baby needs the resuscitation and you give a gentle support to this tiny fellow. Mm. So it is always kill care at birth. Now this is a preterm baby. So ideally the neonatologist or pediatrician 
senior medical officer with experience and ideally it should be a uh, NICU, neonatal intensive care unit nurse and the anticipatory preparation so we can prepare prior to delivery and we can organize a team, we can allocate a person for the airway. The, usually the airway person is the most competent person to manage the airway, might need an intubation, uh, you need to give the inflation and ventilation breath. So the most skilled person usually take over the airway and then we can allocate a person for the uh, the chest mm -hmm. compression if we need that, mm -hmm. somebody for vascular access and allocate a nurse for drug preparation. It is important mm -hmm. to organize your team prior to delivery. Then speak to the obstetric team and always update them what's happening and we are ready. So this is the situation. So then they, they also know. So it, it's important to keep a good communication with the other team. Always call for additional help. I hope this point we highlighted in the previous lectures as well. You have to prepare your resuscitation kit. You have to prepare everything prior to the delivery. And you check your equipment, your environment situation, control the temperatures to minimize, the, to keep the temperature at least 26 or above. And uh, make sure to inform the neonatal intensive care unit and the transport team if available by this preterm baby ultimately ended up in a neonatal intensive care unit. So they have to switch on their incubator and they have to ready with a warm, pre-warm incubator to take over this baby. So if you haven't informed, they don't know that. So they might, there might, might not be a incubator even to take over this baby. So it is important to inform the NICU that you are going to, that Ideally, this should be happen when the mother admitted to your ward. So as a house officer, so please inform, please discuss with your colleagues, the option and ops colleagues, and then inform the NICU that we got a mother with pending preterm delivery. She is 26, 26 or 27 weeks, whatever the gestation, and the estimated weight is this, and these are the risk factors, so she might be delivering within next 48 hours and we are going to give these antenatal steroids and if she's going to deliver then we give magnesium sulfate and then uh, so we need a, we need to reserve a incubator and the ventilator for this baby if she delivers so that is the message we are expecting from a house officer to the NICU okay mm -hmm. so this is another important concept Always encourage these things because now this is practicing in our country as well, which is which has a very great value for uh, babies' uh, outcome for the morbidity as well as the mortality. Cord clamping. So new. So who are the babies who need cord clamping? Babies who doesn't need resuscitation. So baby who born with a very compromised situation. We all know we cannot wait for cord clamping. But if this baby is stable, even for a preterm baby, it is very important to give the cord clamping. So how long you are going to wait? At least one minute. So it could be one to three minutes. What we are going to do is we allow placental transfusion. So during this time, it's important to keep a baby warm so you can cover the baby with the pre-warm uh, towel. And then you allow the cord clamping and make sure that you have to observe the baby's color tone during this time as well because it's a preterm baby. So by giving this co delayed cord clamping, you are allowing at least about 80 ml. At one minute, you allow at least about 80 ml blood to the baby. So if you delay it to 30 minutes, that will be about 100 ml. So now you can see, so by doing this simple maneuver, how much you are going to achieve for the baby's outcome. So, as I mentioned before, the delayed cord clamping has early benefits and late benefits. So, it will give hemodynamic stability and you need less cyanotropes. Now, the blood pressures are stable because you have good volume mm. of blood which received from this placental transfusion and then less need for blood transfusion, which is very obvious. And later, they have found the baby's motor functions are 
improved at 18 to 22 months of age if you do this delayed cord clamping. So the baby, uh, I think this topic we already discussed, that is hypothermia. So how are you going to prevent hypothermia? We are going to fix this ambient temperature in delivery room about 26 or above, and you switch on your radiant warmer prior to delivery. Not after the delivery, it should be prior to delivery and it should be warm by the time baby arrives under this warmer. And you have to have pre-warm towels and plastic bags. This is something which we haven't used in term babies, isn't it? We usually say any baby who is less than 32 weeks, less than 1.2, you can use this plastic bag and you can use a hat to cover the baby's head because it has larger surface area and which mm -hmm. is a uh, lack of hair, so which is a, a good area to lose more and more heat from the baby. So you pre-warm the baby's incubator. That's why I told you, you have to inform the transport team to uh, switch on the transport incubator, switch on the baby's incubator in the NICU. So they pre-warm it prior to arrival. And there's another thing called humidity which also we discussed on previous lectures. So humidity at least about 85%. This is something we are talking about this preterm baby. Okay, so this is the, uh, the summary of what is happening in the hypothermia. So then the temperature, you can see mm -hmm. the severe hypothermia is less than 32. And uh, the cold stress between 36 to 36.5. Even drop of one degree Celsius of temperature, the baby's oxygen consumption and metabolic rate will increase by 10%. Because baby is trying to, uh, this poor weak fellow is trying to uh, develop their, so make the, uh, the heat by using the energy, uh, which should not happen. We should provide that warm environment for that baby. So it is very important to keep the baby warm with, by providing these measures. So this is how we use this plastic bag. So for this plastic bag, it's not a sterile one, it's a clean one. We use the uh, the bag which we used in the, uh, the, the supermarket so that you can cover the baby bag, cover with that bag. There are pre-made bags as well, but in our country we use that, uh, the mm -hmm bags which we use to, uh, to get the vegetables, fruits in the supermarket. So you can cover the baby's body and uh, you can cover the head with a cap. Uh, so if you want to do any procedure, you can make holes through the bag and then you can even put the UVC, the umbilical lines through that. So it is important to uh, put the ba baby into this bag and keep the this bag and the baby under the warm Tower, warm clothes and uh, so that bag itself acting as a uh, the it will prevent the further heat loss from the baby so, so at the beginning I mentioned that it may be difficult to uh, assess the baby's uh, the color uh, because it's a preterm baby uh, the skin may be very dark maybe skin bruises, so the color may be not a very accurate uh, uh, in this baby for assessment. So it is important to use the pulse oximeter, always fix it to the right wrist or hand, that is the preductal saturation. Uh, so the very important message what we are going to discuss is the hyperoxia, which is very detrimental to many organs at cellular and functional level. So always avoid hyperoxia. So the oxygenation level, so this is the uh, study results which they have found how the normal saturations we have in a baby who doesn't need the resuscitation. So at two minutes, you can see the baby's saturation is 60%. So that means if the baby's saturation is 60% at two minutes, we are not going to do anything. So usually this chart is available at the the resuscitation uh, with the resuscitator, so you can see it until you get familiar with that. So baby takes 10 minutes to re reach the 
saturation of 90%. So you can wait until then. So don't be panic and start oxygen. Don't give unnecessarily oxygen. This is the normal pattern how they behave. Because in utero, their normal saturation is about 60%. So from that environment, they adapt for the, the outer environment and reaching the 90% saturation at 10 minutes. Okay, so don't add oxygen if saturation is about 95. So the 100% oxygen is which actually has very bad effects. So you don't need oxygen to start resuscitation, but preterm babies might need some amount of oxygen. So it says the oxygen increases the work of breathing by 45% and the oxygen consumption by 25% and carbon dioxide production by 17%. So this creates, if you give more and more oxygen, it creates more and more free radicals like peroxide, hydroxide. So these free radicals can damage a lot of tissues. What are the vulnerable tissues? They damage, they oxidize with the free fatty acids and uh, they interact with proteins, DNA. So it affect, you can see the impact of it so the, at lung level and at the brain. So it has a lot of very bad effects by this free radical mediated damage. So it reduces the cerebral blood flow as well. So this is the lung. As, as I mentioned before, lung is very fragile and overinflation causes damage and which leading to inflammation and long-term morbidity. So unfortunately, this uh, I cannot run this video, but what it says is the normal breathing, this alveoli will, uh, it's not over distended and it's very smooth uh, with in, uh, in, uh, with inflation and the inhalation and exhalation, but in the mechanical ventilation, we are artificially giving excessive pressures and it will damage the lung tissue. So this lung inflation, the baby is now, if the baby is breathing, then so what you are going to do is you are going to apply some pressure, so which will facilitate as the baby's breathing. So, so what is the pressure you are going to do? It's called PEEP which is important for lung recruitment. How can you give this PEEP? So, you now I already mentioned that we now our uh, preterm baby is breathing. So this is the uh, equipment called Neopop. So you can set the pressure. Uh, so this pressure, ideally for a preterm baby, you can give five to eight centimeter water. So you can deliver that pressure and you can see that the pressure what you are delivering on this uh, interface. So you are not giving unnecessary high pressures. So in the previous lecture we mentioned, if you give it through the ambu bag, so when you give it, you cannot ideally measure the uh, what is the exact pressure you are delivering. But here, when you're giving it through the neopop, you can give that heat, the pressure, and you can see how much you are giving. So. If baby's breathing is not adequate, so in addition to this PEEP, you might need to give some uh, the ventilation breaths as well, so that it's about 20 to 25 centimeters. So you give PEEP, you set the PEEP at five, about five to eight, and then you give the, the other inflation breaths about 20 to 25 centimeter water. So by giving through this new path, you will provide a safe pressure level, you are not delivering unnecessarily high pressures, which will cause more damage to the baby. So these two x-rays uh, will show you when you give a peep and when you are not giving the peep, what will happen? If you give peep about five, five is not very high. So when you give five, you can get good inflation. The lung expansion is more compared to no peep. So that's why very important to start a peep pressure at the beginning.
So once the lungs are inflated, we already mentioned how to inflate the lung, isn't it? So once the lung is inflated, then baby need only the ventilatory breath. That is about 30 breaths per minute. So how do you know how you are giving the adequate uh, ventilatory breath? So if you give too much of pressure, then you can see the chest is excessively moving. We don't want unnecessary excessive chest movement. It is the normal breathing what we are going to see. And so the other important marker is the baby's heart rate. The so keep heart rate above 100. Usually, the, when you give the baby breathing support, if the baby has initial bradycardia, the breathing support itself pick up the heart rate. So if the heart rate is maintaining above 100, you know that you are giving adequate ventilatory support to the baby. Okay. So the labor room or the theater from, from that place to an ICU, you transport the baby ideally in a transport incubator. How do you going to support the baby's breathing with? Neopa. This is the ideal setup what should happen. And this is available in most centers. And this is how you deliver the CPAP. You set the pressure. Then the baby is getting the PEEP continuously. So they are, then the lungs will, expansion will be better. So the, then uh, I'll uh, quickly move to this preterm and surfactant therapy. Most babies who are less than 32 weeks require intubation within first 24 hours. So if what we say is if baby required intubation, that means uh, the baby, this is the baby born less than 34 weeks. So most probably the baby having surfactant deficient lung mm -hmm. disease, then we give the surfactant also through the ET tube. So the surfactant is a substance will keep the lung, the alveoli expanded. So if you give the surfactant at the appropriate time, it will prevent the alveoli collapse. So it will reduce the surface, surface tension of the alveolar wall, and by that, it improves the lung compliance. Uh, this slide, of course, we can skip, but if you are interested, when you are ventilating a baby, we are trying to avoid the pressure trauma, the barrow trauma, and uh, if you give high pressure, baby can have pneumothorax, that is air leaks. So it is important to use the appropriate minimum pressures for the baby and same time avoid hyperoxia because we already discussed what are the, uh, the disadvantage of using hyperoxia and then uh, avoid extremes of carbon dioxide. So both are not good. Even hypocapnia has very bad effect on the brain. So please avoid the fluctuations, the extreme hypercarbia or hypocarbia. So by if you use these measures, the, the points what we discussed so far, then uh, we can avoid using this postnatal steroids because it has uh, bad effects on the neurodevelopmental outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something we all do for the babies, that is vitamin K for all newborn babies within first six hours. Uh, after birth. So we usually give at the time of birth. Uh, this is something which will be available in near future in our country as well. That is caffeine that we give for apnea of prematurity. So that study shows that if you use this uh, drug called caffeine in the first 10 days, which reduces the incidence of cerebral palsy and cognitive impairment, which was checked at the 18 to 21 months in a low birth weight baby. So it's a very important drug which is available in intravenous preparation and oral preparation and uh, it will be available in uh, mm -hmm. near future. So it is important to regular screening and uh, uh, for the sepsis and minimize infection. Because preterm babies, they don't have the normal uh, good immunity. They are vulnerable. Anyway, newborns are vulnerable. Preterms are more vulnerable. So you always wash your hands before you enter the NICU, before the procedures, and minimal handling 
you mm -hmm. re retrick the visitors mm -hmm. so i hope you're familiar with these pictures what are the the sites of hands where you can get more contamination when you do, don't do the proper hand washing uh i think those are few areas which we covered on previous lecture so i'm going to skip that but nutrition is very important always encourage exclusive breastfeeding mm -hmm. uh and uh, support for the feeding method i think feeding method also we discuss so i will skip this slide and kangaroo mother care again we discuss so this graph itself says if you give the kangaroo care how stable is the temperature is uh compared to if you not give the kangaroo care so developmental care i think uh this will be discussed in further uh lecture so i'm going to skip this part uh so as a parent also they have a responsibility about their babies so they have a responsibility uh to present during the ward round to get idea and uh, I, uh, what is happening to their baby because we are treating for their baby so that is their right to know what is happening so always they can speak to doctors and nurses to get the update and understand from their level what is the illness and how it is progressing now and familiar with what are the medicine baby is on because some of the medications baby might need to continue uh even after this start for example vitamin and uh, depending on the uh, clinical condition there are some other medication we might need to give so it is important to update parents so it is important uh, if you update it properly regularly then by the time of discharge mm -hmm. then they know what is happening mm -hmm. and they are well prepared for the discharge and uh, always in engage parents in routine care they can Uh, engage in nappy changing so by that they will that is, i think the parents are the most important uh, partners for babies handling not the nurses not the doctors though we do the most duty so always try to engage parents uh, in baby care and understand how to provide how to comfort care and diaper changing clothing and uh, give the milk when possible okay these are the few areas in the hospital you had to be aware that this kind of units are available in the hospital to get the help mother baby unit uh, when the baby is uh, prior to discharge uh, usually we keep the mother and baby together preterm babies or the babies who need uh, uh, prolong in icu care before discharge uh, we keep the baby in those unit and uh, check whether they, they are ready to discharge so the education and the they are anxiety concerns those things can be addressed in these units uh, lactation management center is very important to give the feeding supports and how to give the breast feeding how to give a cup feeding those things will be addressed in lactation management center and kangaroo mother care this is very important concept which we discuss so these things are available in each and every hospital at uh, it might not be in a very large scale at a in each and every hospital but these things are available please utilize them so before discharge ideally you should have a family meeting for parent education so the participant should be the consultant and senior medical officer senior nurse lactation management mm -hmm. nurse you can see the lactation so lactation management ma'am
Rooney, you are muted. Jitma, you are muted. Jitma, you are muted. Okay, uh, okay, so there's one question uh, that is, uh, what is the age cutoff to be used in charge shown previously related to preterm time of birth? E appropriate oxygen saturation percentage. Uh, I don't understand what does it mean. Can you further elaborate your question? And uh, uh, yes. And uh, there's one question regarding the comfort care. Uh, so the comfort care, they are, we are not going to do the active resuscitation, yeah, but you be, keep the baby comfortable. Uh, that depends on the baby's condition as well. So uh, I think uh, that is beyond your level. Usually the NICU people intervene. So if baby's assessment, so the, I already mentioned about the, the resuscitation cutoff ages and weight. And if the baby is beyond that level, so sometimes we might need to take to the baby to the PBU for comfort care. If not, it could be either labor room or theater, depending on the mother's wish. We provide the baby to the mothers for the comfort. We are not actively resuscitating. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, absence of the questions, I will conclude my much for your participation and you will be having your lunch break now. Thank you.
Yes. Is it okay to start? Yeah, madam. Yes. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so there has been a little change in the program, and now for the next half an hour, you all will be listening to the topic respiratory distress in the newborn. Excuse me, madam. Slide share will be enabled. A slide share will be enabled. Yes. Enabled. Okay. Um, Slide share के लिए कोई हरी पिया ना आदर। ओ मैडम शेयर स्क्रीन की नहीं पुलो। ओके। हेलो। हेलो मैडम। आह मैडम के स्क्रीन के लिए शेयर स्क्रीन की तीन में इतनी मैडम ने प्रेजेंटेशन के दौरान मैडम मैड हाय नहीं मैडम हाय आ भी नहीं मैडम तामर ना बॉयस से क्लियर मैडम तामर आ भी नहीं मैं Yes. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so, for the next half an hour, you will be listening to the topic respiratory distress in the newborn. Uh, so, I will tell you the basic uh, uh, basic things that you need to know about respiratory distress in a newborn baby. As all of you know, a newborn baby is a baby. Uh, who is less than one month old. Yeah. Uh, and just uh, to introduce myself, I am a consultant neonatologist working at Sri Jayavadagur Hospital. Yes, so at the end of this lecture, you will get some idea as to what is respiratory distress in a newborn baby. Then how to detect respiratory distress, that is how you would identify a baby as having respiratory distress. And what are the causes that can cause respiratory distress in a newborn baby? You will also learn how you would manage respiratory distress as a uh, doctor just beginning your career. Right? You, are, you Even you are just starting, you should know how to manage the basic things until help comes, until a senior doctor will come and assist you. And 
then I will tell you what are the consequences of neglecting respiratory distress. You won't, you won't neglect respiratory distress if you know it, if you know to identify it. But if you do not know how to identify it, or if you identify, but if you don't take a step to, uh, to manage it, uh, that will cause what will happen. Okay, so what is respiratory distress in a newborn? In very simple terms, respiratory distress in a newborn is some form of difficulty in the uh, of breathing in a baby. Okay, it is some form of difficulty. It doesn't have to be a high respiratory rate all the time. Yes, and where will you see these babies with respiratory distress? You might see them in the labor room. You might identify a baby having uh, breathing difficulty in the labor room. That is the most common place that you might find a baby with a respiratory problem. Then you may see a little baby with the mother in the postnatal ward having some kind of breathing difficulty. You may also see a baby in the pediatric ward having a respiratory difficulty. Maybe the baby has come for something else. Maybe the baby has come for poor feeding or the maybe a baby has been admitted for jaundice, but when you go to the baby, you notice that there is a respiratory distress. So you have to take action. And you might also see a baby with breathing difficulty in the well baby clinic. All of you know that there are well baby clinics run in hospitals where we see the uh, sort of normal babies at one month or six weeks. So the baby will come for a normal checkup, but as the doctor uh, attending to the baby, you will feel that this baby is having some kind of respiratory problem. So you will know now you should not just let that baby go home, but you have to alert a senior doctor. And you might see these babies in the pediatric or the neonatal clinic. Maybe the baby will come because of jaundice or the baby will come with a fever. But when you look at the baby, you know that the baby has a breathing difficulty. And again, if you are working in a what we what you call PBU, special care baby units, the baby is there for something else. Baby will be there uh, admitted because of jaundice, or because the mother is in the ICU, or because uh, the baby has a fever. But when you look at the baby, you identify that the baby has a breathing difficulty. So in all these places, you may identify babies with breathing problems. So now we will see how you diagnose that a baby has a respiratory distress. That means in other words, what are the symptoms and signs of respiratory distress in a newborn baby? The commonest respiratory distress that we see in newborn babies is tachypnea. As you know, uh, newborn babies, the respiratory rate is anyway a little high. And sometimes they have something called periodic breathing where they will breathe a little rapidly, but then they will settle to normal breathing. So in a big person, in an adult, the respiratory rate is around 20, the maximum. Then in a child, it will be about 30. In an infant who is less than one year, it will be about 40, in the upper range, upper limit. But in a little baby, a newborn, we call them to be having tachypnea if the baby's respiratory rate is more than 60. So one feature, one common feature that you see in babies with breathing difficulty or in respiratory distress is the baby having a high respiratory rate. And grunting, another very important feature in a baby with breathing difficulty is grunting. Uh, I hope all of you know what grunting is. Grunting is a kind of a uh, labored noise that you that comes out of your throat when you breathe. Uh, we commonly see it in very elderly people when they are sick, they grunt, like uh, that kind of sound, right? So in babies also, sometimes the baby may not be having a high respiratory rate, but the baby shows a grunt. That is a very important sign to indicate that the baby has a breathing problem. Another sign that you will see, another clinical feature that you see in these babies are recessions. The recessions can be intercostal recessions, then they can be suprasternal recessions, 
and they can be subcostal recessions. Those recessions can be in three places. Uh, I, I'm sure all of you know what recessions are. You would have seen in small babies, right? Then another very important sign in respiratory distress is gasping type of respiration. All of you know, gasping come towards very last stages of respiratory distress. The gasping is what we mean by gasping is a very labored, a really difficult breathing. If you just allow gasping to go on and on, they will uh, stop breathing. So gasping respirations are uh, very difficult breathing attempts, which you all, uh, all of you would have seen in adult wards. Then the patients are, you know, near death, they gasp, like they, they breathe with so, so much of difficulty. So something like that, you can also see in babies, which is generally a quite, quite a late sign. Then you can see apnea, right? Apnea, that is complete cessation of breathing is also a, a sign of respiratory difficulty. So initially what will happen is the baby will be apneic. Then after about a few seconds, maybe half a minute, he will start breathing again. Then again, he will become apneic. So if you allow it to go on and on, they will stop breathing forever. You know, apneic attacks will... Uh, build up for a total apnea if you just neglect. And another common thing which is associated with breathing difficulties is cyanosis. As you know, cyanosis can be there in heart disease. Likewise, it can also appear in respiratory difficulties. Right? You, all of you know why cyanosis comes up when the cyanosis become manifest when the deoxygenated hemoglobin in the circulation exceeds a certain level. Yes, this is just a picture to just recap what I have told. It can be tachypnea, it can be cyanosis, it can be nasal flaring, it can be grunting, it can be apnea, it can be recessions. So in all these signs are signs of breathing difficulty, respiratory distress in a baby. Yeah, this is just for you to see some pictures of cyanosis. The first picture shows, uh, uh, because in dark skin babies, usually we are dark skin people. So in the dark skin uh, ethnic groups, cyanosis is not that prominent like in the fairer group of children, because uh, babies are also slightly on the dark side and their lips are also not bright pink. So. The, a nice area to pick cyanosis is most of the time we see cyanosis around the lips. In this first picture, you see this slightly gray ash color around the lips. That is a, a telltale sign of cyanosis. Now, if you really look at the lips per se, they don't appear dark, right? But around the mouth, you can see a very uh, ash-like tinge, which is indicative of cyanosis. Second picture, you can see that baby, of course, the lips are a little cyanose. It's not pink or red. It's like uh, slightly purplish. Again, the third picture also, you can see uh, the, this is how sometimes in baby cyanosis looks in the tongue and the uh, lips. Rather than blue, it looks quite purplish. And even in this baby, you will see uh, the slight perioral uh, cyanosis. Uh, and the other, the fourth picture shows you cyanosis in the hand. Now, usually central cyanosis is very, very significant. Now, what we call central cyanosis is central cyanosis, which we see around the mouth, in, in the lips, etc. Now, in the hands, sometimes when the babies are cold, when the weather is cold, you see a tinge of bluish discoloration in the hands and feet of babies. If you bath them, when, when you give them a bath, or during early morning or late night when the atmosphere is cool, you, you, you might see this slight tinge of blue. But if you warm the baby, for example, if you put mittens or socks, or if you keep the surroundings dry, that will resolve. But if it is due to a respiratory problem or a cardiac problem, it will not resolve. So sometimes uh, hypothermia, causes a little bluish color which might get mixed up with cyanosis. So if you are confused, what you can do is you can just uh, uh, 
uh, warm that area and see or you can additionally it will prompt you to look at the mouth and the uh, perioral area then you we can confirm the synopsis again this picture i am showing you uh, to show mainly the subcostal recessions it's not a it's not a mobile it's a still picture but you can very clearly see in the baby just above the umbilicus the v-shaped area which is due to subcostal recession and the same baby you can see towards the uh, right arm near the right arm the intercostal recessions they have taken the picture at that moment and again in this baby you can see look at the peri perioral area it's bluish and here in the lips are it's kind of purplish or bluish so that is cyanosis yes now we uh, i have told you the features of uh, signs and symptoms of respiratory distress now uh, we will see what are the causes of respiratory distress in newborns uh, the commonest reason for respiratory distress in newborn babies is prematurity where they have surfactant deficiency lung disease all of you know what surfactant is and in preterm babies they are lacking in surfactant so they get surfactant deficiency lung disease you can also call it neonatal respiratory distress syndrome then some people call it those days we used to call it hyaline membrane disease and some people call it idiopathic respiratory distress syndrome all are the same so it is one of the commonest causes of respiratory distress in the newborn the baby with tachypnea there will be subcostal intercostal uh, and sometimes uh, suprasternal recessions there will be cyanosis there will be grunting so all those features will be there then another a uh, group of babies who has respiratory distress are babies with meconium aspiration syndrome all of you know uh, what happens in meconium aspiration syndrome the baby uh, is surrounded by meconium and the baby is hypoxic as well most of the time and the baby takes deep breaths and draws meconium into the lungs which causes severe respiratory distress in the baby then the other group is congenital pneumonia some babies during delivery around the time of the delivery contract a bacterial pneumonia from the mother because the mother's vaginal tract has bacteria they are commensals for the mother but they are dangerous for the baby uh, mostly it is streptococcus and this streptococcus bacteria can enter into the baby's uh, respiratory tract and cause a congenital pneumonia so these babies will also have uh, increased respiratory rate tachypnea cyanosis all the things that we the, all the features of respiratory distress then another group of babies who will show respiratory distress is congenital babies with congenital heart defects right so because they have congenital heart defects they find it difficult to there is either mixing of blood or their cardiac output is not good so as a result they will uh, need to breathe faster to deliver the amount of oxygen needed for the tissue so they will also present with respiratory distress then septicemia the septicemia in septicemia why do we why do they get respiratory distress what happens in septicemia is uh, when there septicemia affect in the organs of the baby it will lead to a metabolic acidosis so when there is a metabolic acidosis the blood ph drops and to correct this the baby has to breathe faster and faster to get the ph back to normal that is he has to wash out carbon dioxide and cause try to cause a alkalosis which will balance that ph so in septicemia the babies get metabolic acidosis to overcome that metabolic acidosis the baby breathes and then what we see is uh, maybe a sick baby but the baby has respiratory distress and baby is tachypnea there are some other causes of respiratory distress they are uh, birth asphyxia or what we call perinatal asphyxia a baby uh, can be hypoxic due to various reasons inside the utero or at the time of delivery 
So when these babies are hypoxic again, they become acidotic, and uh, the the perfusion to the lungs and the perfusion to the heart is also compromised. So they can present with the respiratory distress. Then certain babies with inborn errors of metabolism. When there is inborn errors of metabolism, again they are very acidotic. They go into a metabolic acidosis due to accumulation of the byproducts. They go into a metabolic acidosis, and to compensate, the baby starts breathing rapidly to wash out carbon dioxide and to correct that pH. Then congenital myopathies. When there is a congenital myopathy, what happens is baby is fine, the lungs are fine, but the respiratory muscles are not working properly because the muscles are diseased. And when the respiratory muscles are not working properly, what happens? Their respirations become shallow. I mean, they can't use their muscles. Their muscles can't support well to for the uh, lungs to get inflated. So they get shallow breathing. And when the breathing is shallow, to compensate for that, the rate has to obviously go up. If the breathing is shallow, you have to breathe at a more rapid rate to get the same work done. And the other group is congenital neuropathies. Here the lungs are normal, the muscles are normal, but the muscles will not work because the nerve supply is not quite good. Therefore, again, the same problem as in myopathies, their breathing is not that uh, the intercostal muscles are not working properly. So they will use their diaphragm and the abdominal muscles more and more, and they will have difficulty in breathing because then you will see a lot of uh, abdominal breathing, lot of subcostal recessions, right? When the baby tries to breathe, the chest won't expand, but the, so the diaphragm will push down and the, and the tummy will blow up. So you will see what is called seesaw kind of breathing and that also indicates respiratory difficulty. Yes, if you go through less rare causes, but which are very, very important, there are certain surgical conditions which can cause respiratory distress in the baby. Uh, one common thing is tracheoesophageal fistula. Sorry, one common thing is the commonest out of the surgical conditions is congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which is a congenital condition where the uh, diaphragm, there is, a, there is an orifice in the diaphragm, which doesn't, which is supposed to close at towards time of delivery, but it does not close. So through that orifice, the uh, uh, abdominal viscera get into the lungs and uh, the lung can't grow on that side and there is no space for the lung to breathe so the baby is in severe distress. Like that in coanal atresia where we are doing the coanal, coanal atresia the baby will find it difficult to uh, breathe from the nose so the baby will have to open the mouth and breathe through the mouth and whenever the baby cries baby uh, whenever the baby cries, baby is pink because he opens the mouth. But when the baby is not crying, he is cyanosed. The tracheoesophageal fistula is also something similar where there is a uh, where there is a fistula between the trachea and the esophagus, and the uh, food and uh, everything can spill into the trachea, causing pneumonia and respiratory distress. Then there are certain congenital lung conditions like pneumothorax. It, pneumothorax can happen uh, at delivery. Sometimes it can ha uh, happen after delivery. Uh, during resuscitation, it can happen where the, uh, the pleural cavity on one side blows up with air and it will collapse the lungs. Then there's another con gentle condition called cystic malformations of the lung where the lung has not alveoli partly or in multiple areas, large cysts which does not work properly as alveolus. They are like balloons, which just balloons and sometimes they rupture and they do not do the work of the lung. Therefore, the functional lung tissue is uh, reduced and that little amount of lung tissue, which is working normally, has to work more. Obviously, then you will see a respiratory distress. Yes, these are some x-rays, which uh, just to show you, how uh, this is an x-ray of a baby with uh, surfactant deficiency lung disease. If you can appreciate it, you will see like uh, 
so we call this ground glass appearance you see very very spotty tiny like you know it's like uh, sand ground glass appearance of the x ray this is classical of surfactant deficiency lung disease so this is surfactant deficiency lung disease then you get yeah surfactant deficiency lung disease Uh, a few things about surfactant deficiency lung disease. It's it happens in preterm babies who are less than thirty six weeks. It starts usually surfactant lung disease. The symptoms start very early, within four hours. They need admission. They definitely need admission to the special care bed care unit or NICU, and they need respiratory support. So it's uh, these are the basic things about surfactant deficiency lung disease. and they can be treated with surfactant you know surfactant can be given through the, through a et tube into the lungs and then the generally with other support the baby will improve now again this is a baby there is a x ray of a baby with meconium aspiration syndrome it is different to nrds x ray you can see you can appreciate this honeycomb appearance it is small Uh, small small areas multiple layers of air trapped inside the lungs because meconium acts as plugs and it gives this ball valve effect where you you can inhale you can in, inspiration is happens but you can't expirate the air and it get blocked inside the lungs because the meconium plugs are blocking the small uh, uh, bronchioles so you get this uh, uh, you get this soapy appearance or like you get this uh, honeycomb appearance we call it honeycomb appearance where there are there is trapped gas inside the alveoli so meconium aspiration syndrome usually occurs in term and post term babies because you uh, very pre term babies do not produce meconium so the baby is usually more than 35 36 weeks of a, a poa and it is very very commonly associated with birth taxisia so much so that they say if there is meconium aspiration that baby at some stage has has had some degree of uh, intrauterine or perinatal asphyxia that also occurs within 4 hours of birth that also occurs just like hyaline membrane disease because it happens already by the baby by the time the baby is born meconium aspiration has occurred so symptoms start quite quite early and definitely this baby needs admission to the special care baby unit and that baby also needs and this is x ray for you to see what congenital diaphragmatic hernia here you see um, on your left hand side the whole of the small intestine has seeped into the lungs and it's occupying the whole of the uh, left side of the lung so there is hardly any lung in the left the heart has been pushed towards the right so the right lung also can't work because there's a heart block in that side and the baby is in severe respiratory distress an interesting thing is these babies with the congenital diaphragmatic hernia they are very very severely distressed they are in severe respiratory difficulty at the time of birth and you will get the feeling the stomach is quite uh, scaphoid the stomach is very empty looking the stomach in the sense the abdomen is very empty that is because there is hardly any abdominal viscera in the abdomen uh, now actually in this baby the stomach is still inside the abdomen but most of the time the stomach also goes up and the abdomen is very very scaphoid so this is a medical emergency if you do not diagnose in where real the baby is uh, going to die so usually we suspect with this uh, in a baby who is uh, not having meconium who is not preterm but the baby uh, becomes very dyspneic soon after birth and we see the abdomen is very very flat small babies the abdomen is generally a little full so this baby abdomen is scaphoid and you have to quickly think of diaphragmatic hernia sometimes is antenatal diagnosis in antenatal scan they diagnose diaphragmatic hernia and a very important thing that you should keep in mind is if you know it is congenital diaphragmatic hernia or if you suspect congenital diaphragmatic hernia we should not 
give bag and mask ventilation to the baby. You have to put the ET tube directly into the baby. You can see the, in this picture, you can see the ET tube, endotracheal tube uh, uh, through, the, through the trachea. You can see the tube uh, just uh, extending just below the sternal angle. And why we should not give bag and mask ventilation with the face mask is the more ventilation that we, more puffs we give, more we will dilate the stomach and the intestines with air. And it will block the uh, expansion of the lungs further and further. It will increase the pressure in the lungs more and more because the viscera is in the thoracic cavity. And, and on top of that, we are inflating the viscera with gas we are giving by the face mask. So if you know, if it is antenatal diagnosis, or if, they, if you think that the baby is having diaphragmatic hernia, you intubate stent without giving mask ventilation. Yeah, this is an x-ray to show you a pneumothorax. This is a baby with a um, uh, kind of a tension pneumothorax. And you can see to drain the pneumothorax, somebody has put a uh, tube. And you see the lung collapse. So the pneumothorax is on the right side. The right lung is collapsed. And you can see this dark area where there is air. So when there is air, the x-ray will show, show it as very black area. So you see the collapsed right lung, air in the pleural cavity, heart being pushed to the left side. And again, the baby will be in severe, severe distress. So... As a young house officer, you are as you are just starting work, how would you manage the baby with respiratory distance, which is very important because uh, you may not know a lot, but you should know the basic things that you can do, this, do to save this child until help arrives. So how would you manage? If you see a baby has respiratory distress, whatever the cause, invariably that baby has to be admitted to the special care baby, special care baby unit. And another thing that you can do is if the baby is in respiratory distress and if, they, if you see cyanosis, that means the baby obviously needs oxygen. These are things as a young medical officer, as a person, as a doctor who's just starting work, you can do these things. These are not difficult things. So you can give oxygen. Or you can tell a nurse that the baby needs oxygen, or you can tell a colleague, right? You can write in the note immediately with this baby to baby unit. Then arrange respiratory support. A baby having respiratory distress will need respiratory support. It can be a CPAP, it can be a ventilator. So you do not, as you begin your work, you do not know how to operate a CPAP, you do not know how to operate a ventilator, but you can say this baby might need ventilator, CPAP support, the other people will get it early with it because all the nurses in special care baby units and ICUs, they know to set up a ventilator, they know to connect a CPAP to the baby, all you have to do is to tell. And always inform a senior colleague, don't try to handle things on your own uh, beyond a certain amount, you do the little things you do and that you have to realize that will not settle the baby, you do that but inform about the problem to a senior colleague. And it is very important, uh, this, uh, what is called holistic management. So all these babies, when you, if you see the babies in distress, you don't attend to the distress itself. You have to do, give the general care to the baby. You have to maintain the baby's temperature. If the baby is cold, you have to put into the incubator. He has to, you have to maintain his hydration. You have to maintain his sugar and electrolytes. So a baby in respiratory distress cannot be fed, right? Baby has difficulty in breathing, so he will not be able to suck from the mother. He might not be able to tolerate the feed. So you stop the feeds until the problem is resolved and you can give IV fluids, you can order IV fluids and you quickly arrange a chest x-ray to see what the problem is. Then always inform a senior colleague, I am telling you this, I am repeating because it's important. Then look out for cardiac murmurs. So it may be a cardiac uh, congenital heart disease, which is causing uh, the respiratory distress. So listen to the baby, carefully do examination. You know how to listen to murmurs. See whether there is a murmur. You don't have to diagnose whether it's a VST or ASD, whatever, just listen to a murmur. And there is a, a small machine called pulse oximetry. I'm sure you all know it. Connect the baby to a pulse oximetry and see the oxygen saturation 
which should be above 92, right? And you have to keep in mind the babies can have congenital heart defects, which are very, even very serious ones without murmurs. So just because there is no murmur in a baby who is cyanosed, it doesn't exclude the cardiac problem. You know, like transposition of great vessels, uh, hypoplastic left heart. They don't. You will not. You will not hear a murmur in these babies, but they have very serious heart defects. So, just because there is no murmur, you can't exclude the heart disease. Uh, arrange investigations quickly. So, arrange a chest X-ray, which I told you before. Do a blood culture, send a CRP, send a full blood count. Do an arterial blood gas if you know, or you know, get your help, get help from somebody to do the arterial blood gas, which will give a lot of information, right? Then uh, give antibiotic cover, which is very, very important. Whatever the respiratory distress, we can't at once say whether this is infection or not. So whenever there's a respiratory distress, we start antibiotics after sending cultures. So it may be a heart disease and the baby may not need antibiotics, but we don't know at the beginning. So you can you have to always start antibiotic cover. So yes, now uh, we have come to us then, why is it important to detect and manage respiratory distress early? So the whole purpose of telling you this is how to, how to detect, how to manage, and why you should take action, right? So most of the conditions that, because this is, this is the reason, most of the conditions leading to respiratory distress are treatable. So if you detect it and if you do the initial steps or inform your colleagues, you can treat it. If you detect and take necessary action, you can save the baby. Right? If you delay action, the baby will deteriorate further. For example, you see that the baby is having respiratory distress, you don't know what to do. You decide, I will just pretend I did not see it and just let the other person diagnose. So that's not the way. If you detect it, it's okay. You don't know what to do, but you have detected. So detecting is as important, maybe it's at your level, it's more important than management. So you detect it and you tell it. That you may not be able to do anything, you tell it. So you will avoid the baby getting deteriorated any further. And if you miss it or if you neglect it, the baby will die. So these are the reasons why you should um, you should uh, take action and know about it. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. So I think you got some uh, idea of how to manage
Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, madam, can hear. You can hear. I'm Dr. Dilani Dehigama, consultant neonatologist, teaching hospital Mahamodara. Uh, good afternoon. So during next few minutes, we are going to talk about rapid assessment and management of a sick neonate. So we use mnemonic stops to uh, identify neonates and uh, identify neonates and management of their problems. So we'll go one by one. So the most important thing is to identify a sick neonate from a well neonate. So this STOPS stands for S for sensorium, T for temperature, O for oxygenation, P for perfusion, and S for sugars. We'll discuss one by one how we identify problems when you are assessing a baby. Sensorium. So how do we assess a baby sensorium? There are certain things when, that we can check uh, in a baby. So we need to assess that this baby is active or baby is lethargic. So for that, we can assess how the baby is tone, cry, and how the baby's responsiveness, movements and sucking of the baby. If we have a concern about the baby sensorium, we need to keep on assessing baby hourly until we make a clinical judgment or management. So if we uh, take a well baby, we have uh, revived over a time. And during this period, we had a uh, few times baby was like less active but there are in between baby was very active alert and sucking well so these babies might not have a problem so active baby they have a very good cry they are very responsive their handling tone is very good and their spontaneous movements are very good but compared to the active baby sick babies they have low sensorium throughout our assessment period. So they are very floppy and they have poor response. They don't cry much or they have a very weak cry and they have decreased movement as well. So by assessing a baby, you have to make a decision whether this baby is active or well baby or this baby is lethargic or need further action or management. So if this uh, less activity, lethargy persists more than six hours, definitely we need to evaluate the baby's vitals. There should be a problem. So we have to consider the problems with the ba baby, whether the baby is having a sepsis, necrotizing enterocolitis, or in that. Uh, we have to start the antibiotics and manage accordingly. And the, sometimes the baby might have PD also. The sick baby needs stabilization. Uh, if the baby uh, have underlying problem. So if this uh, lethargy, uh, less activity remains more than 24 hours, it might indicate more severe brain injury, such as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, intracranial hemorrhages, meningitis. So in these babies, we might consider cerebral uh, fluid analysis, imaging, and also electrolytes. So the second uh, uh, parameter is the temperature. How do we assess the temperature? I think we have discussed previously regarding the normal temperature and hypothermia. So the normal temperature of a newborn is 36.5 to 37.5 Celsius. And normal well baby maintain the temperature in between 36.5 to 37.5. And they have very warm hands and feet. But if you do have a concern about the hypothermia, we can use our dosum of, your, of our hands to touch the abdomen and peripherals, and we can confirm the temperature by using axillary temperature. And if the baby is having low temperature, and if the baby uh, hands and feet are cold, that indicates 
that the baby is having a problem and we need to stabilize the baby. So this is how you can touch the baby. Use your dosum of your hand, touch the abdomen or touch the hands and the feet. What we can do, we can check the room temperature which, whether it was set in between 26 to 28 Celsius. We can use a room thermometer. And if the baby's clothes are wet, we can remove the wet clothes and clothe the baby well. For that, we can use caps, socks, gloves, and can use two layers of clothes uh, also. And we need to continue review the baby after 15 minutes. If the baby still remains hypothermic, we need to uh, rewarm actively. Two methods that we can use is the radiant warmer. We, as you can see in the picture, we can put the baby under the radiant warmer. And to assess the temperature, we can use the skin probe. The other method is kangaroo mother care. I think you had a lecture on kangaroo mother care. We put the baby on the chest of the mother to increase the temperature of the baby. And again, we have to reassess the baby after 15 minutes. But we have put the baby under the radiant warmer, but baby remains hypothermic despite increasing the heat output. That indicates that there is a serious problem in the baby. So we have increased, increased, and further increased the temperature, but still the baby is hypothermic. So we'll go back to our table again. At 11 p.m. in a well baby, you can see throughout the assessment period, baby's peripheries are all warm and we don't need much uh, heated temperature to maintain the normal temperature of the baby. But compared to the sick, compared to a sick baby, at 11 p.m., this baby was warm and uh, uh, baby need uh, only 25 heat output to maintain the uh, normal temperature. But later on, you can see baby became cold and we had to increase the heat output as well. So even though we have increased the heat output, baby remained hypothermic. So we need to evaluate the perfusion and have to check the underlying cause for the baby. It could be a sepsis. And in that case, you had to start the antibiotics and you do it further for stabilization of the baby. Then we'll move on to the next section, oxygenation. How do we assess whether this baby is having adequate oxygenation or not? For that, we need to assess the respiratory distress of the baby from the previous lecture. I think you had a uh, very good discussion regarding the respiratory distress. So we can assess baby's respiratory rate, grunting, also subcostal and intercostal uh, recessions, flaring of LNASI, and also you can check the saturation of the baby. So if a term, in a term baby, if you maintain more than uh, nine, uh, 95 saturation, that would be okay for a normal neonate baby. So if the baby is having a low saturation, only having respiratory distress, we can supplement oxygen through a head box also. If there is a respiratory distress with low oxygenation level, we can give a, uh, we can start CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. So for this baby need to move to the NICU and it's a small machine that gives a positive airway pressure. This helps to uh, open up the alveoli and for beta oxygenation. Usually we start at pressure of five to six hmm? and in severe respiratory distress, we can increase the uh, pressure and afterwards we need to have an X-ray and assess the lung fields, lung expansion. And if there is a hyperinflation, we can reduce the pressure that we are giving. Then we have to move on to assess the perfusion of the baby. 
we have to uh, check whether the baby is having poor perfusion or normal perfusion. For that, there are several parameters that we can check. Hmm? Uh, we can assess the capillary fill time of the baby, heart rate, urine output, blood pressure monitoring, also activity, and check the peripheries as well. I think you all know how to check the capillary fill time. We can uh, do it on sternum or forehead. In neonate, if it is less than three seconds, that is normal for the uh, baby. We go back to our uh, table again. Uh, so at 11 p.m. and 12 midnight, baby had normal capillary fill time and the heart rate. As you can see, in early hours of the morning, the capillary fill time was increased and again, heart rate also increased. So there's a problem here after about midnight. So, you have to know about the baseline heart rate of the baby. And if there is a rising, a rising heart rate uh, of that neonate, it could be due to hypovolemia or it could be due to fluid overload. Sometimes it could be due to opening of the ductus or sometimes in, uh, intraventricular hemorrhages. If there is a bradycardia, it could be due to apnea, drugs, and sometimes could be due to electrolyte imbalances and acid base imbalances. The other method of assessing the perfusion is the blood pressure, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. It's very important to uh, have the appropriate cuff for the neonate. So in these pictures, you can see there are several sizes. And depending on the size of the baby, you have to choose the correct size. Usually, the length of the uh, bladder of the BP cuff should be about 80% of the mid-arm circumference and the width should be at least 40% of the mid-arm circumference. So it is very important to uh, choose the correct size for the baby. And again, uh, when we are, uh, when we are uh, assessing the blood pressure, you have to consider the age and the gestation of the baby. So if there is a syst uh, increased systolic blood pressure, it could indicate early shock. Hmm? And if there is a reduce in the diastolic blood pressure, it could indicate intermediate shock. Hmm? And if both are reduced, baby is in established shock. So normal blood pressures, usually in term babies, systolic 65 and the diastolic 35, preterm babies around 55 and the diastolic 30. But usually what we know is mean arterial blood pressure is you, the minimum mean, mean arterial blood pressure is usually equal to the gestation of the baby. For an example, if you take a 33 week, the minimum blood pressure, mean art, blood pressure should be 33. So other method of assessing the uh, perfusion is the urine output. Usually in neonates, one to three ml per kg per hour urine output is normal. But in a sick baby, they can have reduced urine output. We'll see how we calculate the urine output. If you go back to our table, at mid 11 p.m., baby had a urine output of 10 ml, and at 3 a.m., baby had 10 ml of urine. So uh, from uh, 12 to 3 a.m., that is for four hours, baby had 10 ml. So per hour, if we uh, divide 10, for, uh, 10 by 4, that is 2.5 ml per hour. So consider that the baby's weight is 2.5 kg. The urine output comes to 1 ml per kg per hour. So usually, we calculate the urine output for ml per kg per hour. We go back to our chart again. In uh, midnight, baby is quite okay, had normal capillary refill time, heart rate, and later on, capillary refill, refill time was increased and heart rate comparatively increased. And at 3 a.m., baby had 10 ml of urine. Because of this poor perfusion, we decided to give a normal saline uh, bolus. 
So the bolus is normal saline, 10 mm per kg, we are giving over 30 minutes. And again, we assess the baby, then you can see the capillary refill time, again, two seconds and heart rate also reduced and baby had a good urine output at 6A. And if the baby remains high, uh, remain to have poor perfusion, then we can add iron tropes. Again, we have to reassess the baby after 30 minutes and we can go up with iron tropes. And we, at the same time, we can do a blood gas if there is acidosis, uh, we can correct with sodium bicarbonate. And the idea is to bring the no normal perfusion back in the baby uh, when you're stabilizing. The other um, thing is blood sugar. I think we have discussed previously regarding the hypoglycemia. In a sick newborn, you need to check the blood sugar, uh, capillary or venous blood sugar. So blood sugar above 2.7 millimoles per liter is normal. If the baby is hypoglycemic in a well baby who is active, we feed the baby first and we can do a repeat check. But if the baby is symptomatic or baby is in a risk group, we can start IV fluids. And also uh, the other thing apart from the uh, what we have discussed, we can assess the jaundice uh, level of the baby. So jaundice is the yellowish discoloration. It can be, uh, uh, we can divide into early onset or uh, sometimes you can see the jaundice after first day. So early onset jaundice most probably it's due to hemolytic cause usually starts uh, onset is on uh, due to the first 24 hours. And for the neonatal jaundice, we usually give phototherapy. So even uh, in early onset of jaundice, even on under the phototherapy, baby might have rising uh, bilirubin level. And also you can assess the uh, neonate regarding the weight loss as well. So, if the baby's jaundice, we can assess baby's weight. Usually babies uh, lose their weight during the first few days. Again, regain the birth weight uh, at usually around day 10. So weight loss more than 10% is significant in a baby. We can ask from the mother about the urine output and, and the stool frequency as well. So if we think that the baby is having neonatal dehydration, babies are at a risk of having hypernatremia. Uh, we can do a uh, serum erythrite to check the sodium level of the baby. So uh, we have discussed all the uh, things that we need to assess in a sick baby to identify the uh, underlying problems. So the mnemonic key stops. So uh, identification and stabilization of a neonate is important. Oh, Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> so in summary, what are the worrying problems? So continuing to have, well, continue to be lethargy more than four to six, hours. four to six hours. And also hypothermia and need for high oxygen concentration to maintain the normal saturation of the baby, poor perfusion, and hypoglycemia, also hyperglycemia, and jaundice. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Can you hear me? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yeah, I have finished. Thank yeah, thank you, madam. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes, madam. Right. And the screen is shared, right? Yes, madam. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, within the next uh, half an hour, I'll be talking about breastfeeding. Um, how to ensure a good start. So as you know, breast milk is the best milk for the baby. Even though the Sri Lanka has a very good breastfeeding rate, that's about more than 97% babies are fed with breast milk uh, at birth. This rate actually gradually comes down. Over a period of uh, one month, it comes to uh, 85%. And at the end of six months, it has dropped to 60%. So what could be the reason for this? Actually, most of our mothers, they are quite knowledgeable on the importance of giving breast milk. But the main problem uh, is uh, they are still lacking adequate help to manage subsequent problems. Uh, so they are naturally go to other avenues like uh, non-human milk. Most unfortunate thing is actually they do this with the advice of the healthcare workers. So this is why as a medical professional, you need to know uh, have, you need to have a, a, a sound knowledge to give the best advice to the mothers seeking care regarding breastfeeding problems. The current policies in Sri Lanka is to give exclusive breastfeeding for the first, first six months of life. But as uh, mean by uh, exclusive breastfeeding, 
and infants consumption of human milk with no supplementation of any type for uh, for six months means no water no juice no non human milk and no food except for vitamins minerals and medications at this uh, breastfeeding has to be continued together with complementary feeding which is started at 6 months of age up to the year, year, age of uh, 2 years and beyond so when we start uh, uh, when we want to start uh, give a good start uh, it should start from the antenatal period so antenatal counseling uh, is very important. We have to inform all the pregnant women as well as the family members about the benefits and management of breastfeeding uh, uh, even before uh, giving that birth to that child. Then the early initiation of breastfeeding, preferably within first hour after birth, has to be done. And after that, there should be a continuous support throughout the period of breastfeeding. So as healthcare professionals, we have an important role in helping mothers to establish good breastfeeding practices. Why breastfeeding is important? It's important to the baby, the mother, and to the family uh, as well. So what are the important for the baby? So breast milk gives the ideal composition, both biochemically and nutritionally. And it has immunoglobulins, so it protects the, uh, them from infections. Things like diarrhea or otitis media, UTI can be prevented if uh, babies are exclusively fed on breast milk. And it, it has components to optimize the neural development. So when you compare the babies fed with breast milk from the uh, babies uh, fed with formula fed, uh, formula milk, uh, the breastfed babies have a better IQ. And also it protects of the chronic diseases like diabetes, childhood cancers, obesity, inflammatory bowel diseases, asthma, and allergies. And especially in preterm, the breast milk reduces the risk of sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis. So what are the importance for the mother? It reduces the risk of hypercholesteremia, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular diseases in the mother. Uh, and also it reduces the breast and ovarian cancers. Osteoporosis is reduced. And uh, breastfed, uh, when the mother feed, uh, give breast milk to their uh, baby, uh, they rapidly return to the pre-pregnant weight. The lactation amenorrhea. Uh, acts as a contraception, partial, and also it uh, minimizes uh, PP, H postpartum hemorrhage as well. The good things are for the family is it improves bonding with the baby, no cost, it is very convenient, and it is fresh. So there are a lot of advantages of giving breastfeeding. So it's important to know about the basics uh, if you want to uh, uh, get the uh, get a sound knowledge. So let's look at the anatomy of the breast. So uh, the, the breast is uh, uh, composed of alveoli. So the alveoli are the main uh, component that secrete milk. There are billions of alveoli in a breast, a female breast, so, and. It, is uh, the alveolar line by a glandular epithelium, uh, uh, which secrete the milk into the lumen. And this action is uh, stimulated by prolactin from the pituitary. These alveolar epithelial cells are lined by a myoepithelial cells surrounding myoepithelial cells. With the action of oxytocin, when it contracts, whatever the milk that is in the lumen of the alveoli would flow towards the duct and then to the uh, baby. So this is uh, the marketed cells uh, will be stimulated by uh, oxytocin, right? So these ducts are open into a, a structure called lactiferous sinuses, which is just beneath the areola. So once the baby sucks 
the stored milk in the lactiferous cytosis would eject and go to the baby's mouth. Right? So there are monoclonal glands which secretes uh, sebum uh, as a lubricant to the areola. And the other important thing is the, it's lying by, uh, it's uh, embedded in connective tissue and fat. And this is the connective tissue and the fat that gives the shape and size of the base, not the uh, number of alveoli. The number of alveoli in uh, each and every woman would be more or less the same. So, which means they all can uh, produce same amount of milk, irrespective of the size or shape of the breast. Little bit of physiology uh, uh, of lactation. There are two hormones that are acting uh, on lactation. Uh, one thing is prolactin, which helps in production of milk, and oxytocin causes ejection of milk. The other important thing is in the baby, the reflexes in the baby, protein reflex, sucking reflex, and saloid reflexes are involved in uh, lactation. Okay, let's look at the prolactin reflexes. So when uh, uh, the baby starts sucking, the stimulant, the sensory impulses from the nipples would go to the pituitary, uh, giving signal to secrete prolactin. So when the prolactin level in the blood increases, it secretes milk from the glandular epithelial cells. So uh, which means the prolactin would produce milk for the next week. There are certain enhancing factors for the prolactin secretion. Uh, early initiation of breastfeed, good attachment and effective suckling, then uh, frequent feeds, especially uh, the night feeds, because more prolactin is secreted at night. And also the regular emptying of the breast, uh, breast also uh, uh, is stimu uh, uh, stimulates the prolactin reflex. Moving on to the oxytocin reflex, again, the main stimulus is the baby's suckling movement. So it gives impulse to the pituitary, causing ox uh, oxytocin secretion. And what oxytocin does is, as I told you before, it contracts the myoepithelial cells, thereby cause the milk ejection. So the oxytocin that is secreted during the, uh, the process of uh, feeding would act on the same feed. There are helping and hindering factors for oxytocin reflex too. The helping uh, reflexor, the, the stimulants are uh, if the mother thinks lovely about the baby, the sounds of the baby, if you see the baby, touches the baby, and also the mother's confidence. They all are stimulatory factors for oxytocin production. And the hindering uh, factors are any worries, stressors, pain, and if they have a doubt about the ability of breastfeeding, they, that will hinder the oxytocin reflex. So that is why when the mothers are in stress, uh, they or, or often they say they have not enough milk. That is not because that they can't secrete milk. That is because the ejection, uh, the ejection is not happening. So the milk secretion looks like less. And there are certain inhibitors uh, which is present uh, in the breast milk itself, uh, causing, uh, 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 causing inhibition at the secretion level. And so what happens is if the uh, breast remains full, there's stagnation of these inhibitors causing this secretion uh, of milk. Moving on to the reflexes of the baby, uh, the routine reflex. What do you mean by routine reflex? When something touches the lips of the baby, baby would just open the mouth and put the tongue down and forward. Right? Then uh, sucking reflex means when something touches the palate, baby would suck it. Solid reflex is when the mouth is filled with something, baby would swallow it. So if baby get the nipple, he would open the mouth, then if it touches the palate, would suck it, and then if something comes or milk comes, he would swallow it. Right? 
So this is uh, the skill is actually mother has to learn to position the baby to uh, give the breast to the uh, mouth and baby has to learn to take the breast. So when you want to establish breastfeeding, uh, there are certain things that we have to do. As I mentioned before, the within one hour after birth, we have to feed the give the first feed of the baby. Then there should be continuous support during hospital stay. Before discharge, you have to always check whether the feeding is adequate or not. Uh, and you have to address the feeding problems as well. And at the discharge, uh, you have to uh, uh, continue the support. Uh, you, if you, on discharge, if you think the baby is not uh, really getting, uh, there are breastfeeding problems, you have to uh, definitely review them uh, in the hospital or you can refer to the relevant places. Okay, so how can we help mothers to initiate breastfeeding within one hour? As you all know, uh, the concept is to deliver the baby onto the mother's abdomen. So after drying and wrapping the baby and now doing the initial evaluation, uh, it's always recommended to keep the uh, baby on the uh, chest of the mother, uh, skin to skin contact. This has to be uh, done at least until the first feed, feed is over, right? Uh, by doing this, we can establish the breast crawl, which I described later. And always remember to then uh, uh, what is meant by the breast crawl? What is meant by the breast crawl? So if you look uh, in this picture, you can see. Um, initially, actually, and soon after the birth, baby would take a, a rest for some time. When he needs a feed, he would sort of open the eyes and will look around and start to move. So this shows the readiness to the feed. So after that, baby would open the mouth and for the scent of the uh, breast milk, uh, baby would uh, search and, or drag towards the nipple to get the milk. And once he get the nipple, he would attach that. So this process would occur spontaneously, naturally. All what we have to do is, when the baby shows the readiness for feeding, we have to help the uh, keep the baby uh, in such a way that he can uh, reach to the breast. And also, when he opens the mouth, we can help to attach the baby to the breast. Remember, cholesterol the, the baby is getting at this moment is very important. So what can we do to support breastfeeding during the hospital? The one important thing is grooming it. What do you mean by grooming it? You have the, to allow the mothers and infants to remain together 24 hours a day. So baby has to be kept by the side of the uh, mother's bed rather than keeping separately. Because then only both mother and baby can uh, uh, recognize or identify each other. And mother would know uh, the, whether the baby is ready to have a feed. All the emotions can be seen by the mother, so better understanding will be there if you do rooming in. If the bed is sufficient enough, even mother can keep the baby uh, in the same bed. Then, then you call it bedding. 
So you have to always encourage breastfeeding on demand. How do you know a baby is having a baby uh, needs a feed? There are feeding cues for that, right? As you can see in this picture, there are early cues, mid cues, and late cues. So what are the early cues? They will be stirring. They have. They will open the mouth or turning the head from side to side and start to see or root. So those are the early cues and all the mothers should uh, uh, be able to understand the, the, or recognize the early cues and this because this is the ideal time to offer the feed. So the mid cues are things like stretching or would sort of have increased physical movement and taking the hand to mouth are the mid cues. So the late cues are crying, uh, agitation or uh, uh, they will sort of become very red or pink, means they are really, really annoyed. So late cues are not the type to give a feed because they won't take the uh, breast if they are really annoyed. So try as much as possible to give the feed at least during the mid cue time. So if baby start to cry, there's no point of giving milk, offering milk at that time. You have to first console the baby by giving a cuddle skin to skin contact, kangaroo mother care, or you can talk to the child or give a gentle stroke to the child to console the baby uh, before giving the best feed. Then the other important thing that you should know is how to position the baby. Mother can have various positions. She can uh, sit on the chair to give the feet, or she can lie down, or even standing up position, posture, she can give the feet. But there are certain key points for the good positioning in the baby. What are these? Baby's head and body should be in one straight line. And whole body should turn towards the mother. Then baby's face has to be opposite the nipple and breast and baby's nose opposite the mother's nipple. Remember, it's not the baby's mouth that has to be uh, opposite the mother's nipple, that has to be the baby's nose. Then only you can attach the baby well. Baby has to be uh, held close to the mother and also the whole body should be supported. Not only the head and shoulders, the whole body should be supported as you can see in this picture. So this, uh, the, the whole thing uh, with the opposite hand, like in this picture is called the uh, cross cradle posture. There are other way, ways that uh, mother can hold the baby. Uh, the first picture shows the cradle position and the second picture shows uh, what you call football position or underarm position. This underarm position is helpful, especially if the mother is having uh, flat nipples or small breasts. Uh, the underarm position will be better for the baby for the good attachment. So there's no hard and fast rule. This is the way you should hold the baby. For the twins also, underarm position will be better because mother can feed both twins together, like in this picture. And if the mother is really tired or maybe after the cesarean section, she may not be able to uh, uh, sit up as such. So even with the sleeping position, she can need the feed. But important thing is, with whatever the position in the mother, baby has to have um, the all uh, the required uh, criteria for the best positioning. Keeping the baby straight, turn towards the mother, keeping the face opposite the breast, keeping the nose opposite the nipple and giving the full support to the whole body. So after positioning, we have to help the mother to attach the baby because if the baby doesn't attach well, uh, uh, there won't be a good breast milk supply for feeding. So what are the key points for good attachment? Baby's mouth should be wide open. Baby's chin should touch the breast, like in this picture. The lower limb has to be inverted. And usually, uh, the larger portion of the areola below the nipple should go into the 
baby's mouth. The signs of good attachment are, uh, there are four signs of good attachment. If you look at this picture, you can see, I think you can see the difference. Uh, let's concentrate on the first two pictures. The first one is an uh, example for good attachment, right? So all the things that we mentioned, the mouth is widely open, then the chin touches the breast, uh, and uh, most of the uh, areola below the nipple is inside the, uh, the child's mouth, right? So this is an example for good attachment. And the second picture you can uh, notice uh, most of the areola is outside the nipple. The tongue doesn't touch the, uh, the breast and mouth also is not widely open and the lower lip is inverted. Right? So these are the signs of uh, wrong attachment. So this is the same picture of the baby and the mother uh, showing the, uh, the, glandular, the glandular structure of the breast. As you can see, when the baby is attached well, right, all the lactiferous sinuses are situated in the inside the mother, uh, inside the mouth. And also the nipple touches the palate, then baby can have the uh, sucking reflex and the milk ejection will be there. In this picture, when the poor attachment is there, you can see obviously all the lactiferous sinuses are outside the mother, uh, the baby's mouth. So after the good positioning and attachment, baby would suck. How do you know the suckling is effective? Generally, uh, how, how, uh, how the baby sucks is he would take several slow, deep sucks followed by swallowing and then having a pause. So the, most of the mothers think this pause means that baby doesn't want a meal. This is about a few minutes. So you should not disturb the child during this period, this is a kind of a natural phenomena. So after the uh, good sucking and swallowing, he would just pause and rest for some time, and he would again uh, start to uh, suck the breast. So uh, then you can see the baby taking slow deep sucks, and sometimes you may be able to hear the baby swallowing as well. After a good feed, baby is relaxed, happy, and satisfied at the end of the feed. And at the end of the feed, mother also would not feel any pain in the breast. So if these things are there, uh, we can assure that baby is having, uh, baby is getting enough milk. In case if the baby has to be separated from the mother, uh, it is important to uh, express the milk regularly. Uh, even though we are not giving milk to the baby, it is important to express that to uh, maintain the regular supply of milk. So you have to show all the mothers how to breastfeed, how to maintain lactation, even if they are separated from the mother. So this picture shows how to uh, express the milk. Uh, it can be done manually or there are breast pumps available that also can be used to take the express breast milk. And uh, if the baby is sick, we may have to give it like a, a express breast milk uh, through a cup or uh, even spoon feed. And remember, uh, you should not uh, advise the mother to use the tea because the sucking of the teeth and the nipple is quite different. So they will get kind of a nipple confusion. Therefore, uh, not to allow the mother to give the teeth to the baby. Uh, whatever the EBM should be given, either through the cup or through the spoon. Not only the uh, babies who are separated from the mothers, I think all the mothers should know how to express milk and how to cup feed because uh, they will, uh, eventually they will get certain instances where they have sort of been, uh, separate from the baby for a short period of time. Maybe to go to the shop or go to the school of the other baby or whatever. So during that period, uh, if mother can 
express milk and keep the milk at home, somebody at home can give the cup feeding rather than going for uh, formula milk. So all the mothers uh, should be taught how to express milk and how to give the cup feed or spoon feed. So how do we ensure adequacy of breastfeeding? Generally, uh, uh, after a good feed, uh, baby would sleep for two to three hours. And uh, the, he would pass urine six to eight times per day. And daily weight gain is about 10 to 15 uh, grams per kg. And at uh, uh, by two weeks, JJ should uh, exceed the birth weight. So if these uh, signs are there, you can ensure the breastfeeding is adequate. So briefly, what are the problems they can get during breastfeeding? The mother can get problems like breast engorgement. If the, uh, if the uh, positioning is, uh, the attachment is not good, then if the sucking process is not good, the uh, breast will be engorged. Then they can have blocked up. How can they get the blocked up? Commonly what happens is if the mother uh, holds the breast uh, using the uh, index and middle finger like scissoring, they can block the duct. So if they get the blocked duct, it can lead to uh, abscesses or mastitis, right? Then uh, so or crack nipples can be, uh, they can get so or crack nipples when there's nipple sucking. And also if the baby is having fungal infection, that is oral thrush, uh, mothers can get crack nipples. The, the other main problem that mothers are having is not enough milk. So as I told you, not enough milk is mainly due to uh, poor positioning, attachment and suction process. Not that mother is unable to secrete milk. Then flat nipples, retracted nipples, so inverted nipples are the other common problem, feeding problems a mother would get. Coming to the baby, what are the problems, uh, best feeding problems that can be there in the baby? Uh, it may be a, a crying baby, excessive crying. Uh, sometimes mother would uh, come and say baby is sleeping on the breast. So what do you mean sleeping on the breast? Generally it happens uh, because they like the comfort of the mother. So in such a situation, if it is really difficult to feed the baby, uh, what you can do is, best thing is to keep the baby in the underarm position so he won't get the real comfort. Uh, if it is a troublesome, uh, that is the advice that you can give. Then refusal to feed. So refusal to feed also uh, uh, very common uh, problem. The causes maybe uh, maybe mother is uh, uh, forcefully trying to give the feed. He's not waiting until the feeding cues are there. So on the, our mothers actually, most of our mothers actually, unfortunately, with the uh, advice of the healthcare uh, workers, they used to give uh, uh, two hourly feed or three hourly food. They are not sort of uh, concentrating on the uh, feeding cues. So when the baby is not ready to feed, he would refuse it, which mother would understand like he doesn't like mother's milk. Then the other problem is because of the uh, in, uh, insufficient feeding, they would have poor weight gain. Working mothers, can they continue breastfeeding? Yes. What they can do is, uh, they can express the milk when, whenever they are having a free time. And this express milk can be stored in the refrigerator. In the room temperature, that, uh, the milk can be kept for about four hours. But at uh, four degrees uh, centigrade uh, temperature, it can be kept for three days. And if you refrigerate it, uh, uh, oh, sorry, freeze it, uh, you can keep even up to six months. Right? So like this, she can sort of, whenever she is having uh, free time, uh, express milk for uh, a number of bottles. Uh, and keep it in the fridge. So when uh, when they are giving the milk to the baby, you have to they have to 
uh, keep it at the room temperature. What you can uh, ask them to do is uh, keep the bottle inside the warm water. Uh, and after th uh, thawing, uh, they can keep the meal up to two hours at room temperature or at up to 24 hours uh, if you keep it in the fridge. But once you thaw it, you should not refreeze it again. So working mothers uh, uh, can be supported in this way. The other important thing that you have to convey to the working mother is even if the, at the working place, she has to regularly empty the best. Otherwise, because of the inhibitors, collection of inhibitors, the best eventually the breast milk supply will be less. Uh, so there should be a continuous emptying of the uh, breast. Okay. So what kind of support that we can offer after the discharge? As you know, there are lactation management centers uh, in all the main hospitals in the country. So you can uh, uh, direct them to the lactation management centers whenever they are having a problem after discharge. In some hospitals, they have the uh, hotline for these uh, lactation management centers, which you can give to the mother on discharge. And there are dedicated lactation nurses, both in the field as hospital as well as in the private sector. So you can uh, give the contact of them uh, to uh, get their problems uh, resolved. And then the public uh, health midwives in the field, they generally uh, are supposed to visit the uh, all the uh, visit to the houses after childbirth um, in regular intervals. So they also can uh, help with the uh, breastfeeding and to address the breastfeeding problems. Okay, so that's come to the end of the lecture. So important message that I want to tell you is, uh, whenever you see a feeding problem in the mother, or you see that the positioning attachment is not put in the mother, uh, in wherever the place, you should be able to identify that and uh, refer them to the uh, relevant places if you are not sure uh, what to do rather than starting on formula milk. Any questions? Uh, there are few questions in the chat box. This letdown reflex is also a sign of adequate breastfeeding. Yes, letdown reflex is a sign of the uh, action of the oxytocin. Uh, what, what do you mean by the letdown let reflex? When mother is feeding from one breast, there would be dribbling of milk from the other breast. That is because of the oxytocin reflex causing uh, contraction of the myopathial cells in the other breast, causing milk ejection. So it is a sign of not adequate breastfeeding, but uh, it's a sign of oxytocin reflex. Uh, two mothers can breastfeed in conditions of mastitis, abscess, and uh, crack nipples. Uh, yes. Uh, mastitis, uh, unless there is a kind of a pus discharge from the nipple uh, or if mother does, uh, is not having really pain, you can continue. Abscesses also the same. Crack nipples, of course, you have to continue breastfeeding. Uh, most of the time, the crack nipples are due to the nipple sucking. So once you correct the, uh, the attachment, uh, they won't get any pain. So, crack nipples, you have to continue, otherwise, there will be engorgement in the breast. How frequently should we breastfeed the child and how we manage afterwards? Well, how frequently is uh, determined by the baby. So, baby would say, I'm now hungry, please give me feed. So, that is that's that. And um, so throughout the period, it's like that. Whenever baby is hungry, if you uh, show the finger, uh, the feeding cues, so then you have to feed the baby. How should we assess overfeeding? Uh, yeah, signs of overfeeding are generally they would have vomiting because their tummy is full, and also there will be excessive 
weight gain. Sorry, I forgot to mention one of the other common problem with the baby uh, breastfeeding problem is vomiting. So vomiting can be either due to overfeeding or the other possibilities if there is not good attachment, uh, there will be uh, air failure. Means with the with the suckling, uh, the air would go in the tummy uh, and there will be accumulation of the uh, uh, air in the stomach causing vomiting. So that is one of the main problems uh, of the baby, breastfeeding problems of the baby. Uh, how will you give express breast milk to preterm initially and afterwards? Well, if the baby is really ill uh, and very preterm, maybe baby is still in the incubator, or maybe on the ventilator. In such a situation, you have to start feeds uh, through an NG tube or OG tube. Uh, start with a small amount, maybe like one cc, and then gradually build it up. Uh, uh, generally, uh, after about 32 weeks of correct fertilization, they are able to swallow. So, in that, uh, at that time, uh, you can offer the cup feeds and the uh, real sucking reflex will be there with the correct fertilization of 35 weeks or more. So, when baby reaches that point, you can allow breastfeeding. Until that, you can give uh, cup feeds, uh, EBM cup feeds uh, as top of feeds. What are the contraindications to breastfeed? There are very, very few contraindications to breastfeed. Uh, uh, if the mother is in uh, chemotherapy, uh, uh, you can't feed the baby. Uh, other than, or oh, other possibilities, uh, HIV infection, if there's a very high viral load, uh, there's a possibility of uh, baby getting the infection. In that case, you have to avoid breastfeeding. Uh, uh, other than that, almost all the other drugs uh, won't affect the baby because the secretion, although there will be secretion from the breast milk, it is very minute. You should not uh, discourage breastfeeding. The other contraindication is if the mother is having a medical problem, maybe like a critical heart disease or whatever, mother is not fit enough to feed the baby. Uh, those are the uh, other contraindications. Uh, what are the indications to start complementary feeding at five months, means before six months, yes. Um, now, it's like this. Now, uh, generally, the whatever the nutri nutrition given by the breast milk is adequate until about six months. But if a mother is having a breastfeeding failure or for whatever the reason, if there is a reduction in the breastfeeding secretion, uh, after about four months, uh, babies may show uh, uh, lagging in the weight gain. So, in such a situation, if the baby is not having any other medical condition, you can uh, start complementary feedings uh, at, uh, after four months of age. Uh, so, that is the uh, only or oh, the other thing is uh, for a working mother. Uh, as I told you, they can sort of continue, but depending on the duration that she is uh, not at home, sometimes uh, she may not be able to uh, uh, give adequate milk for the whole day. In such, such a situation, again, you can start uh, complementary feeds at four months. Uh, some mothers are requesting medication for inadequate breast milk. What is your advice? Well. Yes, uh, the things like metatrophomite is given uh, as a lactococ. But uh, the studies have shown uh, uh, there is no difference between uh, the medication and the placebo. Right? It's just the confidence that mother would get, thinking that uh, she would be, uh, she got something to increase the breast milk secretion. It's just a psychological thing. Otherwise, there is no significant difference between placebo and the so, not to give, uh, uh, no point of giving any medication to increase the breast milk. Then, madam, using a dropper to give express breast milk, is it safe or should we give only using cup or spoon? Well, dropper can be used, especially in the preterm babies. Uh, initially, uh, uh, after the NG feed stage is over, we used to give uh, with a dropper. But problem with the dropper is uh, it gives milk very slowly, right? So if you start to give it to a bigger baby, they won't stay until uh, uh, they would. They would, as they, would, they are hungry, they will start to cry. 
So it's better to give for the bigger babies. It's always better to give the cup or the spoon. If mother is feeling there is no adequate milk production, what are the available non-pharmacological methods to improve milk production? Yeah, uh, you can do things like uh, massaging. You can try your best massaging. There are methods to do back massaging, right? And then uh, nipple massaging. Those things can improve breast milk. Basically, what it does it, uh, it relaxes mother's mind. Uh, therefore, the prolactin secretion will be more and also uh, it stimulates the oxytocin reflex. Thereby, it can increase the milk secretion. Uh, what is the reason for changing consistency of the uh, breast milk? What do you mean by changing consistency? Well, if you take one tree, uh, initially uh, mothers will secrete four milk, which is uh, the uh, which, is, which contains more fluid, the high, the latter part, they secrete high in milk, which is rich in uh, fat. So high, high in milk is the part uh, that is more uh, having more nutritional value. So that is a natural process. The other thing is, I don't know whether you are mentioning like uh, the composition of the mother whose baby is soon after birth is different to the composition of the male in a mother who, who has a baby of one year, right? So that is again the, the milk secretion is a natural process, right? So the, depending on the requirement uh, of the baby, the composition also varies. Uh, what about the HIV positive mothers? So as I told you, HIV positive mothers, if the viral load is very high, uh, you uh, better not to feed the baby, right? So you have sort of. Uh, 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 discuss with the mother and uh, come to agreement whether they are going to feed the baby or not. Sometimes, uh, even though the viral load is more, mothers would say, no, I want to breastfeed. Yes, you can allow, uh, allow that because uh, the disadvantage of uh, uh, not giving breast milk, maybe with the poor economic status where they can't buy formula milk, disadvantage is uh, more than the uh, getting HIV infection, right? But if you are allowed a mother, baby to uh, give breast milk, uh, if the mother is having HIV, the most important thing is uh, you should take all the precautions to avoid crack nipples. Because if there are crack, if the nipple is cracked, there's a high chance of secreting the breast milk. So you have to avoid nipple uh, sucking and crack nipples. Um, can we give formula milk if baby has poor weight gain, even though good breastfeeding? Uh, well, what do you mean by good? If there is adequate breastfeeding, there shouldn't be any other reason why baby should have, shouldn't have have a good weight gain. So in that situation, you have to see whether there are any other con uh, underlying conditions in the baby to, uh, uh, to uh, have a poor weight gain. On the other hand, uh, the, the commonest thing is they, they are, mothers think that they are giving uh, breast milk enough because baby is always sucking, but still baby is having poor weight gain. That is because the attachment is not good. So always baby is sucking from the mother and mother thinks that sucking is effective when baby is getting enough milk. But uh, if the positioning and attachment is not good, baby won't get adequate uh, uh, adequate amount of milk to have a good weight gain, right? So that is the commonest uh, problem. How long should breastfeed uh, at a time? Is it 20 minutes or weight? Well, again, it depends on the baby. That's the requirement of the baby. Some babies are very vigorous. They would take all the milk that they want within a period of 10 minutes. Time. Whereas when they are very uh, sort of uh, slow babies, would even go for uh, 30 minutes, right? But uh, generally, if the breastfeeding goes for more than 30 minutes, that means there is some kind of a uh, feeding problem in the baby, maybe poor attachment. So that is not get, getting uh, a good milk flow, right? 
Uh, then, uh, Madam, the effect of all the vaccine babies, no effect. You can uh, give the COVID vaccine to the uh, breastfeeding mothers. What are the contraindications of breastfeeding? Please tell us examples I told you before. Uh, should the EBM always be given with a cup or spoon? Uh, can EBM be bottle fed even they are, uh, they are few months old? Well, it's like this. At the, why? Uh, The, the uh, bottle feed uh, is okay. The time over, so I think I will have to uh, move on to the other lecture. Okay, so the next lecture is uh, on neonatal jaundice. So neonatal jaundice again is a very common problem. Maybe uh, something just second to the uh, breastfeeding problems. Uh, you will encounter jaundice in the hospital or in the field uh, or in the OPD setup, uh, wherever. It's very common problem. So objectives of this lecture is to give a brief introduction of jaundice, to uh, discuss about bilirubin metabolism, types of jaundice, causes of neonatal jaundice and management of neonatal jaundice. So what is the definition? Jaundice is the yellow discoloration of the skin and sclera caused by deposits of bilirubin. Generally, the jaundice is visible to our eye uh, if it is more than two milligram per deciliter uh, in an adult, or if it is more than five milligram per deciliter uh, in a newborn. So as I told you, it is a very common uh, occurrence. Uh, in 60% of the term infants and 80% of the preterm infants, they can get jaundice. But often it doesn't require any intervention. However, there's a significant minority, that is about, uh, about 6% of them can have significant jaundice for the treatment. And uh, it may signal a serious but potentially treatable illness, which may cause permanent neurological damage, means bilirubin encephalopathy or corniculus. So the purpose of this lecture is actually to uh, stress on the fact, even though it is rare, these are potentially uh, uh, irreversible, can cause irreversible neurological damage if you don't act on time uh, for these babies with jaundice. Okay. Uh, the coming into the bilirubin metabolism, the main precursor for bilirubin is a thin, which uh, generally uh, mo most of most of it is derived from the hemoglobin. When the red cells are lysed, uh, the, the, the hemoglobin will be uh, break down into globin and heme. Uh, so this is the precursor for the uh, bilirubin. And there's a, a minor proportion uh, directly coming from the bone marrow, minor proportion of heme directly coming from the uh, bone marrow. So then the heme in the, in the reticular in the endothelial system, then heme is converted into bilirubin uh, with the uh, help of heme oxygenase enzyme and then to bilirubin with the help of bilirubin reductase enzyme. Then this uh, bilirubin, we call it unconjugated bilirubin, uh, is uh, bound to albumin, it circulates bound to albumin. And then this bilirubin albumin complexer, com the complexes uh, would enter the uh, liver, where in the hepatocytes, uh, with the help of glucuronide transferase enzyme activity, uh, will conjugate into glucuronide. Uh, uh, we call it conjugated bilirubin thereafter. So this conjugated bilirubin is then excreted into the bile, through the bile into the gut. And in the gut, it is uh, converted uh, with the action of the gut bacteria, it is converted to urobilinogen in the intestine. And uh, out of this, you
dulu bila dia macam 80% this excreted uh, uh, so then uh, then uh, the circobilinogen is uh, pass by stool so this is this circobilinogen gives the classical color of the stool uh, the remaining urobilinogen uh, is uh, partly excreted to the kidneys um, uh, then uh, you call urobilinogen in the urine and part of it is uh, recycled into the liver we call this enterohepatic circulation so this is the uh, 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 how the uh, bilirubin metabolism takes place so there are two types of jaundice as i told you unconjugated jaundice which is indirect hypobilirubinemia and conjugated jaundice which is direct hypobilirubinemia unconjugated bilirubin is bind to albumin and it is fat soluble so uh, it can cross the blood brain barrier therefore can cause toxic effects on the brain if it uh, if it presents in high levels uh, coming to conjugated jaundice it is uh, uh, water soluble therefore can be excreted in the urine and stool too and as this is water soluble it can't cross the blood brain barrier therefore it is not toxic to the brain so what are the mechanisms of neonatal jaundice if the bilirubin load is more how can they get a high bilirubin load means if there is increased hemolysis then the heme production is more uh, the, uh, which is converted to the bilirubin then uh, it's like cephal hematoma or bruising uh, again aru, aru. Uh, local hemolysis uh, causing uh, increased bilirubin load and also polycythemia uh, obviously can cause increased bilirubin load then the next next factor is uh, when there is decreased bilirubin conjugation in the liver which can be due to the uh, decreased activity of glucuronide transferase or uh, glucuronide transferase deficiency which is seen in preclonata syndrome which is a inherited form of bilirubin uh, metabolism the third uh, category is defective bilirubin excretion if there is a block either in the biliary system or in the gut the, uh, there can be accumulation of conjugated bilirubin uh, causing hyperbilirubinemia so as i told you the neonates are more common to get uh, uh, jaundice uh, because uh, generally they are dead cells uh, the, uh, the rbc number is high they have increased uh, hemoglobin content so the lysis is more then uh, the most of this hemoglobin are hemoglobin f which has a shortened life span therefore it lies quickly the other uh, cause is immature hepatic uptake and conjugation because of the immature liver the uptake and conjugation is less and also uh, in neonates there is increased enterohepatic circulation so all these factors contribute to the uh, fact that jaundice is common in newborn so broadly it can be divided into physiological jaundice or pathological jaundice uh, what do you mean by physiological jaundice uh, it should appear after 24 hours that uh, the rate of rise of bilirubin should not exceed 5 mg per deciliter per day and it comes to the maximum intensity by 4 to 5th day of life and uh, the maximum level does not uh, exceed 15 mg per deciliter and generally it's clinically not detectable after 14 days so if you look at this uh, diagram the graph you can see it comes to the peak and then gradually disappear uh, so in preterm babies it's uh, shifted to the right so that the peak level uh, is coming around uh, seventh day and it can go up to about 21 days uh, to disappear the jaundice right so this is a diagnosis of physiological jaundice has to be done by exclusion means uh, even though the pattern is like this there shouldn't be any other cause to uh, uh, for the occurrence of jaundice then uh, what do you mean by pathological jaundice any jaundice appear within the first 24 hour 24 hour is pathological then the rate of increase 
of bilirubin is more than 5 mg per deciliter and the peak level would exceed 15 mg per deciliter and jaundice after 14 days of uh, life is always pathological and also conjugated bilirubin is uh, at any time of the day is pathological. If the baby is having clay color stool or dark urine or direct bilirubin infection is more than 20% of the total, it's conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, always, always pathological. Uh, the causes of jaundice can be categorized depending on the day of onset. If it appears within the first 24 hours, the, common, the, uh, the two common causes are there. One thing is hemolysis, uh, uh, which can be due to the hemolytic disease of the newborn due to the blood group incompatibility, maybe RH incompatibility, ABO incompatibility, or minor blood group incompatibility or there are hereditary hemolytic anemia, like um, congenital serocytosis, pyruvate kinase deficiency uh, can cause hemolysis and don't disappear within the, within the first 24 hours. The other uh, uh, factor is infections. So if it appear after 24 hours of life, uh, the, all the things that we mentioned above also can be there. In addition, uh, physiological jaundice coming there, then uh, you get breastfeeding or starvation jaundice, polycythemia, concealed hemorrhages, neonatal hepatitis, the torch infection means toxoplasma, rubella, cytomegaloo, and herpes infection in the mother. Or if there's a metabolic disease like uh, galactosemia or trigonata. So in this situation, jaundice appear after 24 hours of life. So if it persists beyond 14 days or 21 days in the preterm, we call it a prolonged neonatal jaundice. The process will be discussed later in the lecture. So how do you approach to jaundice baby? First, you have to take a history and examine the baby. So when you are doing that, you have to evaluate, the, uh, evaluate to decide on three important questions. Number one, the baby, whether the baby needs any further investigation for jaundice. For this, you need to have some idea about the degree of jaundice, period of gestation, the postnatal age in hours, whether the baby is critically ill or not, and uh, the directed history and examination to find the cause. For example, in the history, it is important to ask about the color of the stools, color of the, the urine, uh, to differentiate whether it's conjugated or unconjugated. Then, uh, uh, the, the, in the history, again, the things like any antenatal uh, history of uh, evidence of congenital infections, like fever with a rash, right? Any uh, urinary tract infection in the mother causing sepsis in the baby, right? Then, uh, with the uh, in family history of a hemolytic anemia or family history of jaundice, you need to get an idea about the blood groups of the mother and baby as well, right? And when it comes to the examination, you have to uh, first evaluate whether this child is well or ill. Then you have to look for the things like kephal hematoma, any kind of bruises in the body, uh, whether there's any pallo, which is an indication of hemolysis, right? Then uh, hemoly the, the hepatosplenomegaly again for hemolytic anemia um, and any uh, infection, they can they will be having uh, intrauterine growth retardation. It, uh, microcephaly and the skin rash, right? So in the examination and his taking, you have to uh, look for a uh, cause for, uh, possible cause for jaundice. The next uh, important question is to uh, decide whether this baby needs any treatment. This treatment may be to bring down the bilirubin levels or to treat the underlying cause. Then you have to decide whether this child is having any features of encephalopathy. And so in this, uh, for the, during your evaluation, you have to uh, get answers to these three questions. Okay, so how do you assess the severity of the jaundice? Jaundice generally in the newborn progress in a kephalocortal direction, means it starts from the head and spread down to the extremities. So, the extent of the yellowness of the skin is useful to assess the level of bilirubin. 
we use a camera index. That index, uh, uh, what, uh, what they say is, uh, if the uh, John D.C. is confined to the face, uh, the bilirubin in the blood is around 5 milligram per cent. When it comes to the level of uh, chest, up to the level of umbilicus, it's 10 milligram. If you come to the abdomen and thigh, it's 12 milligram. And hands and legs, if the hands and legs are involved, involved that means it's 15 milligram. And if the palms and soles are involved, that is more than 15 milligram. Right? So, yeah, in this way, you can get the rough idea about the severity of jaundice uh, before doing the blood test. Why it is important to get such an assessment? Because uh, you may have to sort of decide whether you are going to admit this baby or not. For example, if you see a baby who has jaundice uh, passing beyond the umbilical level, that means it will be uh, is uh, more than uh, 10, right? So that kind of baby will need urgent investigation as well as probably admission uh, because this is actually the rough, one, rough uh, guidance. So we will need a series of uh, bilirubin to be done. So you may have to admit. And the other thing is, if the palms and soles are involved, that means it's quite high. So in such a, if you get a, such a baby, not only urgent admission, we will have to start on phototherapy until they get the results of the bilirubin, uh, which will take about two to three hours uh, to uh, minimize the brain damage. So you can get rough idea uh, using the skin color, right? Uh, and the uh, important thing is you have to observe the baby naked in the natural bright light, right? Uh, but once the baby is under the phototherapy, this visual assessment is inaccurate, which means if the baby is under the phototherapy, to get an idea about the uh, level, you have to always do a bilirubin uh, blood test. So once you get the report, you have to plot it in the below the uh, threshold charts, right? As you can see in this picture, the charts are available from 23 weeks onwards up to the 38 weeks of period of gestation, right? So as you can see, there's a quite, the, 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 the treatment thresholds are quite uh, different, right? Uh, the Peter, they have a very lower threshold to start the treatment. The blue line is for the phototherapy and the uh, red line is for the extend transfusion. So if the levels are above the red line, that means that may warrants extend transfusion, right? The other important thing is uh, you, the, you, you are plotting the total bilirubin, not, not the un unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, even though we start phototherapy for the babies who are having uh, un unconjugated jaundice, the, this uh, chart is for the total bilirubin levels, right? Uh, the other thing is uh, this chart gives the bilirubin level in mitomoles per uh, liter, but in some of the laboratories, they give the bilirubin report as milligram per deciliter. So if you get such a blood report, you have to multiply it by 17.1 to convert into mitomoles per liter. Okay, so what are the features of acute bilirubin encephalopathy or chronic terrors? The symptoms and signs can be ranged from uh, presence of hypotonia, lethargy, poor feeding, irritability. And in severe cases, they will be having hypertonia of extensor muscles causing a physical posture. Respiratory, they can have respiratory distress, uh, kind of very high pitch, shrill cry. They can have apnea seizures, and even coma in the severe cases. Uh, so if you uh, detect jaundice uh, uh, in the baby, uh, you have to do a blood test to confirm it. Uh, and uh, if, if any baby needs uh, phototherapy or extend transfusion, you have to do a jaundice workup to uh, look for the cause as well. So what are the other investigations that we have to do? We have to do hemoglobin, reticulocyte count, and that picture to see whether there's any evidence of hemolysis. 
then blood group of the mother and baby are important to diagnose RH or IABO, minor group, blood group incompatibility. Uh, direct contest is uh, important to diagnose immune media hemolysis. And if the baby is ill, you have to always do the septic screen as well. So when it comes to the management, uh, during the first two weeks only the uh, uh, this management apply because uh, in a term baby, uh, uh, after 14 days, the blood -based barrier is developed. So they won't get any connectors after 14 days. So within the first two weeks only, we are really worried about connectors and we have to stick to this management, right? So if it is indirect hyperbilirubinemia, you have to reduce the bilirubin to prevent CNS toxicity, uh, irrespective of the cause. And also, you have to uh, uh, treat in the line of the uh, underlying, uh, to alleviate the underlying cause. So what are the things that we can do to reduce the bilirubin level? We can optimize hydration, uh, then phototherapy and exchange transmission. So these are the three modalities to uh, decrease the bilirubin load. Uh, so what do you mean by breastfeeding uh, or uh, starvation jaundice? This is actually one of the most common causes of jaundice requiring phototherapy in Sri Lankan setting. This happens when there is delayed establishment of breastfeeding, uh, which causes decreased elimination of the bilirubin due to the increased enterohepatic circulation. Right? So you call it like jaundice due to dehydration. So that's starvation jaundice. This is different to the breast milk. this which I described later, which uh, then uh, how to diagnose breastfeeding or starvation jaundice. If the jaundice is associated with a weight loss, which is more than 10% uh, uh, of the birthday in an otherwise well child and having features of dehydration, it is very much likely this baby is having starvation jaundice. Uh, what are the treatment? So irrespective of the, the cause, I said you have to uh, plot it in on the chart and go ahead from there. In addition, in, uh, addition to that, we have to establish breastfeeding with correct positioning and attachment. So if the baby is under the phototherapy, you can't take the baby out for breastfeeding. So in such a situation, you can express the milk two to three hours early uh, from the mother and give it like cup feed or garage feed. Uh, this uh, ex expression is very important to uh, maintain the uh, yeah. milk secretion. If it is very severe, the dehydration is very severe, uh, you can give even intravenous fluid. Okay, so what is phototherapy? What does phototherapy do? Uh, uh, phototherapy emits uh, uh, blue light, uh, which has a wavelength between 450 to 460 nanometers. So what it does is, it can uh, isomerize the native bilirubin to uh, a photo, uh, a non toxic uh, water soluble bilirubin. The, uh, water, uh, the native bilirubin is actually a lipid soluble. Sorry for the mistakes, the three mistakes there. And it isomerizes into a non toxic water soluble uh, component, which will be excreted in the urine. So that's how a phototherapy would act on it. So, depending on the level of bilirubin, you can apply either single phototherapy, double phototherapy, triple, or even four phototherapy units can be applied depending on the degree of jaundice. If it is close to the exchange transition level, you can straight away go for triple phototherapy. Or else, if uh, the, the, uh, the jaundice levels are persistently rise in spite of giving single phototherapy, you can go for multiple phototherapy. So once the baby is put under the phototherapy, we have to repeat the serum bilirubin two to sorry four to six hourly um, to monitor the, uh, the the level to see whether it's going up or going coming down. So the there are few side effects of phototherapy. They all are reversible. Therefore, you should not stop phototherapy uh, if any of these side effects are there. Uh, as the babies are exposed to the uh, uh, 
the environment, they can get hypothermia and also hyperthermia can be get because uh, of the warmer uh, liberated by the uh, phototherapy machine, right? And then uh, there can be increased uh, insensible water loss. Therefore, if you are giving phototherapy, you have to give extra fluid. Generally, you have to give 10 ml per kg extra fluid to the normal, in addition to the normal group treatment. It can be toxic to the eyes. Therefore, you have to always cover the eyes. Uh, and uh, other thing is, uh, can have loose green stools. Uh, you have to ensure hydration is good. Uh, so if you are putting the baby under the phototherapy, you have to uh, uh, minimize the part that you are covering. So eyes have to be definitely covered. Other than that, you can only put a diaper to prevent soiling, right? Uh, they can get bronze baby syndrome if we give phototherapy to a baby who is having conjugated hypermetrobilia, right? So if you get a bronze baby syndrome, uh, no point of giving phototherapy, therefore we have to discontinue it. Uh, briefly about extend transfusion, uh, it is an effective and reliable method to reduce the limit, but it's quite invasive. So you have to take all the precaution not to do the extended transition until it is really, really necessary. So uh, uh, you can uh, uh, perform it uh, if the bilirubin levels are in the exchange uh, transfusion range as per the treatment threshold graphs, despite effective phototherapy, or if features of bilirubin encephalopathy is there, uh, with whatever the bilirubin serum, bilirubin level, you have to go for excellent transition. The other indication is if uh, you are suspecting of a hemolytic disease of the newborn and if the baby is having anemia uh, and uh, features of high drops, you have to go for uh, excellent transfusion uh, at once. Right? So it's done by uh, uh, you give donor's blood and take the waste blood of the baby out and replace it with donor's bowel. Then you have to exchange the double of the volume of the total uh, blood volume of the baby, that is two times 80 ml per kg. The, uh, it's done through the umbilical vessels, through the umbilical vein catheter, and throughout the procedure, you have to monitor the baby, and also you have to uh, monitor the electrolytes and blood gases because they can be deranged uh, because of the, uh, the blood that we are using. So intravenous immunoglobin has a place, especially in proven isoamine hemolytic jaundice. Means if there is jaundice with positive wounds or if the blood picture shows the evidence of uh, the hemolysis, uh, uh, we can uh, give intravenous fluids, uh, intravenous immunoglobin, uh, which will uh, have beneficial effects. So, uh, in such a way that the exchange transition can be delayed. The use of fresh frozen plasma, albumin, phenobarbitone, and other medications are not really recommended now. So, what do you mean by prolonged neurotic jaundice? Uh, if the jaundice persists beyond 37 weeks, uh, more than uh, 14 days in a term baby or more than 21 days in a preterm baby, you call it prolonged neonatal jaundice, right? So it again can be due to unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So causes for the prolonged unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia are uh, uh, Persisting or new low grade sepsis type UTI. The babies are clinically well, but they are having an underlying subtle infection. If there's persisting hemolysis due to whatever the causes, they can have prolonged new jaundice. Uh, then the metabolic causes like hyperthyroidism and galactosemia. The most common cause for the uh, prolonged unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is breast milk jaundice. Uh, breast milk jaundice occurs because of uh, a substance present in the meal which will uh, inactivate the uh, uh, glucuronide transferase activity. So that's why they get jaundice. This is a quite benign uh, phenomena. You don't have to do anything as such. Uh, 
generally breastfed jaundice will disappear when the baby is six weeks to one uh, two months of age. Therefore, even Though you think of having a, uh, so even though the uh, the commonest cause is breast milk jaundice, we have to do the other investigation that I mentioned because all these uh, diseases, uh, if you treat early, diagnose and treat early, will prevent serious complications. Right? Things, like, for example, the hypothyroidism. If you diagnose and treat, you can prevent uh, them getting um, mental retardation. Right? So therefore. You have to uh, do the uh, this uh, prolonged jaundice screening uh, if a baby is having uh, meet the criteria to diagnose prolonged jaundice. Right? Then the prolonged congenital hyperbilirubinemia has different uh, set of causes. It can be due to neonatal hepatitis. It can be due to congenital infections, things like alpha one and trypsin deficiency, neonatal sepsis, or uh, things like galactosemia or tyrosinemia. Uh, then extra hepatic biliary atresia is a very dangerous cause, polylocal cysts. Uh, babies who want total parental nutrition can have congenital bilirubinemia. And the other thing is inspissated by syndrome. So if the baby is having hemolytic disease of the new one, initially they will be having um, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, but they, uh, thereafter they can uh, develop conjugated because of the Inspissated by syndrome. So, how do you approach to a baby with peroneal jaundice? You have to first look for the uh, stool and urine color to see whether it is uh, conjugated or unconjugated. If the pale, stool is play, pale and urine is dark, it is towards unconjugated conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So, this gives the uh, stool uh, color card. Uh, uh, which is uh, 4, 5, 6 is the color of the normal stools, 1, 2, 3 is the uh, color of the pale stools, which is significant. So, if you uh, see a baby with uh, possible uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, you have to uh, immediately do the investigations uh, because uh, uh, extra hepatic uh, biliary atresia is one of the serious. Uh, uh, causes. Uh, if you don't uh, extrude or diagnose and treat it before six weeks of age, the, they can go into liver cirrhosis. So the prognosis is not good. So you have to go for surgery uh, before six weeks of age. Right? Uh, so what are the investigations that you have to do if it is uh, conjug uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia? So this is conjugated. You have to do the Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, this is uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, you have to do the uh, uh, total bilirubin and conjugated bilirubin. Then to see whether any, any, any evidence of uh, hemolysis, you have to do the full blood count, blood picture and reticulocyte count. Then blood group determination in the mother and baby uh, uh, and Coombs test, urine culture to diagnose urine uh, tract infection and metabolic training, T4TSH to diagnose congenital hypothyroidism and urine reducing substance to diagnose galactosemia, which is again a reversible cause of jaundice. So if all these above insects, uh, investigations are uh, negative, you can attribute that basement jaundice is the cause for the prolonged jaundice. So as I told you, you have to monitor them up to the age of six weeks to see whether the jaundice is coming down. Uh, then coming to the prolonged conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, uh, although it is rare, it is always pathological. So, what is the definition of uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia? If the direct bilirubin level is greater than one milligram per cent. Uh, uh, when the total bilirubin is less than 5, or if it is more than 20% of the total bilirubin, you call it uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So, the investigation that you have to do is uh, serum bilirubin with direct fraction. Then, you have to uh, do an urgent ultrasound scan of the abdomen uh, because you can, if the biliary atresia is a possibility, uh, the 
uh, after four hours of fasting, uh, the gold bladder will be absent. The other things that you can diagnose by ultrasound can is the echogenic, altered echogenicity uh, in a given parenchymal disease, uh, suggesting a congenital hepatitis or presence of polydiversis. In addition, you had to do the liver function test, urine for disease substance for galactosemia, urine culture, and torch staining if it is a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So as I told you, you had to always rule out or establish the diagnosis of extrapolipidemia atresia as early as possible within 90 days. So in summary, we talked about bilirubin metabolism, causes of neonatal jaundice, management of jaundice, and important timely management of neonatal jaundice. So as uh, you can see, even though it is conjugated or unconjugated, unconjugated, uh, the timely management is important because if it is unconjugated, you have to prevent them getting into uh, carnitaurus because uh, otherwise they will end up as a patient with cerebral palsy. If it is conjugated, you have to always rule out uh, excitability reactresia, which is again a treatable condition if you act on the time. Thank you. So as the time uh, uh, is lagging behind, I had to stop the lecture from here without uh, asking for questions. Uh, so we move on to the next lecture. Thank you, madam. question asked by somebody uh, how to differentiate keratin hyperkeratinemia from jaundice in jaundice there will be interest the eyes are in yellow but in hyperkeratinemia it's only the palms and soles Hi, good evening. Can you all hear me?
हेलो मट स्टार्ट करने पुलवा अंदर पुलवा मैडम राइट ओके हम शेयर करना Hi, a good evening to you all. So I think I'm supposed to talk to you about developmental care in the newborn. Can you uh, can you hear me and can you see the slides? Yes, madam. Okay, so I will proceed. Uh, if you have any questions, I think we'll keep it to the end. Okay. Um, so the first thing is uh, what we need to know is a baby's brain uh, keeps developing from the point of conception. And what this picture is trying to show you is that the complexity of the brain increases with time, right? So especially if a baby is born preterm, that means baby is coming out while the brain is still maturing. So therefore things that we do can affect the outcome. Uh, of the maturation of the brain and stuff like that. So there are things that we already know which can cause issues. So this is just a, a picture which is going to show you. So there are insults that we already know, like hypoxia, intraventricular hemorrhage, infection. So if there is a, some sort of insult, what you can see is in the other side, what I showed you earlier, there are a specific pathways that neurons will travel during the neuronal migration. But if there are insults, things can go wrong and it will not develop as usual. Migraine may, sorry, migration will not happen as usual. So here what we are talking about is actually not the medical part of uh, preventing hypoxia or infection or hemorrhage, but we are going to talk more about the environment of the newborn. So these are things that are easily done without much additional cost or without maybe any additional cost, just needs your awareness. So if we talk about developmental care, what it means is it is to reduce the stress linked to the environment of the baby and to increase the awareness of the baby's behavior and also to integrate the parents in his or her daily, uh, in baby's daily routine. So this is just showing you that there are many things that are there in this environment, things we take for granted, the light, sound, taste, smell, touch. And uh, this also shows you the various components of developmental care, which includes optimizing nutrition, minimizing pain, safeguarding sleep, protecting skin, et cetera. So we'll go through one by one. So what does that picture show? It basically shows you a very bright light, um, what a baby may be seeing who's inside the incubator. So why is lighting important? Because baby's pupils cannot constrict uh, in less than 32 week babies. And when we do retinopathy of prematurity screen, we dilate the pupils using eye drops so they are unable to constrict. So the amount of light entering will be huge and it will be very problematic for those babies. And if there is not enough darkness given to these babies, they may not be able to sleep. And we all know that sleep is important to grow. So uh, what can we do to correct this situation? We should be, first of all, aware that bright lights are not good for babies. So if your unit is having lots of you know, uh, windows and doors which bring in a lot of light, we can use curtains and blinds. Then for individual incubators, we can cover the incubator while keeping it so that we can actually see the babies inside. Cots also similarly can be covered for babies who are less than 34 weeks. We should also avoid fluctuating light over baby's face. So this, no one goes and, you know, shines a torch purposefully on the eyes, but sometimes without thinking, we are looking for a vein or we need more light to put umbilical catheter. In times like that, we use the torch or the flashlight. So in such situations, we should cover the baby's size. And day-night cycling means if there are different switches for each incubator light, we should 
try to dim the light or switch off the light in uh, stable babies, right? So this is a picture of the incubator cover uh, with flaps um, where you can see one part is raised up so you can actually see the baby. So this is what we do in our unit uh, and it can be easily done locally. And that's a cot cover again, cover, uh, reducing some of the light coming to the baby. Then dimming the lights in the neonatal unit. So for this, you need to have a couple of lights and maybe some lights you can either switch off or dim, which are near individual incubators. Then we talked about avoiding shining <clears throat> light on the baby size, especially when we are trying to do different procedures, right? So after retinopathy of ROP screening or during procedures, it's important that we cover the baby size. You don't need anything special. You can just uh, take, uh, you know, some sort of towel, ask for it from the nurses and something clean, you cover the baby size. So that was about protecting the baby from noxious light. Uh, then also there is a place obviously for visual stimulation. Right, but it is uh, dependent on the age of the baby. So the ABCD of visual stimulation would be we need to allow sleep, avoid light, we have to be guided by the baby, and the amount of light we give will be in relation to, uh, to the age of the baby. So in preterm babies, we should avoid direct light to the face at all ages. And we should not put pictures inside or toys inside the incubator in the direct uh, space until 32 weeks. After the baby is 32 weeks, there is we can start eye contact. That is usually from the mother or the nurses or the carers who are looking after. We look eye to eye to the baby and you start direct eye contact with the human face. So the human face is most ideal for early stimulation. Uh, so this is a picture of how we use eye contact during KMC, that is kangaroo mother care, as well as chaos. So what I meant, that is what we meant by age specific. So less than 32, no toys, no pictures. You don't even, uh, you know, you don't try to get eye contact with the baby. But of course, if the baby responds, you respond back. But after 32 weeks, we try smiling with the baby, eye contact. Uh, and after 37 weeks, we can use objects right, uh, to stimulate visually so bright colored object and you should use it as per what the baby can tolerate. So sometimes the baby gets stressed, we will talk about the behavioral signals in a few uh, minutes and if they are stressed, we have to stop. Their attention span is very small, they get stressed and overwhelmed very easily, so you can only do so much until they are stressed. And we should limit bright light of contrasting objects only to five to 10 minutes. Right, so visual stimulation after 37 weeks can include patterns, black and white patterns like this. Uh, it can also include uh, these bright colored objects and curved objects are preferred to straight, bright colored uh, compared to sort of dull or pastel shades, contrasting large and quantity over quality, right? So just very simple colored balls can be used to stimulate the baby. What is the distance? So it should be kept 12 to 12 inches from the baby with background light, with a plain background. And moving will cause the baby to look at it more. And if we shine the light through an object, it will make it more attractive to the baby. Even in the well baby clinic, when we are assessing development or that risk clinic, sometimes you see think babies are not looking. If you just shine a light through the object, that will be more interesting for the baby and you can actually observe them looking. So there are specified doses of light, which I don't think you need to remember at all. But this is just to show uh, uh, if they are younger than 34 weeks, it is less than 25 lakhs. And uh, there are different amounts of lights that are actually described for different time periods as well as different gestations. OK, so what does this show actually? Can someone tell me what this shows very quickly? What is the baby doing? I would like if one of you respond quickly though. Okay, uh, so sorry, what stuck somewhere? What we try to show is that the baby is closing the ears because the sound is too much. 
And this is a sound ear, which is sort of something that is used in other countries to assess the sound level of the uh, neonatal unit. So if the light is green, that means your sound levels are within acceptable limits. If it's yellow, you are bordering on too high. And if it's red, it's bad and too high and damaging and you have to reduce. So babies can't tune out repetitive sounds and high frequencies can impair language development. And third trimester hyperstimulation has caused abnormal brain development. So this is why we have to reduce the amount of sound inside our units. But that doesn't mean it has to be studio quiet. Stable babies like to hear their parents' voices and we always encourage parents to come and see the babies, talk to the baby, sing to the baby, pray with the baby, whatever they like, read books to their baby. So that's very important. We should talk to the baby, but uh, not loud noises. So we encourage parents to talk or read to them when the babies are settled. So what are the things, sorry, what are the things that are problematic? See with this. Okay, hold on, yeah. So noise pollution happens with slamming the portholes of the incubator, tapping on the incubator, and uh, keeping things on top of the incubator, us opening the portholes and talking, alarms that are very loud or ringing, then water splashing, equipment being moved, all that can be reduced. So what can we do to prevent this? Obviously we can not talk while the incubator is open. We must make sure we move away from the incubator before we start talking. Try not to keep things on the incubator. So around open courts, we should not be having discussions or you know, talking loud, minimize the volume in alarms, minimize the activity around the incubator, and we have to put insulated cover. So every alarm, every uh, saturation monitor or multi-monitor has a, vo a volume control in the alarm. So it's important to minimize that as well as set the appropriate limits. Usual problem is limits are not set. So you should be able to guide your staff because otherwise alarms are ringing all the time and nobody takes any notice of any of the alarms. Right, so this is something that doesn't happen. Uh, you should minimize the activity around the incubator. So I, I saw some of my students here and this is the reason why I don't allow uh, students inside the incubator, only people who are working in the staff are allowed inside the neonatal unit because Many reasons, infection is one, and this sound pollution is another huge reason. Okay, so that, like I said earlier, it doesn't mean that, you know, you don't say anything at all. Quiet voice is good as well as calm music, right? Classical music has been shown to be, classical and instrumental music has been shown to be good for babies. So moving on, taste and smell. So we have to avoid unpleasant smells like the smell of spirits or alcohol wipes and strong antiseptics. We should keep it away from the incubator. And uh, we can stimulate the baby with pleasant smells. So the thing is sometimes these are unavoidable. We need to clean the baby with uh, alcohol or whatever for, with swabs sometimes. And the smell is there, but then to counteract that, we can minimize that as much as we can. Uh, counteract, we can also stimulate the baby with pleasant smells. What about tactile stimulation? So swaddling during non-contact times uh, will give the baby sort of a feeling of security uh, when the baby is swaddled. So, but it is disturbing for the baby if different people go and open the incubator from time to time and examine and do procedures. So this is why we need to cluster care. So we encourage nurses, doctors, everyone to work as a team. And when they are opening, they both of them do what they need to do. So doctors should not open independently. They should talk with the nurses and then only usually unless it's a medical emergency. And even taking, doing procedures, taking blood, people should not be pricking from time to time. Wait until your consultant, SR or whoever comes and then decide on what you really want to do, then only prick the baby. Yes minimal as possible. So if the baby is uh, tired or stressed, we have to provide a timeout. We should combine the doctors and nurses and unnecessary examination of stable babies should be avoided. Before we go and touch the baby, you can't just put your hands in and turn a baby, baby gets a startle. 
So we have to prepare the baby. So we should first start talking, touching a little bit and sort of getting them ready to be handled. And it's better to do it when the baby is awake, baby should be expecting us. Um, and also when babies are awake during feeds, we can uh, hold the baby so that we provide tactile stimulation. So similarly, we can use uh, tactile stimulation as a consoling method by using containment, keeping our hands around the baby when an unpleasant procedure is going on. So we should not pat or stroke babies before 32 weeks. Uh, after that, it may be tolerated and we should have sort of uh, day and night patterns from 24 weeks, like uh, weighing, changing bedding, socialization and stuff should be done during the daytime. Then positioning the baby. So the baby should be positioned in similar to what has happened inside the uterus where the baby is in the fetal position with arms and legs curled up and the spine is curved. So we are now, the baby should have been there unless it was because it was born preterm only, it is outside. So positioning is important because muscle tone is still developing. It helps ex utero uh, movements. It prevents postural deformities and it helps self-consoling. Self-consoling means the baby can calm himself down without screaming and screaming if something is wrong. So that is actually a measure of neonatal development. Then what can we use for positioning? So what we are trying to do is we try to make an environment like the uterus outside. So we make what is called a nest. We use blankets uh, or towels or supporting rolls to make a nest. Sometimes baby seats are used in other countries. So this is something from our unit. We used actually uh, pool towels. Uh, and I will show you in a minute how we make the nest. Uh, and it has to be made to the size of the baby. So it actually snugly sort of fits around the baby very comfortably so that baby remains in a flex position like what we saw in the uterus. So prone position is the first position that we advocate because that is the best position for babies with breathing issues, which is the commonest problem, as well as for babies having reflux. So here you can see the nest is not so great and baby can sort of, you know, roll over, it can collapse. So you must find something suitable to make the nest. Keeping prone helps the baby with breathing, reflux, as well as quiet sleep. And the more they sleep, the more they gain weight. So that is also why we should not disturb them unnecessarily. Another way of doing prone positioning is keeping the baby in kangaroo care, which is advocated for all babies who are receiving non-invasive ventilation. So then the next thing is keeping baby on the side. So when we are keeping baby on the side, we have to support the baby well. And we don't want the baby's ankles to rub together because they are usually quite skinny, as you can see. And if the ankles rub together, the skin can get bruised and there can be uh, abrasions there. So that's why you can see here, some cloth has been kept between the skins. Uh, sorry, the two legs and the baby has been turned to the side and baby is supported. So this is side lying. Uh, here you can see the nest is not supporting the baby enough and the baby has kind of flopped over um, and kind of rolled over. So it's important that we support the side when we are keeping in the side lying position. And then we can keep the baby. So side lying is important for baby to be able to take the hand towards the mouth. Then uh, when the baby is more mature, we can keep the baby on the back. But the important thing is the head should be kept in the midline. If we keep the head to the side, the head will elongate and they will have a very long head with the body where you can say from far away that this baby has been a preterm baby. So all that can be avoided just simply by positioning the baby correctly. So uh, we have to keep the head in the midline and make sure the pressure goes down symmetrically. Right, so lying in the back, you can see the first picture baby is not supported at all. The second picture baby is supported with a nest. So this is how we make the nest. You can either use two average size towels, or if you're getting a very large towel, you can use one towel to make this whole oval shaped thing. So that has to be adjusted to fit the size of the baby. When the baby's legs and arms are flexed, in the fetal position. And once you make it, then you cover it with a soft cloth and then you keep the baby inside it. So the soft cloth has to be uh, cleaned every day, but the nest can be kept for a couple of days before cleaning. 
So who needs positioning? All babies less than 34 weeks need positioning. Uh, then uh, there can be growth restricted babies, although they are mature. Then there can also be term babies who be paralyzed for ventilation, like uh, babies with persistent pulmonary hypertension, babies with pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, so babies like that or babies who are on very high ventilator settings. So babies like that also would need positioning if we have given paralytic agents. So which position? So initial position, the baby should be kept prone until stable. Uh, then when baby is better in the sideline position to support development and taking the hand to the mouth and then uh, on preparation for discharge, we would keep the baby supine. And similarly, once the baby is reaching 34 weeks, the nesting boundaries should be gradually decreased as they are approaching term or discharge. So how do we change positions? You have to, it's like the uh, log rolling maneuver that you do in adults. You have to hold the baby from the pelvic area or the leg area, stabilize the pelvis, stabilize the head. Before you touch, talk to the baby, give the baby some warning you're going to touch and slowly while talking, you turn the baby. So as not to startle the baby. So here again, you can see a baby inside the incubator with the incubator cover it has been raised to show you the picture. This baby is on CPAP. But the side baby is on the side lying position, but the side support is not adequate and the baby has rolled over. So we have talked about positioning, uh, tactile stimulation, light, sound, uh, smell, uh, and uh, taste where we give the baby express breast milk. So next part is involving parents in the care. So zero separation should be what we should aim for. And we have to involve parents in the care. So this is why we encourage parents to come and visit uh, even in the wheelchair. So that is the mother and the father and we encourage them to handle the babies and get involved with their care with time. So even if the babies can be very sick and on a ventilator, but even oh, those yeah. babies they can, uh, positive touch, quiet talking, skin to skin can be done. As the babies are getting better, then uh, parents can get more involved with kangaroo care, skin to skin, uh, breast positioning at the breast, uh, nappy changes, bathing, stuff like that. So the important point is, although uh, as the, uh, well, a neonatologist and working in a neonatal unit, we believe baby, like we have looked after these babies, prevented them from a lot of issues, but the baby actually belongs to the parents. So the parents should not be alienated, but they should feel part of our care plan with the baby and they should be actively involved. They can help us a lot by talking to the babies, calming the babies down uh, um, and soothing the babies. And it also helps us because they know what is going on, they know the challenges faced and they are in with us throughout the journey of this preterm baby. So chaos should be done as needed to protect sleep and it should be done according to the signs of alertness. Uh, and discomfort rather than uh, according to the way we want to the times that are convenient to us. We have to dress and cover the baby even if we have to say leave the cot side for a few minutes. We should keep the legs folded and we must not lift babies up from the ankles. So let's look a little bit at uh, what behavior means. If the baby is comfortable, that means you can see the baby has a calm expression on the face hands are near the uh, mouth, baby is in a flex position, and baby may be squeezing something in the hand. The feet are supported and they are together. And you can see the baby is having a relaxed expression, baby is smiling, and there are periods of brief eye contact. And if the baby is uncomfortable, you can see the baby is like screaming out for help with frowning face, toes, arms and legs spread out with an arching back. You should not have babies like this in your unit. You must calm them down. Babies yawning and asking for help. So yawning, hiccups uh, during handling and chaos mean the baby is stressed out and we should stop whatever we are doing. If we are trying to hold the baby, but the baby is looking away, that means baby has had enough and we should stop trying to stimulate the baby and let the baby be until the baby uh, sort of becomes calm. So signals of stress can be increased in the heart rate, respiratory rate, going floppy, stiff, frowning, waving arms, stiffly extended legs, all that. So here I am sure you can appreciate the baby on top. 
is nice and calm in a flex position, whereas the baby at the bottom is definitely not happy. So whatever interventions we are doing, keeping the baby happy is very, very important. So how can we minimize stress and pain? We can minimize the procedures. We can reduce noxious stimuli. We can uh, use pharmacological treatment where appropriate, and we can also use consoling strategies. So talking about consoling strategies again, this don't take money uh, or, or, or time, but it needs awareness and a change and shift in our attitude. Um, so when procedures are happening, usually they are, if it's uh, uh, some procedures will be two nurses, one will some will be doctor and nurse. So whoever who is there can help with doing these things. One is containment holding, then touching the baby, talking to the baby, holding the finger, giving the baby uh, express breast milk, all this will help in calming down the baby. So as I showed earlier, containment holding is we keep our hands encompassing the baby, just like the uterine feel. So the baby feels warm and protected and calms the baby down. Again, touching the baby and stroking the baby can be done as we mentioned after 32 weeks, getting the baby to hold the fingers. Those are little things, but it goes a long way in helping a baby cope with all the stresses that come as part of being in a neonatal unit. So positive touch and all that. So protecting sleep is important. Uh, so we try, must try and schedule interventions when baby is awake. We must cluster chaos to minimize disruption. You should not wake the baby up. Um, and the baby should be at least around one hour sleep before we disturb the baby. And if the baby has to be woken up, it should be from active sleep. So you should not go and do something to start the sleeping baby. But we have to first talk and touch and get the baby to slowly wake up rather than giving him a start. And if he displays unsettled behavior, we have to support the baby to go back to sleep. Then we come to protecting the skin. So these small babies sometimes have skin peeling off, but we have to remember skin is one of the most important barriers to infection. So ugly peeling, bruised skin is not good for babies. So we can use something to keep the skin moisturized, uh, right? And what helps us in our country is virgin coconut oil. Olive oil is expensive. That is what uh, Western countries use. At least in UK, we used to use olive oil massages. But here we can get virgin coconut oil from the MSD on request. So it's available in the state sex as well. And we have to keep skin healthy by breastfeeding, uh, starting parental nutrition in very preterm and extreme preterm babies, giving skin to skin care with having good skin flora. And of course, minimizing investigation and procedures in small babies, using heel prick to draw blood and having UVCs and USCs by the access in very small babies. So this is just to show you that coconut oil massage is just as good as olive oil massage and would be the more appropriate thing because it is freely available in countries like ours. We have to optimize nutrition. So parenteral nutrition should be started from day one. Again, this is available in the state sector and this is standard of care, right? It is no longer acceptable to give just 10% extras to preterm babies. Uh, so if they are very preterm or less than 1,500, you should start parenteral nutrition mm -hmm. in addition to mother's own breast milk. So breast milk should be started and increased as soon as possible and while supporting the mother to express milk, right? So human milk is what should be given to the baby because it supports, it prevents necrotizing enterocolitis, prevents sepsis as well as improves the neurodevelopmental outcome. So this is a paper showing that although uh, babies may struggle to stay on their growth curve with breast milk, neurodevelopment is far more superior. Um, so this is basically different. Uh, uh, it's a chart for one of the babies on what has been done and how it's being monitored. And it gives a summary of all the things that we talked about, the different kind of sensory modalities, um, and understanding the behavior involving the parents, uh, taking care of the skin, minimizing the pain, safeguarding the sleep, positioning, in addition to handling all the sensors of the baby. 
So I hope I have given you some idea about what developmental care is, and I hope you can make use of it when you start working. Thank you. So if uh, does anyone have any questions or the otherwise I can, uh, we can, I suppose, end this session. Hello, good evening, everybody. Can all of you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, madam. Can hear. Ah, okay, fine. So, I will start with the I am Dr. Gomez, uh, Madam, consultant neonatologist. Excuse me, Madam. Presentation not shared. Okay. Yep. Okay, Madam. Okay, Madam. So I am uh, Dr. Gomez, consultant neonatologist from Gampaha Hospital. Uh, today I am going to talk about uh, how you assess and managing the seriously ill child. So as a uh, interns, you will have to see the first. You will be the first contact. So you have to see the baby as the first doctors who are seeing the baby. So first, uh, neonatal emergencies, we are discussing who is the neonate. Uh, I like to... I like to uh, say what you who have this uh, lecture as an interactive session and not as a presentation. So, so what is neonate? Neonate means purely a age definition. Who are the neonates? Neonates are 28 days or less than 44 weeks of gestation. And there are an array of possibilities how they are presenting. So we will go through few presentations you will see. Uh, but actually you have to speak and tell what are you going to do and what are the questions you are going to ask. So first of all we will see what is the, how important the question and broad approach of management. So neonatal emergencies approach is same as what you have learned through these three days. So it is airway, breathing, circulation. And in the neonates, don't ever forget glucose and keep the baby warm. Then we have to go to structured assessment of the cause of the illness. So the first one. So there are uh, several case scenarios and I would like to hear someone speaking, answering the questions. There is a neonate in waiting room. So baby is not feeding. An emotional mother. So baby is two to three days old. Baby is having fever. 
so what questions would you ask from the mother can anyone answer can all of you hear me yo yes madam can hear so is others all are un all are muted can't they unmute all are muted madam so no one likes to answer okay fine so this will be a then is anyone like to answer what are the questions would you ask from mother okay fine so the questions I think I disconnected those. sorry for the i think there is some signal tapping in my side so now we are talking about the there is a neonate waiting who is waiting in a waiting room and baby is not feeding and emotional mother so what are the questions you will ask so is the baby is acting hungry and crying for feed so first thing you should know whether the baby is active actually if baby is active he will be happy so there is Our worrisome will be less, and if time for feeds. 
and it means baby is asking for feeds and is the baby's prep right we should ask from mom what is the temperature they are going to uh, they if they have measured at home and then we have to look for is there any weight loss so it is the best way because uh, for us to know whether baby is had enough feeds so there is any weight loss and what is the mom thinking of the baby so this mom is upset and when we ask the questions we got to know the baby is active crying for feeds but mom is emotional and baby is slightly febrile and then last we have to look for whether there is any feeding issues crack nipples and gouged breasts so if baby is active and there is uh, no evidence of sepsis the pos most possible cause is dehydration fever so we have to assess the hydration of the fever how are you going to assess the uh, hydration of the baby the first thing for, we can ask from the history whether they are how the baby how long baby fed and how many times the baby passed urine so usually after the day 4 baby should pass more than 6 times per day a urine and then we can calculate the weight loss usually babies will have around 10% of weight loss during the first few days and baby will get the baby's weight back around the day 7 to day 10 term babies they will get the birth weight back around day 7 to day 10 and preterm babies it will last little longer which will be around 14 days so if baby is uh, lost around 15% of around 15% weight loss in our first two days it means there is definitely something problem with feeding so according to the baby's condition we have to manage so if baby is active and there is definite we can see there is a dehydration part is there and baby is looking for fever feeding then we can refer them to lactation management center for further advice and follow up but whenever there is a dehydration fever is there we have to look for electrolytes sometimes they may present with hyponatremic dehydration then these babies may need to and any babies who are showing showing signs of sepsis such as poor feeding lethargy those babies also we have to admit otherwise purely well active baby and sodium levels are normal those babies we can manage with lactation management center collaboration so this this is most common and the uh, very commonly presented condition in the neonatal period and the next we'll move to the neonate waiting in the room who is yellow in color i will be happy if someone can answer this question what questions would you ask from the mother if baby presented to the waiting room with yellow color what would you the questions you ask from mother Anyone want to answer? How many times he feed the baby? Yes, how many times? Did you feed per day? Yeah, that's good. What else? Now we want to know what is what is the reason for yellowish discoloration? So what else? The onset of discoloration. Then yeah, from that is very important. Whether it is within first twenty-four hour or later on. Very good. What else? What else you want to ask? Okay, fine. Anyhow, you gave few answers. So those are very good answers. First, we have to know the typical. Whether it is onset, 
within 24 hours or after 24 hours because the physiological jaundice usually onset after 24 hours and which is resolved by two weeks and well babies and then we should ask whether their yeah, baby is active. Always we should ask whether baby is active. And feeding well, passing urine, those things we should ask. And next question is whether are they actively hemolyzing. So what are the questions we should ask to see whether there is any reason for hemolysis? In a history do you want to ask anything? What are the reasons for active hemolysis? What is your blood type? Sorry? Yeah, blood type. I think you said blood type, yeah. Blood grouping and RH type. That is very important. So, if RH negative mom delivered, there is a possibility, there is a RH incompatibility. And if mom is O positive and baby is AOB, there is a chance of active hemolysis. So we should see whether there is any evidence for that. And after that, we have to see whether there is anything else could be going. So apart from hemolysis, what are the other causes such as uh, for the jaundice? It could be sepsis. So sepsis also one reason. So we should see whether the baby is active, feeding well. And main thing is we have to look in the history whether there is any encephalopathic features. So what is the bilirubin encephalopathy? What do we call it? Yeah, we call it pernicterus. So this is happening when bilirubin crosses the blood-brain barrier and uh, deposited in the basal ganglia and it will cause bilirubin encephalopathy. So it is a neonatal emergency. So if there is any evidence of encephalopathy, we should immediately act on the baby and there, the baby may need an exchange transfusion. So what are the features of bilirubin encephalopathy? They will usually, have you heard of opera singing? So there will be high pitch cries and babies of pistotonous postures and baby will be not doing well and there may be apneic episodes. So if there is such a thing, we should urgently act on the baby and have to do urgent investigations and management. So what are the actions we have to do? So first of all, we have to measure the SBR. So it is serum bilirubin, direct, indirect. And then we have to start phototherapy accordingly. So how are we going to start the phototherapy? So there is nomograms. I think uh, you have to, you have seen them and you have to follow them in your new internship period. So we are following the NICE, guide, NICE phototherapy charts. So that is from the NICE guidelines. So it is according to the gestation, there is phototherapy charts. So we are measuring it from the total bilirubin level. So in our country, the bilirubin measurements are given according to milligrams per deciliter. But in UK, it's come in mic micromoles per liter. So we have to first of all change our bilirubin levels to from milligram to micromoles. It is done by multiplying by 17. If our bilirubin level is one milligram per deciliter, it is in micromoles, it is 17 micromoles per liter. So we have to turn it to micromoles per liter and then we have to plot in the phototherapy charts. So for the pl plotting of the phototherapy chart, we should know the baby's period of gestation and the time of birth because Ours also count in the uh, phototherapy chart. So we have to measure and plot them. And if when baby comes in the region of phototherapy, then we have to start the phototherapy. And we have to check 
for hydration levels and we hydrate the baby some if baby's phototherapy if at the phototherapy level not in exchange levels the sbr we can continue breastfeeding and if it is very high we can't take the baby out from the phototherapy until it is stabilized then we may need to start iv fluids and after that we have to see whether there is any concurrent illness because sometimes the jaundice is due to sepsis so then we have to start antibiotics accordingly if extremely high sbr or encephalopathy then as i said we have to do the exchange transfusion and in atypical pictures always always remember to do the septic screen so from that on we'll move to the baby who has vomited something greenish what questions would you ask from the mother does anyone want to answer okay fine then uh, same as john this when the onset whether baby has first pass meconia is the abdomen is distended these are the questions we should look for the baby whether abdomen is distended if not distended we will be little bit happy if abdomen distended then we have to be more cautious and when did they first pass meconia and then we have to look whether the anus is plated sometimes in neonatal examinations they will miss the not patent anus it means imperforated anus and they will send the baby out and then baby will come with not past meconium since birth and uh baby is having bilious vomiting so almost always make sure before discharging the baby baby has open bowel and pass urine and we have to look whether they are in shock so if the baby is in shocked condition we have to resuscitate the baby so there are several researches been done and from almost all those researchers around 12 to 46% of the cases the bilious vomiting is due to surgical problems and around more than half is due to from 76 to 48 percent it could be normal even so if it is a bilious vomiting we have to take it as a critical condition and we have to act immediately so first we have to take iv access and we have to keep baby nil by mouth and we have to start empiric antibiotics then we can do the x-ray abdominal x-ray sometimes we may need definitive radiology to rule out malnutrition because it won't be seen in the normal plain abdominal x-ray so at that time we may need to transfer to tertiary care center or other surgical courses even if we may need to transfer and what are the non surgical condition infections may cause bilious vomiting so we have to keep those things in mind but we have to always almost always have to exclude surgical condition so next we are going to yes anyone want to say anything okay fine so there is a neonate in waiting room and baby is blue so usually this is also very common presentation you will encounter in your during your internship so what questions would you ask from the mother and what, what actions would you like to take so this is a cyanosed baby so what are the reasons for the baby to become cyanosed could be baby could be respiratory problem or cardiac problem or due to sepsis so first of all we have to see whether do they have any increased work of breathing 
So whether there is any granting, whether there is uh, respiratory distress, subcostal recessions, intercostal recessions, and what is the respiratory rate, what is the saturation, these things we have to see. And in, when looking for saturation, almost always check pre and postductal saturation. Pre ductal is right hand and post ductal is the foot. Because in that we can see whether there is any shunting is there. And whether the baby is acidotic, whether the babies are shocked. These are the questions. So for us to what are the causes? I earlier also told it could be a respiratory problem. So we can see them by with the respiratory distress and by doing a chest x-ray, we can find them. And cardiac cause, almost always remember to check femoral pulses and delay in femoral and radio femoral delays to see. Usually in neonates, it's difficult to palpate radial, so we have to palpate the brachial pulses. And we have to look for any infection evidence. So really, if we have ruled out all the others, really there may be a causes like methemoglobinemia, which is less common and you no need to remember that. As long as if you remember respiratory problems, cardiac causes and infection, it will be enough for your intern period. So what are the actions? It is as usual in every pediatric and everyone, it is A, B, C. So always it goes from airway, breathing and circulation. And never forget the glucose and to keep the baby warm. And correct the reversible respiratory causes and support breathing. So we can give oxygen or according to if baby's condition is more warranted, more higher respiratory support, we can contact the neonatal team and send the baby there and start antibiotics because we don't know what is the reason. And there is a drug called prostaglandin. So we are, there should be a low threshold for starting prostaglandin if we suspect a cardiac because everywhere you won't be able to have a echocardiography be doing then and there. Some peripheral places you won't be able to do echo. So in that case, if you have ruled out respiratory problems, then you can start prostaglandin. So whenever starting prostaglandin, there are some problems with prostaglandin because it may cause apnea. So you have to observe for apnea once you start prostaglandin. So if you are working in a peripheral area where you don't have echo, so once stabilize the baby and if you think it's a cardiac problem, you can communicate with the cardiac team in nearby hospital and then start prostaglandin and send the baby for the echo. So now we are going to discuss about a waiting room who is in peri-arrested state. state. So it means, so what action? So here, there won't be much time for you to ask history and questions. There won't be any much time. So you have to act here. So what actions would you like to take? And what questions then you will ask from Ma? So always, if collapsed neonate comes, you have to go with structured approach, A, B, C. Airway, breathing, and circulation. So first look for the airway. See whether there is any secretions, any blockage, and clear the, if necessary, you can suck out the, any blocks are there, or secretions you can suck. And what is the position? That is the most important thing. For the neonates, you have to keep the neutral position. Because the occiput is too big, so you have to keep in the neutral position where the eyes are parallel to the surface. So, and you, you have to use a well-fitted face mask, which is covering your nose and mouth both. Then we have to look for breathing. And if we need, we can give oxygen. Or if baby is needing more support, we can give PEEP if available. So for us to give a PEEP, we have now TPS devices. A lot of places are having Neopuff. 
we can give the heat from that. And we can use a effective adjuvants such as nasopharyngeal layaway, laryngeal mask layaway, if need. And circulation, always coming A, B, C. Circulation is IV access. It is sometimes, a lot of times, it is challenging in neonates. But it if baby presented with first few days after birth, we are having the umbilical vein. So there are two arteries and one vein in the umbilical stump, and we can easily identify the arteries and vein. Vein will have a larger lumen, and uh, their veins uh, wall will be collapsing, and arteries are smaller lumen with thick. Sometimes they are popping out of the cut surface, and uh, so if you can get the venous access, the UV umbilical venous access, it will be very helpful. If you can't, then if you still can't get the IV access, venous access from peripheral veins, then you have to use the intraosseous access. But the available needles is a problem in some places, so then you have to look for whatever suitable one you have to use. And then you don't ever forget glucose, because if babies, for any reason, baby can become hypoglycemia. And it will further worsen the condition, so it will be a vicious cycle. So you have to check the glucose and keep the baby warm. Not like adults or not like pediatric babies, these neonates are tend to be hypothermic very quickly and it will affect their metabolic functions. So almost always try to keep the baby warm. And after you to these collapsed neonatal, whatever the IV access or breathing support, after doing everything only, then again you have to reassess and then ask for questions from mom for the potential treatable causes for the baby. So, what are the things we have to see? What are the questions arising in a collapsed neonate? We have to check whether there is any problems with lungs whether the baby had any breathing difficulties beforehand, whether contact history with any respiratory problems, and whether this could be due to sepsis. Then we should ask about how is the delivery method and what happened in the home, whether they have good hand hygiene practiced. And then we have to see it could be a cardiac problem even. So the questions well, we can ask is, when, when is the onset of the disease, what happened, is it a sudden or slow deterioration, or very rarely they can present with the inborn errors of metabolic problem. For that, we should ask any siblings, any neonatal deaths, any sibling is ill, or any consanguinity, but almost always, with, though it is very uncommon in Sri Lanka, don't neglect non-accidental injuries. Sometimes babies collapse neonates, the reason is some trauma. So after we excluding, we have to keep in mind it could be a non-accidental injuries too. What will happen if you when you are examining if the baby become arrest? So you have to stop everything and then you have to start the resuscitation. I think now you all know how to resuscitate the baby, how to start and how to continue. So resuscitation of the newborn is more, mainly focused on the lungs because their main problem is a lot of the time is the respiration. The ratio of inflation to compression in this situation is 3 to 1. 3 cardiac compression and 1 inflation rate. But in uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, Committee of Resuscitation in 2018, they have told term neonates beyond the neonatal period, particularly after in those well-known suspected cardiac etiology, we can use the pediatric technique also. So, ratio of breath and compression is 
15 to 2 in the pediatric and neonatology is 3 to 1. So you can use whatever you are comfortable with. So next we are asking there is a neonate in waiting room who is a ex NICU who graduated from the neonatal ICU. So it is a very big uh, thing you have to go through. There are a lot of things you have to go through when baby came from a NICU one. So just think baby was born at uh, 23 weeks and had a big surgical, you can see the big surgical scar on the abdomen and babies on NG feeds and on home oxygen therapy and now coming with a breathing difficulty. So this is a very challenging situation. So what actions would you like to take? And what questions would you ask from the mother? So the ex nico infant, so it is, were they premature? So how premature are they? And what happened during the NICU stage? And have they had surgery? Whether it is, could be a cardiac problem or could be a respiratory problem, diaphragmatic hernia. Do they have any metabolic problems? So do they have known problem with airway breathing circulation? So ex nico infants are usually, they have gone for a lot of places before coming to this. It means during the NICU time, they may have eye referral, cardiac referral, surgical referral. So they have may, went everywhere and they are having a lot of problems with each and everything. So it is a challenging situation for you to. So the treatment and investigation pathways follow the same as the approach for any unwell neonatal child. So, but here you have to have a, a broad generalization is that the disease severity can be more severe than a normal neonate. So you have to always communicate with the parents because they know the baby because you are seeing for the first time and they have seen for a long time the baby. So they are a good resource to guide the assessment. So if mom says baby was well until two days back, then develop this, it means they have noticed some different. So we have to take it to a consideration. Whenever mom says there is a difference from the previously is like that and so it is a good resource for you all to assess the baby. So do you have any questions you want to ask? If any other conditions you think is, uh, want to know anything, you can ask now. Okay. So as long as you are not uh, asking questions, I think there is no questions for you and you will manage all the newborns coming with the problems in during your internship very well. So all the best for your internship and thank you. <coughs> thank you, thank you Kaushal. Uh, right, so this is the end of the program. And uh, we can uh, send you the email, uh, email uh, how to log into the Heart Association website and also the College of Pediatrician website. You don't have to log in, you can just uh, get in there and then go through the materials. And then you take your time to answer the MCQs uh, and then uh, upload into the uh, and uh, submit it. Then uh, we will let you know the results uh, once we get the MCQs. Um, okay, so if you have not uh, received your MCQs or if there are any problems with the email, uh, can you uh, send an email to this? Can you send the email to this uh, email? This is the college email. Uh, just type in that. So CPD 
dot slcp gmail dot com and uh, they will uh, the rajita will send you the sort it out okay. uh, well uh, there's no deadline in submitting the mcqs because uh, now you are going to have another lectures by other colleges for about another 10 days so you can do uh, within uh, within uh, i mean two weeks the next two weeks you can submit uh, the mcqs there's no issue about it but make sure you do it at certain at some point. Um, so the email is uh, uh, the CPD uh, CPD SLCP sorry CPD SLCP at Yeah, cpd.slcp at gmail.com. It's in the chat box now. It is in a chat box. You can go to the chat box and get the copy the email. Okay. Uh, Ah, sorry, this is, uh, yeah, yeah, this, sorry, this is, uh, somebody says it's a direct, sorry, CPD, yeah, okay, sorry, the, earlier it was a personal sort of direction, now it is for everybody, cpd.slcp at gmail.com. Okay, so that's the end of the program. So hope uh, you enjoyed the program for the last three days. Uh, Roshan, are you here? Yeah, Roshan, Right. Okay. I think Roshan is not here. So on behalf of the Ministry of Health and uh, also the College of Pediatricians, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining. I uh, hope you enjoy the program. So thank you very much. So.